Midnight is the Darkest Hour, a novel by Ashley Winstead, narrated by Sarah Wellborn. One. Now. Five hours and forty-six minutes after a trapper pulls the skull from the depths of Starry Swamp, shaken sludge and Spanish moss out of its eye sockets, the entire town of Bottom Springs, Louisiana, all 5,229 Christian souls and the small handful of godless heathens, has heard the news. Once again, they whisper, a person has been claimed by the swamp. But days later, Sheriff Thomas Tyrio holds a press conference. Sheriff Thomas Tyrio has not held a press conference once in his thirty years of service to the law. In Bottom Springs, there's never been a need. So this morning, when he stands outside his office with the reporter from the Trufayette Town Talk, flanked by his two deputies, the entire town comes to see it. There have been people lost to the swamp for as long as there have been people living in Bottom Springs. But this press conference means something's different. Even the ones who weren't waiting for it, who haven't, like me, laying awake every night anticipating this moment, are drawn out like a spell from the Dollar General and Piggly Wiggly in Old Man Jonas's bait and tackle shop. They gather in close quarters on Main Street, some nearly hovering, the better to hear. They know Sheriff Thomas Tyrio as Tom, or simply the Sheriff, but today he stands unusually rigid in his law enforcement regalia, his mud-brown uniform with its pins and patches. He carries an air of authority that makes him feel like a stranger, like some big city cop, not our small-town, small-time sheriff. Good morning, and thank you for coming. He booms, kicking things off with a gesture of politeness, which is our way. That, in the thickness of his accent, is a comfort, a reassurance that, despite his strangely formal stance, he is still one of us. I'm afraid I have troubling news to share today. Unease ripples through the crowd. This is Southern Baptist country, and people are prone to unease, apocalyptic and overly associative, seeing holy warnings in the smallest of things, like the pattern sugar makes when spilled across a counter. My father is where you'd expect him, in the middle of the crowd, the tallest person here, thick, tanned, and already gleaming in his cuffed white dress shirt. As the sheriff speaks, the hands of the townsfolk find my father until he looks like a massive sun radiating spokes of people. They lay their palms on his shoulders and forearms as if he is an anchor, his holiness a shield to protect them from the coming news. I cannot recall ever touching or being touched by my father that gently. I watch from the back, alone and invisible as always. An ominous feeling seeps through my veins like silty black mud. It has been seeping since the moment I heard whispers about the skull from Nisa, my colleague at the town library. June 17th, at approximately 4.32 p.m., the sheriff says, While one of my deputies was responding to a vandalism issue in Starry Swamp, he stops when the crowd titters, heads whipping to one another, eyes flashing. We haven't heard this part of the story. Like everyone else, I frown. Vandalism in the swamp. The sheriff raises his voice and continues. A trapper reported he'd found human remains in the water, caught up in one of his nets. Murmurs erupt from the throng. They know this information, but there's something about hearing it from a man in uniform with a carefully stoic face that feels weighted. It hits me, too, like a punch to the gut. Those with their hands on my father tighten them, gripping him for support. Near the edge of the crowd, gray-haired Mrs. Auten, the town tailor, sways on her feet. What kind of remains? Old man Jonas calls. How many pieces? There are stains on his overalls from a morning spent packing bait. Some tisk at the indelicate question, but it's old man Jonas, so he will be forgiven. Sheriff Tyrio holds out his hands for quiet. 
I'm sorry to say the trapper pulled a human skull out of the swamp. As of now, that's all we've been able to recover. A head with no body. People turn to gape at each other, wanting to see their horror mirrored, but not me. In the farthest reaches of the crowd, I am silent and dry-eyed. Dry as kindling, in fact. I alone know that whatever information the sheriff holds, he holds it like a lit match poised over my head. It was lucky we happened to be there responding to the vandalism, the sheriff adds almost as an afterthought, the Louisiana storyteller in him cropping up despite the somber moment. Trapper said he might have thrown it back in the water if he hadn't spotted the law around the bend. A thousand threads of fate, then, weaving together to pull the skull out of the dark water and into the light. A thousand things conspiring for this day to come to pass. What are the odds? My mind whispers. And though I've instructed myself to remain blank of mind, of all the things I could be thinking, at least it's probably the safest. My father is only feet away, which means the Holy Spirit is here in this town square, listening. It was God's will, someone calls, and the crowd murmurs its assent. Some of them have started swaying, moving to a message from the Creator only they can hear, like they're back in church. The town talk reporter clears his throat. <clears throat> Is it your opinion someone got lost out there, or are we talking about another alligator attack like the one last year? My body is incandescent with fear. Be a gator. For the first time, exhaustion carves the sheriff's face. Yesterday, we received word from the coroner in Forsyth that the skull belongs to a male, aged 25 to 50, and the fracturing on the bone is consistent with blunt force trauma. The crowd goes silent. My heart pounds so fast I want to crack my sternum and release it. The skull's been bashed in. The sheriff clarifies, his drawl deepening. This man did not die by gators. He was the victim of a brutal beating. I'm here today to announce we're opening the parish's first homicide investigation in 20 years. There's a strangled cry as gray-haired Mrs. Auten succumbs fallen to her knees. Some townsfolk rush to pull her up, but the rest devolve into chaos. They shout, imploring the sheriff for more information, imploring my father to intervene. A woman carrying a small child on her hip, who I know only as one of the Fort Knott fishing wives, starts to weep. Homicide investigation. Those were the words I was waiting for. Inside me, the fire catches and erupts. No one can see it, but I'm standing in the middle of Main Street, burning alive. The flames of hell have finally reached me like my father always warned. Calm down, the sheriff booms, his voice rising above the fray. I need you to listen. The two deputies flank in him. Old Roy McLaren and young Barry Holt straighten and finger the sticks at their belts as if they might jump into the crowd to force everyone's silence. Barry's troubled gaze searches faces until he finally lands on mine. He gives me a grim, tight-lipped smile. I have no idea what expression I make back. My body is on fire, and I can feel nothing else. This is all the information we have says the sheriff, voice still straining. We'll update you as soon as we identify the victim. In the meantime, I need any and all information you might have about the homicide. If you know something, anything, tell us. We'll follow every lead. Consider this a plea. His gaze skims the crowd until it stops at my father. They hold each other's eyes. A darkness passes over the sheriff's face. And I must also ask for your prayers. Evil has come to Bottom Springs. The crowd explodes at this, one of the older women wailing. The sheriff and his deputies turn their backs and stride into their office trailed by the reporter. In their absence, my father takes command, lifting his arms to the heavens. 
I can see only the back of his head, his coal-black, slicked-back hair, the dark sweat stain in his dress shirt, but I've seen this gesture enough times to know what expression he's wearing. Let us pray, he shouts, for the soul of this poor murdered man. He staggers down to his knees in the middle of the street. Like a contagion, the people around him fall too, a movement that ripples until the whole crowd is braced against the ground. May God reveal the wicked soul responsible for this gruesome act, the soul who has betrayed God's holiest commandment. The crowd raises their arms like he does, tilting their heads to the sky, imploring their creator. May Christ deliver us from the demon who walks among us even now. I cannot be here, cannot watch them prostrate themselves before my father, cannot contain the grief threatening to erupt. I turn and flee, moving as quickly as I dare, knowing I cannot draw attention. I need to get home to my garden, to my refuge, where I can think. I'm digging up weeds in my backyard, skin filmed with dirt and sweat, when I feel the change. The air thickens, becoming so heavy and warm I can close my eyes and sink into it like into bath water. The wild green of the forest at the edge of my yard gives itself over to the heat in one great big exhalation. I smell verdant herb in the air, can practically taste it on my tongue, spicy and mineral. In that moment, all around me, spring shudders into summer. I still instinctively clutch in the trowel. My eyes find the horizon, a spark lighten in my chest. He used to come every year on the first true day of summer, every year except the last. Deep in my bones, I can feel it. He will come with dusk. Time passes in a blur until I find myself sitting barefoot at my kitchen table, watching the tree branches dance outside the window. The sheer curtains are twisting as the breeze blows through the screen and it ruffles my white dress. My hair is wet from the shower and combed back from my forehead like my mother used to do when I was a child. Moisture from the shower still clings to my skin, and the white cotton sticks. I want to pull it from me, but outside my front door, the wind chime tangles, a soft silver melody, and I rise to my feet. The promise of a summer storm hangs thick in the air outside the screen door. The sun is fighting death, reaching out with grasping fingers of orange and rose against the fallen twilight. When I push open the screen door, there's a sharp glimmer of light, and there he is, standing on my porch like the wild has conjured him. He's grinning the same grin he used to give me when we were teens. Fitting, because although he's grown more solid and slightly taller, He's never really aged. The grin is lazy and confident, with a wickedness he would never dare show anyone else. He's a head taller than me, and his skin is too lustrous, too milky white for a boy born and raised here in Bottom Springs, where the sun beats unrelentingly most of the year. Instead of tanned and freckled like mine, his skin glows like a pearl like trapped moonlight. His hair is dark and tangled and his eyes are darker, the kind of dark that sucks you in. When I was younger, I used to draw him with my charcoal pencils, trying to capture the flinty sharpness of his cheekbones, how they knife down, pulling your eyes to the fullness of his lips. But I could never get him right. Every picture I drew made him look otherworldly and menacing halfway feral. In those pictures, you could almost see why so many around here call him the devil's son. He's letting me take him in, that grin showing off the sharp points of his canines, his smile echoing in his eyes. He leans against the wooden door frame, shoulder to the peeling paint, and looks at me too. 
starting with my bare feet and traveling up until he meets my eyes. Between his look and the press and heat, it's like the world is reaching out to touch me with phantom caresses. My pain has called him here, surely, called and pulled him here. Ruth. His nostrils flare as if catching a scent. Something's wrong. Your house smells different. Tell me quick. Are you safe? No. I remained still, fingernails digging into the door, carving half moons. My voice is thick. Listen to me. It's finally happened. They found him in the swamp. 2. June. 17 years old. I was 17 when I went on my first date, much later than the other girls. Since courting for marriage is one of the only forms of entertainment we've got down here in Bottom Springs, and bored girls in small towns are inclined toward entertainment, we tend to start quick. But late or not, it was a miracle I had a date at all. For one thing, my father is Pastor James Cornier preacher at Holy Fire Born Again, and spiritual leader to every soul in True Fayette Parish, minus the handful of godless heathens. Not many boys want to date a preacher's daughter, and rightfully so. After all, in towns like ours, it's best to keep your vices, your underage drinking and late-night fumbling in the back seat, as far from prying eyes as possible. But mostly, it was a miracle because of who I am all on my own. If you were to ask around about Miss Ruth Cornier, you'd hear the same story. Miss Ruth Cornier, they tell you, is a good, God-fearing girl, not a lick of trouble, raised by two upstanding, cane-wielding pillars of the community, but intensely shy to the point of muteness to the point of not being able to function when spoken to. A girl who grows red-faced and stuttering upon too forward a glance. A wisp of a girl. Someone who haunts the background of photographs, unlikely to look a boy in the eyes, let alone date one. And they were right. I was shy. But mostly, I was lonely. While everyone respected my parents, they also feared them especially my father, who held the power to damn sinners to hell and used it frequently. My mother held a different kind of power. She was nearly as quiet as I was, at least in public, but in private her judgment was harsh, her tongue legendary, her whisper campaigns the kind that saw entire families shunned from potlucks and Sunday services over a single member's wrongdoing. If anyone in Bottom Springs assumed life inside the corner of your house was different, that within the private walls of our two-story clapboard the three of us shared a special familial intimacy, that my parents granted me a leniency and tenderness they gave no one else, the kind of love and indulgence a mother might give a naughty child who snagged a sucker from the grocery store, they would be wrong. There were moments of tenderness when I was young, evenings when my father would allow me to rest my head on his knee while he read, mornings when my mother's fingers would soften and slow as they combed through my hair. But these were fleeting moments. Dandelion seeds in my palm lost the second I stopped clutching. For the most part, there was no one my parents watched closer than me looking for any hint of immorality or wantonness. And when they found one, there was no person on earth they would send to hell quicker, hell being twelve lashes with my father's rattan cane followed by a week locked inside my bedroom. It was therefore wise to be a wisp, even if my severe quietness meant that at school I was as unpopular and friendless as poor Samuel Landry whose Tourette's syndrome made him a target for the crueler students, and Everett Duncan, whose ratty clothes, intense stare, and stubborn refusal to answer questions when called upon made it clear he was following in the footsteps of his ne'er-do-well father, one of the town's chief church shirkers. 
But it hardly mattered that no one invited me to drink Cora's light out in Starry Swamp on Saturdays. My whole life, I tried in timid overtures to find other people I could relate to, someone to call a friend, but I'd always failed. In such a small town, the pickings were slim. I wasn't my parents' kind of girl, not on the inside, but I wasn't anyone else's either. So, instead of friendships, I cultivated quiet rebellions. Most came in the form of books. At Sacred Surrender High School, the library was tightly controlled by the church elders. It contained no suggestive books, no books that glorified sins like rebelling against one's parents or sex before marriage. But most of all, it contained no occult. No boy or girl wizards or tales of monsters or werewolf love stories. The occult was a particular sticking point with my father. Because around here, the only belief system that had ever competed with religion was superstition. The only things parishioners had ever feared as much as God were the evil said to roam around us. In fairness, Bottom Springs does look like the Creator had built it with the otherworldly in mind. Though I have only our neighbor in towns to compare to, Forsyth and Truval to the east and Homa to the north, I've always felt Bottom Springs must be the most beautiful place on earth. Here at the tip of Louisiana, it's as if the sky and swamp and wild green trees know holy fire demands we lead staid, ascetic lives and try to make up for it, giving us all the splendor and decadence we aren't supposed to want. Sunrises and sunsets are riots of color, the gulf sapphire blue, the black swamp laced with velvet green lily pads, tall trees almost floating out of the depths. Trees Everywhere, in fact, bending over dirt roads, embracing the shore, and thick as a wall of centuries in the woods, dripping with Spanish moss. All this beauty stirs the soul, making one feel the pinprick presence of another order. God, perhaps, but maybe also something darker. Secret beings with lives that unfold in the slivers between trees whose slitted eyes blink open at night in the depths of the swamp, yellow and ancient as alligators. One story in particular has haunted Bottom Springs for as long as anyone can remember. It tells of a creature whose true name is so hoary and evil that men's minds can't contain it, and so we call him the Low Man. Cursed to remain trapped in Bottom Springs by men who practice spiritual magics now long forgotten, the low man slumbers for all eternity in the deep, dark heart of the swamp, in a place no trapper or hunter has ever set foot. Every few years, the story goes, he wakes and rises from his underwater tomb to roam Bottom Springs, searching for a way out seeking to be let loose upon the world in order to devour it. Furious at his imprisonment, the low man settles for devouring us instead. He takes the shape of a beautiful man, a trap for sinners as seductive as a coral snake's bright rings. The low man can see into your heart, see your true wickedness, and once he's marked you, whether it's hours, days, or years later, one night he will slip in through your window. He'll sink his fangs into your neck like a rough kiss and feast, not only on your body, dismembering the cage that contains you, but on your soul. There is no heaven or hell waiting for those slaughtered by the low man, only the worst fate of all, which is nothingness, which is to be reduced to a sparkless, nerveless thing, a bag of flesh that rots and stinks and then ceases to exist. While the myth of the low man had fallen out of regular mention by the time I grew up, men still told stories after they'd had a few too many wild turkeys at the Blue Moon Bar, describing how they'd seen him slip into the shadows between houses when they were young, felt his cold presence when they ventured too deep into the swamp. 
Children still checked the locks on their windows before they went to bed and stared hard at any man with the face too close to beautiful. And the threat of something old and hungry in the swamp lent an extra sense of thrill to the party's teenagers through there. Once, I'd wondered which scared the people of Bottom Springs more, the low man or the devil. This, of course, was a problem for my father, who felt God should have the monopoly on fear. So the school library was tightly restricted, youths' minds protected, and that meant it was no place for me. But in the town library, a small brick building off Main Street with the roof steepled like a church, sometimes an illicit book would find its way in. One of my greatest blessings was that the library was perpetually underfunded. Without a healthy budget, it relied on donations, often cardboard boxes stuffed with bent paperbacks and the occasional stray t-shirt meant for goodwill. Even more occasionally, parishioners would forget to scour through their stacks to take out anything damning. By the time I turned 14, I'd gotten my hands on a Danielle Steele and the second and fifth Percy Jacksons that way, all haphazardly pulled out of donation boxes and stuck onto the shelves. While the librarians were sometimes careless, I was always alert, books being my only lifeline. I was as hungry for stories as the low man was for souls, devouring every book that wasn't a spiritual each one proof another world existed outside the one I knew. I believe at one point I'd read every book available in town. I used to smile at how misguided my father was, thinking the classics he allowed, whether in heights and great expectations and the age of innocence, had nothing to teach about rebellion. I learned to question and rage and self-immolate over love alongside Heathcliff and Pip and Newland Archer. And then I found Twilight. The copy was wedged into a shelf of spy novels. It was a miracle I happened to spot it, a miracle I had the courage to take it to the farthest corner of the library and read it in the shadows, chapter by chapter, returning day after day since I never could check it out. It was the ultimate contraband, a story both occult and romantic, and meant for girls like me. In Bella, I found a mirror. We were both shy and overlooked, with the smallest of lives, hemmed in by circumstances outside our control. And in Vampire Edward, I found everything I'd ever wanted in a man. He loved Bella with single-minded devotion a self-effacing passion beyond anything a human man was capable of. That's, in turn, how I loved him. I read the novel five times in the span of a month, then spent months after fruitlessly searching the stacks for the sequel teased at the end. Eventually, I committed the crime of shoving the book in my backpack and bringing it home. At the time, it was the worst thing I'd ever done. The night I stole it. I woke at midnight in a cold sweat, sure the low man, or at least my father, would come hunting for me. Twilight was the bridge to my second rebellion, an obsession with the kind of love my father rarely talked about in church, the kind where you felt all the overwhelming awe you were supposed to feel for Jesus, but for another person. It fascinated me. Though I prayed to God every night and believed he was listening, I'd never felt particularly close. I'd never felt close to another person either. And of the two connections, I wished for the person more. Ruth Cornier, the preacher's daughter, coveted a boy's love more than God's. That was another secret I hid in my muteness. I found Twilight at fourteen. By the time I was seventeen, there was no girl in the world more willing to be consumed by love. I even had a favorite daydream. My hair, long, wavy, and copper, was the one thing about me worth attention. It was unprecedented in our family, mine alone. 
I used to imagine a boy combing his hands through it, letting the curls loop around his fingers like rings, binding us together. He would whisper that it was beautiful. Not me, necessarily. Not my round, freckled face, but my hair. And then he would kiss me. I told myself if life could just give me that, one moment to feel lovely, a single perfect kiss, I would never ask for more. So the Sunday a new face cropped up in the pews, I took notice. 3. June. 17 years old. He was short but handsome, with sandy hair, brown eyes, and deeply tanned skin that told me he worked for one of the construction crews that used to come through Bottom Springs back when Forsyth, the bigger town to our east, was going through a growth spurt. Later, the suspicion was confirmed by gossip. Over the course of many Sundays, I learned his name was Renard Michaels, and he was seven years my elder at the age of twenty-four. I watched and watched him, but I would have gone my whole life without uttering a word, except one Sunday he turned his head in the middle of my father's lecture and caught me staring. I yanked my gaze away and stared in silent horror at my Bible for the rest of service. When I finally stepped outside after church, he was lingering with the last of the parishioners on the wide front lawn. He caught my eye over their shoulders and smiled. One of his front teeth was turned slightly inward, and I must have stared again because he ambled over. I'm Renard, he said, sticking his thumbs in his pockets. He wore tight jeans and work boots with a collared shirt. What's your name, Red? If he didn't know my name, he didn't know I was the preacher's daughter. Ruth, I said managing to speak around my shyness, omitting anything more. I got you this. He pulled a strawberry hard candy from his pocket, its wrapper drawn to mimic the seeds and stems of the fruit. My mother and I placed these candies in little wicker baskets outside the doors to the nave for parishioners to take on their way out. He held it up. Here. I blinked at his hand. It's for you. That produced another glimpse of his strange tooth as he smiled. It's just a candy. Won't bite. We held eyes until it was too much to bear. Okay, I said, dropping my gaze to the grass. Thank you. Renard placed the candy in my hand. Before he pulled away, his pointer finger stroked down my palm. Just for a millisecond, a breath's worth of time but it froze me in place. Long after he'd ambled away, I stayed rooted there, clutching the small strawberry. I never could bring myself to unwrap it. After that, he found me every Sunday. His job in Forsyth would take a few months to complete, he said, and then he'd be on to the next town, wherever in Louisiana his company took him. He liked Bottom Springs because it was cheaper than Forsyth and... He said this with a smile that made my cheeks burn. The place was full of pretty girls. He was so easy to talk to that he wore me down. I opened up, little by little, until eventually I wondered if I was really so shy after all. The three most important things to know about Renard were that, first, he loved his mother, who he called Mama. She lived back in Bro Bridge, where he was born. He loved her so much he wore a gold chain with the word Mama in script letters around his neck, even though it tangled in his chest hair. Second, he was an avid trapper, working all week with the single aim of getting to the weekend when he could escape into the swamp and check his traps. And lastly, there was nothing he was prouder of than his truck, a shiny red behemoth. It was far too expensive for a man who lived in the age in courtyard apartments and carried one of those prepaid plastic cell phones. He finally told me he'd bought the truck with a payout after he'd gotten injured at a job site, lucking out that the owner was eager to avoid insurance with a chunk of cash. No one had ever talked to me as much as Renard did, like I was normal too. 
the rush was so intoxicating that he could have told me any story and i would have found it fascinating half of what i heard when he talked was the drumming of my own heartbeat in my ears anyway one ordinary sunday so like the others there was nothing to warn me bernard marched up after the service and asked if i'd like to go parkin at starry swamp with him i was surprised he knew about it the swamp was where my classmates went to drink and make out at least that's what i'd heard listening to gossip at lunch tables they called it starry swamp because at night the water was so black it turned into a mirror reflecting the sky above wading through it was supposed to be like swimming through the stars i'd never seen it for myself i wasn't allowed outside at night so when renard asked me biting his lip i thought my first date and i'm going to be kissed in a wild green place like the meadow where edward kisses bella i'd nodded unable to speak and renard had grinned this friday then when friday afternoon came he picked me up where he instructed two streets down from my house he didn't say why but i knew it was because he discovered i was seventeen and the preacher's daughter and we were a secret but everything in my life worth having was when we got to the edge of starry swamp he didn't pull off where everyone else did at a vast clearing far from the water where the soil was drier somewhere more private he'd explained at my look and once again i heard the unspoken meaning somewhere no one would catch us he was twenty-four and i was seventeen he was a handsome church-going bachelor and i was a wisp i was lucky to be with him even hidden in the swamp i'd nodded too nervous thinking about what being kissed would feel like after all this time imagining it my palms were so sweaty i had to wipe them against my dress we drove deeper and deeper in until we came to a small clearing in the trees renard parked and cut the engine the trees ringing us were so thick that all i could see beyond was darkness he spread a blanket on the muddy grass and pulled me toward him i knew what was coming and closed my eyes with my sight gone i could hear the buzz saw of the insects and low throat singing of the frogs and whistle of the wind all of it intensifying as renard pressed his lips to mine i was being kissed but it was not like i'd imagined his lips were rough and calloused and they fumbled over mine urgent from the start wanting something i didn't know how to give i didn't know what to do with my hands somewhere in the distance a bird shrieked a high clear burst of warning and renard solved the problem of my hands by pulling me tighter against him his lips kept moving so insistently that it occurred to me i needn't do anything at all he wasn't waiting for my response he pressed me down against the blanket and followed the wild pounding of my heart with his mouth kissing down my neck to my chest tugging at my dress to taste more skin i made a noise of surprise startled by the quickness with which he moved remembering bella's first kiss the paragraphs devoted to the way edward had held her touched her softly renard's scratchy hands were moving under my skirt i pulled back and said wait breathless and urgent but he didn't he only grunted relax red in that thick honey accent the words curling with impatience hands and mouth roving pin in my shoulders with his weight even as i tried to roll free at first hesitantly unsure of myself then frantically panic kicking in it wasn't like twilight it was everything that my father had warned i beat at renard trying to twist free as dusk fell around us pastel blue we were alone this deep into the swamp the frogs kept singing the bugs kept whirring nothing cared that i was trapped in the coffin of his arms drowning in fear 
the earth was as indifferent as renard was the man who hadn't it turned out seen anything in me beyond a girl who was naive and desperate willing to be quieter than the others just as i was breaking in the grass renard made a choked sound and heaved off me struck by something large and dark i rolled away sobbing in pure shock then scrambled to my feet when i saw what saved me it was everett duncan who straddled renard between his thighs trying and failing to catch hold of his arms everett was dressed in black as always dark waders and a cheap thrift store t-shirt full of holes there was a water bottle dropped nearby still rolling past the wet corpse of a large fat nutria the river rats that thrive round here he'd been hunting the thought came to me clearly amid the shock renard managed to get a hand free and landed a blow across everett's cheek so hard his head snapped to the side and i got a clear view of his face once a year for as long as i could remember one girl or another would overlook the stink of loneliness and anger surrounding everett the bruises blooming around his eyes that caused snickers about bar fights the accusations that he was a goth and a freak drawn in by the power of that face it never mattered which girl tried everyone was icily rebuffed one after another while the rest of the school watched and laughed we'd sat next to each other in classrooms for years cornier and duncan alphabetical destiny but in all that time he'd only spoken to me once of his own volition the first year of high school right after i'd discovered twilight and carried it everywhere in my backpack i'd been walking down the hall when a group of football players roughhousing and not looking slammed into me knocking me off my feet and scattering the contents of my bag they hadn't even stopped to apologize like i was invisible that was common enough but that day it had stung as i'd scrambled on my hands and knees searching frantically for twilight dark boots had appeared in my line of sight everett of all people had crouched down and extended the beat-up paperback with a single word here in the flash before i looked away breathing thanks i saw his lip was busted and scabbing over an old wound on its way to healing he rested me to my feet with one cool hand and then kept walking expression unchanged an unrippled pond and now here he was grappling on the grass with the man who wanted to hurt me as i watched the tide turned renard who had thirty pounds on everett easy managed to flip him over and crush his hands around his throat you weird fucking kid renard yelled striking everett so hard he made a sucking sound desperate for air his arms flailed trying and failing to gain purchase against renard's chest just like mine had stop it i screamed as renard hit everett again his face nearly purple with rage bested by a teenage boy without a weapon and me escaping the whole plan shot to hell in the transparency of his fury i saw clear to renard's soul to the truth he'd hidden from me every sunday deep down he was rotten you're going to kill him i shouted everett was trapped his arms starting to still his eerily beautiful face turning blue from lack of oxygen my heart burst open in my chest certain he would die and in my desperation i turned into my own kind of roving creature dropping to my hands and knees in the grass fumbling through tree roots and bushes all the under places you weren't supposed to poke i seized upon a rock as smooth as an egg and as big as a summer melon all understanding faded except for one truth everett duncan had tried to save me and i could not let him be harmed i ran back to the blanket where renard loomed over him squeezing everett's neck with both hands and didn't think a second more before i brought the rock down over his head he jerked to the side and it didn't seem enough 
so I brought it down again, letting loose a sob, the impact jar in my wrists, and then I couldn't stop until I lifted the rock to hit him once more, and Renard slumped over on the blanket, blood leaking from his head. I froze. Everett scrambled to his feet, breathing hoarsely, and we stood there, him in black and me in white, two chests heaving, both of us splattered with blood. An eternity passed until I whispered, I didn't mean to. Shh. He put a finger in the air, as if testing the wind. Immediately, I stilled, except for my heart, which was still pumping, pushing my chest tight against the neckline of my dress. The whole melody of the swamp opened to me then. The creeping, crawling things rustling the leaves, and the water dripping from the branches and the birds calling overhead. In the middle of it, faintly, was a thin sucking noise, the sound of a man struggling to breathe. He's still alive, Everett said, and I startled. I'd forgotten the way his voice sounded, deep but also lilting. He looked at me and I cringed, waiting for his revulsion. It would be what I deserved. I was going to burn for what I'd done. I would never enter heaven. But instead of disgust, tenderness flooded Everett's face. I'd never seen such an expression on him in the years we'd orbited each other. Out of everything, it was what brought chills to my skin, tiny hairs raisin like antennae on high alert. Give me that, he said and held out his hand. He was looking at the rock. Mutely, I handed it over. My arms were too light without the weight, and I shook them. Everett crouched beside Renard and stared at him a moment, thinking what I couldn't fathom, then bent and whispered in his ear, too low for me to catch. Renard's eyes were shut, but at the whisper he gurgled. Then Everett smashed the rock to his temple, one quick hard stroke, and Renard was utterly quiet. He was suffering, Everett said softly, like an animal in a trap. He set the rock on the blanket and rose, swaying a little. He'd shown Renard mercy. I searched his face as he steadied himself. Do you need to go to Blanchard? The hospital was at the farthest edge of town and I had no way of getting there, but Everett looked like he needed it. He jerked his head. No, I'm used to it. Besides, they'll ask how it happened. Our eyes met, and that's when the weight of it truly hit me. I'd killed a man, or Everett had, or both of us together, the shared sin stain in our hands the same as the blood. I dropped to my knees in the grass. Ruth, Everett gripped my shoulders. Not now, okay? Later. Now, we have to get rid of him. I looked up at him from where I knelt, too far gone to wonder at his touch. Despite everything, his dark eyes were clear and calm. Stay here while I get an axe. I think my father has one in his shed. At least a knife. You were hunting in the swamp. I looked at the dead river rat, my words coming out faded and distant. And you didn't bring a knife. He squeezed my shoulder. Don't move. I'll be fast. He was gone before I could beg him not to leave me alone with Renard, and I tumbled forward on the blanket. In my shock, time must have warped, thirty minutes compressed into five, because he was back too quickly, tugging me up, holding an axe. I climbed to my feet and joined Everett where he stood, staring down at Renard's body, at the bloody mess of his head. The chill calm of shock seized me then, emptying me of feeling. The first man I'd kissed had turned out to be no Edward. Everett's words were cool. We've got to do it fast before nightfall. That's when the swamp is hungriest. Are you sure? I asked. About any of this? We'll put him in the swamp and tie the rock and blanket to him. The gators will find him quick and eat it all. No one will ever know. You'll be safe. Across the empty space, he held out his hand. After a moment, I took it. Don't be afraid, he said. 
and with our fingers twined together, with the twilight fallen, I wasn't. We chopped Renard's body into pieces we could carry to the edge of the water and walk those pieces in up to our knees. Then we waited at the tree line until the smooth, placid surface of the water thrashed. Quick as lightning, once, twice, water roiling, and then he was gone. It was almost peaceful. We left his truck where it was parked. Everett said that when they found it, they would think Renard had gone off hunting or exploring in the swamp, confident he was enough of a rough-and-tumble Louisiana woodsman to survive. No one knew about our date, by Renard's own design. His cheap plastic cell phone had no tracking device, and there was no such thing as DNA testing in a parish poor as ours, with a sheriff's department of three men, especially not for a man just passing through, an itinerant construction worker. The very things I hated about life in small, backward, bottom springs would be the things that saved me. It happened just like Everett said. News of Renard's disappearance in the swamp, when it eventually hit, barely made a ripple. Too many other men had died in the untamable wild for the town to be anything but used to it. My father used Renard to start a sermon about hubris one Sunday morning, and after that he faded from town lips. Days of waiting in terror for someone to knock on my door turned into months of quiet disbelief, and then years of tentative acceptance the monotony of so many ordinary days burying this one extraordinary one. Finally, the strangest thing happened. A small part of me started to believe, deep in the furthest reaches of my heart, that maybe what we'd done wasn't really so bad. I didn't know whether that was my voice whispering or the devil's, but either way, it soothed me. One thing did change after that day the most important that had ever happened to me, my third and mightiest rebellion. I might have lost part of myself in Starry Swamp, might have floated my childhood right off into the dark water with Renard, but in exchange, I got Everett. He appeared outside my window the next day at dusk, waiting for me at the edge of my lawn. After that, he came every day like clockwork. We became inseparable. To everyone's astonishment, he became the friend I'd always dreamed of, except he was real, alive and vital, not trapped inside a book. We never, in all the years since, spoke the name Renard Michaels again. 4. Now Everett straightens against my doorframe voice dangerously low. What do you mean they found him? Not out here. I push the screen open wider, but he stays stock still. Come in. I'm being paranoid, but I can't help it. Finally, Everett heaves himself off the door frame and follows me inside. I lead him to my small kitchen and its open window, twilight breeze still blowing the curtains. Just like my run-down Datsun, which soft old man Jonas gifted me out of pity when I turned 18 and couldn't afford anything else, everything in this house is in need of repair. It's a tiny cottage far from town, right on the edge where the woods turn thick, the only house for miles. I have to collect my mail at the post office because Mr. Broussard, the mailman, won't come out here. Too alone, he says too near the dark woods, but I rent this house with my own money and live here by myself. Those are things to cherish. Everett scans as he walks. You got new curtains. Though we have far more pressing topics to discuss, the small talk is a relief, a temporary stay from the guillotine drop of my news. The old ones tore. I sewed those myself. He raises his eyebrows. New books? So many. Two years' worth since you didn't come. I nod toward the bookshelf. A ton you'll love. We move into my living room, with the old floral couch I found at a garage sale in my towering bookcase. Everett has curled on that couch a thousand times reading beside me late into the night. 
but now he keeps his distance, resting his hand on the spine of the couch, oddly formal. When he looks at me, I see he's waiting. So I tell him everything. The trapper, the skull, the blunt force trauma, the fact that it's only a matter of time before they put the pieces together and say Renard's name out loud. I don't think Everett's face could grow any paler, but by the time I'm finished, it's managed. He swallows. I know this seems bad, Ruth, but we'll think of a plan. There has to be something. For some reason, it's Everett's hope that breaks me. For the first time since hearing the news, my eyes sting hot with tears. We're going to get caught. We're going to be arrested and spend the rest of our lives in prison unless they electrocute us. Either way, we're going to burn in hell. There's no getting around it. He shakes his head, dark hair tumbling. It was self-defense. Renard was hurting you, and he was going to kill me. We did it to save our lives. But we covered it up. We thought they'd never find him, but they did. And now the whole town's talking. Eventually someone's going to remember some detail that will lead to us. There's nothing we can do. There's always something we can do. I promise. I'll figure it out. Everett stops, pressing his palms to his head. I just can't think straight right now. The smell is driving me crazy. Ruth, tell me why your house smells like a man before I go insane. A startled laugh breaks from me. Of all the things to be thinking about right now. Besides, it's been days since Barry was here, and I can't smell a trace of him. Everett's nose is even better than I remembered. I look at him so rattled and feel a surge of anger. If anyone owes anyone answers, it's Everett owing me. After all this time, that's where you want to start? His dark lashes blink faster. My heart skips into a complicated rhythm. You're not allowed to ask about my house until you explain why you didn't come home last summer. Where were you? Why didn't you at least warn me? My voice climbs too high. I was worried, Ever. Worried? What a small, weak word. It can't possibly contain what I felt last summer when the season shifted and he didn't appear. It was the first time he hadn't returned since he'd moved away from Bottom Springs. The first time he'd let me down since we were seventeen. I'd lain awake all night letting it sink in that he'd finally wised up and realized he was better off without this place, me included. I'd cried so hard and long I'd imagined the salt carving great tracks down my cheeks, like it did to rocks over eons. Everett's mouth quirks. His strangeness is legendary in Bottom Springs, but I suspect no one but me knows what playful expressions it can take. I don't own a cell phone or a computer. He raises his eyebrows. Should I have trained pigeons to find you? He's trying to make light of it distract me, but the sight of him teasing only makes the place where my heart broke and scabbed over ache worse. I didn't know if I'd ever see you again, I say quietly. He straightens at my tone. Here we are, facing an imminent threat from the sheriff, and this is the subject I'm stuck on, the thing that hurts most. I know. Ever leans against the couch. I can't tell you why I didn't come. Please just trust me that I had to stay away. I should have stayed this summer too, but I'm weak. I missed you. And now, with everything happening, it's good I came. Don't ever say you shouldn't come. You can't leave me here to fend for myself. One of the best things about me and Everett has always been that we can say whatever we're thinking. Total honesty. Even if it makes us look silly or greedy or weak. That's the upside of being the pastor's daughter and the devil's son. Two outcasts who became friends the way we did. From the start, nothing has been off limits. His dark eyes are full of regret. 
I really am sorry for making you worry. I study him, feeling the weight of the secret he won't tell me. I could try to keep my anger going. I could tell him how last summer I'd been so sad I stopped going to work, stopped reading, even stopped getting out of bed, until my parents showed up to pray over my body, convinced something unholy was trapped in my head. I could try to make him suffer like he's made me. But the truth is, my heart is a fickle betrayer. Despite everything, the fear and panic and stress, the simple sight of him makes happiness spill through me, slow and sweet as honey. Against all reason, a small part of me believes what he said, that with him here, somehow it will be okay. Everett exhales, long and deep. Will you tell me who he is now? The man whose scent is in your house. I can think of no way to avoid it, so I rest a hand on the wall for support. I couldn't call you. I didn't know where you lived because it's always changing. What could I have thought other than you'd left me? It was either that or you were dead. I take a step toward him, then stop. You have no idea how lonely I was. Ever hears the pleading tone in my voice. His eyes meet mine. You know what my parents are like. How they push. He stays silent, but the corners of his mouth turn down like he's starting to feel sick. A year without you and I caved, Ever. I let them set me up. His voice is rough. With who? I take a deep breath. His dark eyes flash like he already knows. Barry. Barry Holt? I know he was never our favorite. Not our favorite. Ruthie, he's an asshole. He never did anything. He was just oblivious part of the football crowd. But he was a kid back then. It was high school. People change. Everett braces a hand against his mouth which is what he does whenever he has trouble processing. It's as familiar to me as my own tics. His eyes cast around the room like he can't stand to look at me. Is it serious? I bite the inside of my mouth. Ever has to understand that the thought of being without him made me feel like a kid again, trapped in those awful years before we became friends. The loneliness had been so powerful I would have done anything to staunch it. Even say yes to my parents, who'd been trying to marry me off since the day I turned 18. Without Everett around, I'd been too tired to keep beating them back. I'm struggling to find the words, but it turns out my silence is enough. A look of panic flashes across Everett's face, so vivid I'm halfway reaching for him before he schools his expression. His next words are directed at the wall. First Renard and now Barry? I didn't come back for one summer and the whole world falls apart. Nothing's official yet, I say, trying to soften it. He hasn't proposed. Ever still won't look at me. He presses his hands to his mouth again, his distress palpable. One summer, Ruthie. He's trying to keep his voice low, but it comes out choked. I thought you and I were supposed to... He cuts himself off. Then he shakes his head and pushes away from the couch, away from me, striding out of the living room. My screen door rattles as he shoves through it. One night when we were seventeen, after we'd escaped Ever's father and mine, escaped the whole miserable town, we charged deep into the woods, running until we were out of breath. We'd stretched out together, looking up at the stars through the trees, and he'd said, Promise me it'll be you and me forever. I'd promised, the star's my witness. We would never give ourselves over, never let them win. It would be the two of us always, safe in the secret world we'd created for ourselves. It was the kind of vow a person made when they were young, still reeling from discovering the world was hard and cruel. But for years, our promise had such a hold over me. I used to float past other people, barely registering them, ignoring their stares, their whispers that my oddness, while excusable in childhood, was becoming uncomfortable as I grew into a woman. I had Everett, 
so I didn't need them. Even if I was trapped in Bottom Springs, I was free. That's what his disappearance took from me. Without Everett, there was no more safe, secret universe. I'd been shoved back into the world where things and people outside us mattered. He'd escaped, but I was stuck here and always would be. So, of course, I knew Dayton Barry Holt meant breaking our promise, but I thought Everett had broken it first. Wait! I yell, shoving my feet into Keds and flying after him, laces whipping my ankles. Everett's making his way to his car, an old black convertible he rebuilt after high school, tweaking it until it ran as fast and smooth as he does. I cannot be inside your house. He hops in the car, not bothering with the door. All of it together is too much. I need to think. I rest his door open and climb into the passenger seat. He turns to me, glaring, but I fasten the seatbelt and look resolutely ahead. I know where you're going, and I want to come. He's quiet for a long time while I stare out the windshield, refusing to look at him out of fear that if I do, he'll kick me out. The wind blows my hair over my face until I can't see, but I remain stubbornly still. Finally, I hear his soft sigh, and then he shoves his key into the ignition, roaring the engine. Ever slings an arm over the back of my seat and takes off, gunning backward down the road. 5. Now There's a place in the woods near my house he showed me years ago. It's one of the sacred spots no one else in Bottom Springs knows about, because it turns out no one else can comb through the wild quite like ever it can, a skill born from necessity. When he pulls up and cuts the engine, tires settling in the grass, we get out and step inside the thicket without speaking, as synchronized as birds in the wind. Eventually, the tall, skinny pines give way to a small clearing, and in the middle is a tree that towers above the others. It reaches out with a hundred snaking arms, some of them bent low to the ground. We call it the Medusa, because long ago, Everett and I decided we would give our love to villains. We know all too well how easy it is to become one when you're misunderstood. Our love is a corrective measure. Ever leaps on to the Medusa's lowest branch and extends a hand. I take it and feel him shoulder my weight until I'm light as a feather. Then we're off, climbing. Maybe it's childish to climb trees at 23 years old. My parents and Barry would certainly say so. But joys are few and far between in this life, so I can hardly bring myself to feel guilty. Besides, Everett's expression is already calming. I can feel the forest settling me, too. If you won't tell me why you didn't come home last summer, will you at least tell me where you were? I find a curved branch and pull myself up. My white dress is useless for this kind of climbing, already filthy and with no protection for my knees. But there are more important things to focus on, like getting information. Above me, he catches hold of a branch and pulls himself up. I heard the mechanic in Trueville passed away and they had no one else, so I moved. That's where I've been the last year. It's a bigger town. There's more work for me. Everett's a mechanic like his father. It turns out that even if you hate your family, you still inherit from them. But unlike his father, who planted his garage here in Bottom Springs, Evers, an itinerant mechanic, unable to commit to any town for more than a few months at a time. I've never been able to get to the bottom of his restlessness. He's made it safely to the branch above, so he turns and grips my hands, helping me climb the rest of the way. Perched on the same branch, he leans back against the Medusa's trunk, and I lean toward him still holding his hands for balance. Do you think you'll stay, then? Is Truval the one? He shrugs and looks away. I like it, but it doesn't feel like home. He nods up at the next branch and releases my hands. We like to go high enough to get a clear view of the forest. One more, I think. I follow after him, trying to gain purchase on the slippery bark. You stuck? I shake my head and wedge my foot into a cranny, forcing my way up. It's actually easier today. No books. 
The Medusa's branches are so wide and smooth you can lay stretched out on them like a couch. We used to spend days up here reading. One of the most thrilling discoveries I made about Everett after we got close is that he loves books as much as I do. I never would have guessed with the disinterested way he acted in school. But then again, the way I've acted has shielded a great many things about me, too. All clear, he says when I reach the final branch. I shimmy round the tree trunk, then settle against it, breathing a sigh of relief. Look, he says, pointing. From this high up, we can see for a mile. It's getting dark, summer dusk long, but not eternal. The leaves so shaded they're almost blue. A flock of starlings swoops low, circling in intricate patterns. We listen to the wind through the branches, to the crickets starting to chirp. This is where I belong, alone in nature with him. It's what I'll miss most when they send us to prison. As if he can read my mind, Everett cups his mouth and howls into the forest a deep and melancholy sound. I startle even though I'm used to it, and the flock of starlings breaks apart like a wrenched wishbone, birds streaking in different directions. People at church used to swear they could hear werewolves howling in the woods at night, and it used to make me smile to know the truth, that we were what frightened them. Now I don't smile. Everett's howl sounds too close to the feelings in my chest. Do you love him? He asks suddenly. The question surprises me, but I don't have to ask who he means. I think so, I say softly. I don't add that my heart has always been hungry to love, so maybe it isn't such a surprise. Everett already knows. He nods and moves his gaze far into the forest. I study his face. His dramatic cheekbones are not small-town Louisiana cheekbones. Nothing about his profile is. It's too stark, too lovely, the kind of beauty that sinks ships and ruins lives, though that's probably a line I lifted from a book. He hated it when I asked what it's like to look the way he does. I meant beautiful, but he said I made him sound like an alien. The truth is... I've always thought he might be. He doesn't look at me when he speaks, keeping his voice deceptively light. Did you even want me to come back, now that you have him? Of course I did. The words are thick in my throat. You're my best friend. Always. He's quiet for so long. Only the sounds of the forest stretch between us. Okay, he says finally. He smiles, but I can tell it's forced. If he makes you happy, then okay. I let out my held breath. We can ask Barry for details about the investigation. He's bad at keeping secrets. Everett frowns. Why would we ask him? Barry was only a year ahead of us in school, but sometimes I forget Everett hasn't kept up with everyone like I have, on account of his moving away. Barry's a deputy now. He's part of the investigation. Ever freezes. What? I chip the tree bark with my nail. He joined the sheriff's office after Beau Lynette retired. There's still only three of them. Barry's the rookie. Everett sits ramrod straight. Ruth, what the hell are you playing at? Dating a cop? It gives us an advantage. I kick his dangling legs, but he doesn't smile. You remember how Barry likes to talk. Being with him is a protection. The last rays of the sun slip over the horizon. The air shifts into deep purple, the effect like being plunged underwater. The woods at night scare most people, but I haven't been scared of any wild places, not for years. Maybe it's because of Everett, or maybe my instinct for danger is broken. Ever slides closer, until our dangling feet touch, then closer still. Our knees hit, and he wraps his legs around mine, locking us together. Don't worry, I start to say, but fall quiet when he places his hands on either side of my face. He didn't used to like touching, 
not before me, after me, with me, he can't stop, like he's making up for lost time. Ruth, his dark eyes cast such a spell that I can't look away. In their depths, he says a thousand things he would never say out loud. You know I'll always protect you. I know. In an instant, I see that bloody rock, smooth as an egg and big as a summer melon, coming down to meet Renard's head. Yes, Everett will always protect me, and I will protect him. Some days, that's what I'm most afraid of. But you're right, he says. If we're going to come up with a plan, we need to know as much as possible. Everett still holds my face between his hands. After the press conference today, the whole town will be gossiping about this. Do you think Barry will join them? I nod. He can never resist. Then we need to go and listen. I grimace. Because we both know exactly where the people of Bottom Springs go to talk. 6. Now the moment we pull up in front of the Blue Moon Bar, the summer storm finally arrives in all its thundering sheet rain glory. We're soaked the instant we run from Everett's car, and by the time we burst through the heavy oak front door, we're flinging water and half in shock at the cold. Unfortunately, our arrival draws every eye in the bar. The Blue Moon is packed tighter than I've ever seen it. As expected, the whole town, at least everyone willing to set foot in a den of sin, has gathered to talk about the homicide. Even if Everett and I weren't soaked, even if we weren't both making a rare appearance, they would stare simply to see us together. The town's oddest pair. People in Bottom Springs stare no matter where we go, though we've been best friends for six years now. I know it's mostly about Ever and the lore surrounding his father, but sometimes it makes me resentful, like I only blinked into existence the moment he and I became friends. Don't worry about the eyes, Everett murmurs. He points to the only empty booth left in the bar in a distant corner. How's that? The blue moon is a dark, dingy hole in the wall, lit by dim red lights that give it the feel of a country bordello, but it's also an institution. The place has been remarkably resilient over the years, considering Bottom Springs is God's country and the Blue Moon is a breeding ground for sin, as my father likes to say. I've always wondered why he's never run it out of town. Typically, I avoid this place for a laundry list of reasons. First, because no matter how old I get, in the town's eyes, I'll always be the reverend's girl. Second, because the blue moon attracts people, and the older I get, the less I like those. And third, because the people who come here most often are the ones I'm specifically trying to avoid. Like Lila LeBlanc, former cheerleader, sitting in front of us on a bar stool, looking Everett and me up and down with an almost prurient curiosity. You sit, Everett says. I'll get drinks. He doesn't need to ask what I want because I rarely drink, and when I do, the only thing I can tolerate is Boone's Farm Strawberry Wine Cooler, which the bar doesn't carry. No, tonight, our drinks are props. I slide into the empty booth, red vinyl slippery against my damp dress, and Everett pushes into the only empty space at the bar. Remy, the bartender, eyes him warily. Everyone in Bottom Springs eyes Everett warily. But I don't exactly blame Remy for it, given Everett is the son of the town's worst drunk. Thankfully, Remy doesn't give Everett any trouble, just takes his order without comment and turns to someone else. Everett Duncan, while I live and breathe! Even from here, I can hear Lila. She leans as far as she can in Everett's direction. The women surrounding her, a lot of them Fort Knot fish and wives I recognize from church, go quiet to listen. It's been forever since I saw your face. Lila's own face is unchanged from high school, 
wide set and youthful except for the lines under her eyes, the kind particular to mothers of young children, exhaustion no concealer can hide. I try to remember if Lila was one of the girls who tried to win Everett's attention back in high school, but can't recall. She seems ready to do it now, though. Although the fishing wives are eyeing her, she plows ahead. What brings you back to town? Everett turns from the bar, holding two beers by their slim necks. Oh, you know. He shakes his rain-wet hair and grins at me. This and that. Lila follows Everett's grin to me, and her mouth twists like she's sucking a lemon. She and I have a complicated history. We're the same age, but she grew up pretty and well-liked, the star in church musicals, until she got pregnant out of wedlock and her life was derailed. My mother was vicious behind the scenes, and my father devoted a whole month's lectures to the dangers of the fallen woman, a spotlight that humiliated the LeBlanc family until they finally got the hint to leave. Lila had been quickly married off to an older man from Forsyth, who was supposedly the father, though people continued to whisper other more scandalous names, and eventually her family started coming back to church. Still, rumors keep spreading about how Lila can be found at the Blue Moon Bar in the company of men who aren't her husband. It's amazing how closely women are watched in Bottom Springs. It makes me think once again that my invisibility has been a protection. I give her an uneasy nod as Everett plunks our beers on the table and scoots in next to me. She doesn't nod back. She's staring at us, completely arrested like we're a puzzle she can't figure out. What's her deal? Everett asks in a low voice. I break Lila's gaze and reach for a beer. I don't know. Maybe Lila hates me because she can sense my guilt over her treatment and interprets it as pity. Or maybe, somehow, she can sense I've committed a sin far worse than hers and have never been punished. Good old Bottom Springs, Everett says, knocking my knee. The fact that he's sitting so close to me that our legs and elbows touch might be another reason people are staring, but touching is just Everett's compulsion. Ever since he discovered physical closeness could be safe, that it doesn't always come with a sting, it's been hard to reel him in. I roll my eyes at his comment, though. This is what Everett does now. He comes back and acts like a tourist. It's the biggest thing that's changed about him since he left. My whole life I've tried to look at Bottom Springs like an anthropologist observing a foreign land, wanting the illusion of distance. But Everett's the one who actually achieved it. All the cruelty, the backwardness, he can laugh it off now because he's just passing through. Except I don't think that's an option for either of us anymore. Not with the investigation. Now everything is a threat we must take seriously. I scan the bar. I don't see Barry yet. Hey, Everett. From a nearby table, Gerald Terrio smirks at us. Gerald is Sheriff Terrio's nephew and a Fort Knott fishing captain a tall, wiry man whose skin is prematurely leathery from spending so much time out in the Gulf. Planning on getting in any fights tonight? Should I tell my boys to gird their loins? The men around him, his crew, laugh. It turned out the rumors that circulated when we were teens about Everett getting into bar fights were true. Everett was always in and out of the blue moon, but the reason was one no one in our high school could have guessed. Night after night, Ever came to pick up his dad from the bar after he'd gotten too drunk to see straight. On more than one occasion, before he fell unconscious, Mr. Duncan managed to piss someone off so bad they were willing to take up the matter with his son. For Everett, walking into the blue moon used to mean walking into a viper's nest a place people waited to hurt you, a place where you nevertheless had to go. When he finally told me this, Everett said he was proud that he mostly walked away with nothing more than a black eye. I told him next time he should just let his father rot, and he'd responded, 
that it was funny what you could see for other people that you couldn't see for yourself. Now I shoot him a warning look, but he's one step ahead. I think you're safe tonight, he says, tipping his beer at Gerald. His unwillingness to be baited bores the table of men, and they go back to ignoring us. I start to say something to Everett, but he touches my arm and nods in the direction of the booth next to us. I strain and catch the end of a sentence. And wouldn't you know, a shrill voice whispers, she told me what the vandalism was. Everett and I glance at each other, then lean closer. Vandalism? That's what the sheriff was investigating when they found the skull, right? An older woman's voice. Why anyone sets foot in that swamp is beyond me, whispers a third. It's a death trap. What you hear? You're never going to believe it. The shrill voice nearly trembles. With fear or anticipation, I can't tell. There was evidence of witchcraft. I frown at Everett, but he looks as confused as me. One of the women sucks in a breath. What kind of evidence? The heavy door to the blue moon bangs open, stealing my attention. Barry strides in, still wearing his deputy's uniform. Instantly, the crowd at the bar shouts to him and swallows him up. I glance at Everett, suddenly nervous. I've never seen the two of them in the same room before, not even in high school, and I don't know how it will go. It's not too late to leave. Ever nods in the direction of the bar. I think it is. Someone has clearly whispered I'm here because Barry leans back from the bar, beer in hand, eyes searching. When he sees me, they widen in surprise. Then he notices Everett and the pleasantness falls from his face. He launches from the bar. Incoming, Ever mutters. Barry strides up, wearing a plastered-on grin. He takes off his deputy's cap and rustles his mop of brown hair. Ruth, what are you doing here? It feels like the whole bar is watching. I haven't seen much of you the last few days. I try to speak loudly so everyone can hear. What with the investigation, thought I'd surprise you. Plus, look who came to visit. Barry leans down and pecks me on the cheek. When he rises, he directs his affable grin at Everett. Barry looks like I'd always imagined Heathcliff would. Short and stocky, with longish brown hair and a thick square jaw. But he has none of Heathcliff's broodiness. He, like Lila, grew up in the sun, with his football career and perfect church attendance and easy-going smile. The way attaboys and yes sirs roll off his tongue makes everyone love him, including my parents. Well, 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 look what the cat dragged in. The women at the booth next to us titter. The tables have turned and now they're spying on us. Ever glances at me. I give him the slightest nod and he sticks out his hand. Nice to see you again, Barrett. Barry chuckles and grips his hand. Their forearms flex as they each squeeze tight. Barrett Holt's my daddy. It's good to see ya, old boy. Wasn't sure we'd ever catch you here again. Figured you had more exciting places to be than little old bottom springs. He shares a knowing grin with Gerald and his table. Ruth's still here, Everett says as they release each other. That's reason enough. Sure, sure, Barry chuffs my cheek. Tell you what, why don't I join you? He glances between me and Ever, trying not to let his displeasure show over how close we're sitting. I swallow. I need to smooth things over. Please sit, I gesture to the other side of the table. We've been dying for you to get here. You must be exhausted from the investigation. He drops into the seat with a sigh. It's been a long week, I'll tell you what. Gerald shoves his chair back and stands. You talking homicide? Oh, yeah. Barry groans with what seems like overperformed resignation. What else? We got more news this afternoon. 
Well, in that case, Gerald says, hunching down next to Barry in the booth, I'm all ears. There's a mad scramble as another one of Gerald's fishing crew members scoots in next to Gerald. Now, there's three grown men squished into their side of the booth, and the women in the booth next to ours climb to their knees to peer over the partition. Even more people scoot their tables and chairs close to ours. One woman looks ready to claim the third seat on Everett's and my side of the booth, then glances at Everett and thinks better, settling for a chair instead. Is it true you found witchcraft in the swamp? asks one of the women hanging over the partition. It's the one with the shrill voice. Every eye is on Barry. He sighs and takes a long swig of beer, drawn out the weight. We got the call a few days ago from Hardy Tullis. You know, that crazy fellow that tries to wrestle gators, everyone murmurs. Well, he said there were symbols carved into all these trees out in the swamp. At first, Sheriff said to ignore him on account of his being crazy hardy, but eventually I decided to check, and it's a good thing I did. Otherwise, we never would have found the skull. Anyway, sure enough, there they were. The same symbol carved into a dozen trees. Most hair-raising thing you ever seen. I swear I started praying the minute I saw it. What kind of symbol? Gerald asks. I glance at Everett. He's playing like he's not interested, slowly tearing the logo from his bottle, unwinding the paper delicately like it's a sash from a woman's dress he's unraveling. Spooky satanic stuff, Barry says, and chills race up my arms. A circle with two horns, one on top, one on bottom. Sign of the beast. A jolt of recognition hits me as whispers of Satan spread like a hissing echo throughout the bar. Everett leans forward. The horns, do they look like crescent moons? I swallow hard as people turn to stare at him. It's clear they're not surprised Everett Duncan knows to ask such a question, and of course, neither am I. Suddenly I wonder if we're doing more harm than good being out in public. Barry bristles. The sheriff said they're horns. He's seen this thing before, an old witchcraft symbol, he said. Has to do with the low man. My God whimpers one of the women in the booth beside us. The older woman next to her elbows her. Don't take God's name in vain. The low man, Gerald repeats, sounding shell-shocked. Sweet Jesus. He takes a fortifying swig of beer. No one admonishes him for taking the Lord's name. The bar is quiet, chilled. You better saw down those trees right quick, says one of Gerald's fishing crew and there's a murmur of agreement. Better yet, torch them. Two crescent moons rest in on a circle, their barbed ends pointing out like horns. I don't know the symbol, but I've seen others like it, years ago, painted in blood. My voice comes out too high. Do you have any idea who did it? Barry looks at me and smiles. Ah, look, I done scared poor Ruth. I swear, y'all, sometimes I think she's just a teenage girl at heart. He shares his grin with the table, scared of everything. Actually, Ever's voice is deadpan. I doubt there's a single thing on God's green earth that could scare Ruth Cornier. God's earth or the devil's. Hey now, Barry shifts uncomfortably, I and Gerald. No need to talk like that, devil's earth and all. For some reason, maybe it's sitting next to Everett, I feel a rare stir of courage. He's right, though. I'm not scared. And what's so embarrassing about being a teenage girl? Every teenage girl I've met has been the scariest creature on the planet, Everett says. I'd put them up against the low man any day. I smile at him. I'm not sure if he means that as a compliment for me or a dig at the girls we went to high school with, like Lila over there, but either way, I like it. And just like that, 
we're back in our private world. Despite everything, hope lights in me that our friendship can be revived. However, as much as we're enjoying ourselves, our exchange has won us no fans in this crowd. Quite the opposite. People are giving each other charged looks around the table. We've never been good at fitting in, even when we try. Well, excuse me, Barry says. I didn't realize Everett Duncan was the patron saint of teenage girls. His comment breaks the tension when in laughter. Encouraged, Barry turns to me. I also didn't realize I was going to have the pleasure of attending the Ruth and Everett variety show. Your mama warned me about it, too, but it's different seeing it up close. His words make my stomach sink. You talked to my mother today? I had to go to your folks' house to deliver my report to the reverend. Just got back. That's why I was late to the bar. He winks at Gerald and the boys. By the way, your mama says don't be late to Bible study tomorrow. Somehow my parents already know Everett's in town. I thought the sheriff was your boss, says Everett, taking a swig of beer. Not James Cornier. If there's one thing you don't do around Barry, it's insult my father. He is, Barry says darkly. But don't act like you don't know everything that happens in this town runs through the reverend. You ain't been gone that long, Columbine. A hushed silence fills the bar. Barry, I say sharply. Don't. It's okay. Everett's talking to me, not Barry. Don't worry. He nudges my knee. I don't care. Even though Everett's the one who's been insulted and I'm only defending him, people glare at us so hard I can feel the heat from their stares. Women aren't supposed to talk sharply to their men, especially in public. I don't know if this rule is Southern Baptist or Southern Louisiana in origin, or if those two cultures are so intertwined here in Bottom Springs that they've become inseparable. Either way, my father says a woman's place is one step behind her husband, serving as his most faithful lieutenant, and as such, public contradiction is betrayal. Let your women keep their silence, he likes to say, which is a line from Timothy. Yet another reason I don't come to the blue moon, I'm bound to endanger myself. But to everyone's surprise, Barry doesn't admonish me. Instead, he groans and dips his head. Ruth's right, he directs his words to Everett. I'm sorry, that was unchristian. It's the stress. No offense intended. None taken, Everett says, and I'm probably the only person here who believes him. Gerald clears his throat. <clears throat> you and my uncle find out anything else about the skull? He gestures around the bar. You've got all of us here racking our brains trying to come up with information. Sad to say, there have been a fair number of folks who took off or disappeared these past years. Kinda hard to remember anything suspicious. You know, Barry says, settling back. He looks glad to be back in the spotlight for the right reasons. We did learn something critical. The bar hushes, the air charging. Every hair on my body pricks to attention. This is it. Everett goes still. What? You figure out who the skull belongs to or something? I'm amazed at how cool his voice sounds, how benignly curious. Barry nods. We got the results back this afternoon. A match on dental records. He glances around. I'm really not supposed to say before the sheriff. Tell us, pleads the woman who opted for a chair over sitting next to Everett. We're going to find out eventually. This just gives us more time to think. Barry eyes Gerald and the Fort Knot fishing crew. All right, then, but I need you all to brace yourselves. You're not going to like it. For six years, Everett and I have avoided speaking Renard's name, willing him away, keeping his spirit locked in whatever dark hell he was sent to after we killed him. Now I'm going to hear his name again, and like an invocation, 
it'll call his spirit back. There will be hell on earth. Barry takes a breath to speak. Renard, the darkness whispers, like a spell curling out of Barry's mouth. The skulls Fred Fort knots. Barry shakes his head. Can you believe it? Gasps erupt around the bar, loudest from Gerald and the Fort Knot fishing crew, Fred's former employees. Even the people who'd remained at the counter now get up to join us, sensing something big has happened. Fred's name leaps from table to table. For a moment, all I feel is strangely hollow. Where Renard's name should be, there's an imposter. Fred Fortnot, I echo. My voice is hoarse. I thought he died in a boat accident, lost in the gulf. I grew up my whole life next door to the Fortnots. Fred, his wife Mary, and their daughter Beth. Fred founded Fortnot Fishing, which, by God's grace, has grown into one of the biggest commercial fishing companies in southern Louisiana, employing more than half this town, sending hundreds of men out into boats to trowel the gulf for shrimp and red snapper. Gerald Tirio and a big chunk of the people in this bar worked for Fred or were married to people who did. Fred had been one of the most respected men in Bottom Springs, a church elder, and one of my father's closest friends. When he disappeared three years ago, Fort Knot Fish and suspended work for a month to join the sheriff in search in the Gulf. All they recovered was Fred's personal skiff. The whole town had gathered for a vigil on Main Street to mourn the man lost to the same sea that had given him his livelihood. Everyone except Fred's wife and daughter. How is it Fred in the swamp? and not Renard. It doesn't make sense. We assumed that's how Fred died when we found his boat, Barry says. But Forensic says his body's in the swamp, and he didn't die by accident. Someone beat the living sh- He glances at me. Sorry, I forgot. Delicate ears. Gerald and the other Fort Knot fishing captains still haven't uttered a word. For once, their shock is too great. That's hard to hear. Everett says, still calm. He has to be in shock like I am, but doing a better job of hiding it. I should be relieved. Holy Father, I should be ecstatic. But I can't accept the idea that we've dodged a bullet. Something still feels terribly wrong. The sheriff's planning on announcing it tomorrow, Barry says, and to my surprise, reaches across the table to take my hands. I'm so rigid he has to yank them, but he does, persistent. The way his fingers circle my wrists feel like handcuffs sliding on. I can't shake the feeling I should be going to prison. Don't worry, Ruth. Barry rubs the thin skin where my pulse beats in my wrists, and Everett looks down. You don't have to be scared. Whoever did this, we're going to find him, and he's going to fry. You can find him, Gerald says darkly, but you won't have a body left to fry. I'm going to take that man apart just like he did to Fred. The conversation erupts around us, vows of vengeance and whispers of horror from voices thick with alcohol. Under the table, Everett bumps my knee again. When I glance at him, he raises a dark eyebrow in question, inviting me back into our secret universe just him and me. At his look, I realize why I'm not relieved, despite our narrow escape. Because Fred Fortnot was murdered and disposed of in the exact same manner, in the exact same place, as the man we killed years before him. Which means there's another killer in Bottom Springs. A copycat. Does someone know what we did? I wish we were alone so I could ask ever. I want to read the reassurance on his face, hear him say, We'll figure it out. For the first time, I can't tune out the world. It presses its fingers around my throat, suffocating. Gerald's face purple with rage. The voices clamoring over each other to be heard. The animal smell of too many close-pressed bodies mingling with the sour tang of beer. 
Could the person who killed Fred be in this very room? Are they watching Everett and me swirling ice cubes in their glass, smiling to see us sweat? Have we escaped one noose only to find our necks in another? Ever leaned so close his lips brush my hair. It's okay, Ruth, he whispers. Don't you see? You're safe. Goosebumps ripple over my arms. He's wrong. This discovery isn't a reprieve. We've entered some dark game I don't understand. Our secret is a wound, a vulnerability. We're bleeding in the water and there's a predator circling so cunning I never saw it coming. Safe is the last thing we are. 7. June. 17 years old. Every day after we fed Renard to the swamp, I watched for Everett to appear at the edge of my property, and when he did, I followed him into the wild. Over time, through forest, mud, and meadow, I learned to move as smoothly as he did, to sight birds swooping through trees, discern different types of bog flowers. In a million years, I never would have guessed that the first time I'd fall in love it would be with the earth itself. The pure, sweet smell of trees after rain. The sucking squelch of mud under my boots. The sound of leaves shaken so furiously by the wind that they rang like bells. Most intoxicating of all, the way my body felt moving through it, confident and alive. At night, we stayed out as late as we dared. My mother always told me night was when the world became the devil's playground, but Everett showed me the opposite. At midnight, when every shred of light seeped from the world and it hung at the pinnacle of darkness, the creatures of the forest woke and soared and sang. So did I. Under the protective spell of the dark, I became a wolf, howling with Everett exploring traipsing through the swampland unafraid midnight ruth was my boldest self too precious for sunlight eventually my parents discovered what i was doing and were incensed they tried everything to stop me but there was no threat or punishment that would make me give up everett when my father screamed, spittle flying, when he told me Everett was a corrupter with a tar black soul sent by the devil to debase me, I let his words tumble past. When he caught me sneaking home and struck me with the cane until my back bent, I let the pain sink in and flow out. I have no idea where the bravery came from, why their disapproval didn't trigger the same debilitating fear it always had. Perhaps it was simply that I could sense, even in the beginning of our friendship, that Everett was a lifeline I'd better hold on to. One day I came downstairs for breakfast wearing my sneakers, planning to meet Everett after, and found my parents sitting side by side at the kitchen table. That was bad enough, but when I saw what was on the table, my stomach seized. Two thick envelopes, torn open. My admissions results from Louisiana Tech and LSU, the two schools in the state with the strongest English programs and cheapest tuition, the two I'd secretly applied to. If I could just get accepted, I'd reasoned, I could come up with a plan to pay so I wouldn't have to ask my parents for money, and then I'd stand a chance of convincing them. Graduation was now a week away. I'd been waiting for these letters all spring. You went behind our backs, said my mother in her quietest voice, which was also her most dangerous. My father and she were fire and ice, and like Robert Frost said, when it came to destruction, either was nice and would suffice. She flicked the letters with her bony fingers. How dare you make plans without us like we're nothing? Your parents who raised you. I was going to tell you, don't interrupt your mother. My father boomed. The great James Cornier was thick and towering, larger than life, 
with a sonorous voice, square teeth and wild chest hair that curled from the tops of his dress shirts, the dark giant to my mother's pale sprite. When he rocked forward, the entire table quaked. Where's your judgment, Ruth? These places are Sodom incarnate. That's not true. Desperation pitched my voice higher. They're places for learning. That's all I want to do. Books were my refuge. The idea of devoting my life to them was a dream that had carried me through every day in Bottom Springs. Learn what? My father was flummoxed. You can learn everything you need to be God's servant here. A woman should learn in quietness and full submission, said my mother. Timothy 2.11. That's what you're doing in this house. We're teaching you everything the Bible says you need. How to love your future husband and children. How to be self-controlled. How to submit to God's will. My father shook his head. The need for worldly education is a lie told by the government, Ruth. We appease them as we must, but enough is enough. I won't let your head become clouded. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised, my mother quoted. Her white blonde hair, as stripped of color as mine was full of it, swished over her shoulders. I know those books you read when you think we're not looking give you airs, but you're almost a woman now, Ruth Cornier. It's time to stop being vain and childish and grow up. They weren't supposed to ambush me. I was supposed to find the letters in the mailbox and, if they contained good news, present my case methodically, persuasively. I'd win them over and then escape to a city where no one watched or whispered, where Renard Michael's bloody face didn't haunt me around every corner. I took a deep breath and dared to meet my father's eyes. The cost won't be a burden. I swear, I kept my voice subdued, the way he liked it. I'll take out loans and work a part-time job, if you'll just sign the paperwork. He was my legal guardian. Without his signature, I couldn't access anything. Please, Daddy. The thought that I could lose the one shining light at the end of my tunnel was suddenly too much to bear. Instead of keeping calm, I made a fatal mistake. I fell to my knees and placed my head in my father's lap, willing him to see me as his daughter, to feel a spark of tenderness that could sway his heart. The words tumbled out. I want to see the world. I want to learn and have a career. My voice cracked. Please, I'll suffocate if I don't leave. I knew the moment I looked up that I'd revealed too much. Given my parents a glimpse of the real me, the emotions I'd hidden, it was a line I could never uncross. My father jerked his knee away and I fell back against the kitchen floor. It's that boy, isn't it? My mother hissed. He's in your ear, getting you to want things you have no business wanting. My heart felt as if it were physically breaking. They were going to blame Everett and kill two birds with one stone. I scrambled to my feet. This has nothing to do with him. I've wanted to go to college my whole life. You're not leaving Bottom Springs. My father's words were heavy and final. You're a cornier. You will set an example. Please. My legs trembled as I gripped the table. Don't take this away. It's all I've lived for. One of my greatest weaknesses has always been that sometimes grief and fear can grip me so completely that I lose control. I could feel it happening then, that old demon clawing, the shortness of breath, a pounding heart, the sense that I was spiraling and couldn't stop. Do you see now? My mother turned to my father as if they were picking up a conversation they'd started long before. She's hysterical. God demands we intervene. I willed in air. If they were going to call the elders to lay hands on me, I'd run. Your mother's right. 
My father crossed his arms. It's time we take you to the doctor. I gaped. You said they're for the weak, for people without the moral fiber to connect with God. You are the weak, he said. And you've been masking it for years, haven't you? But your mama and I've seen it. Our only child, a deviant. Well, God calls us to face down the devil, even when he's inside our own home. My heart pounded. I couldn't let them touch me. Listen to me, my father commanded. And that's when the switch flipped. I had the sudden sensation of being pinned down, unable to breathe. I'd do anything to escape. I lunged for the letters and bolted down the hall, ignoring my parents' shouts, then burst from the front door and streaked across the lawn. As I shot around the street corner, there was Everett making his way to my house. He stopped short, but I kept running, clutching my letters, not even stopping when I got close enough to register his fresh black eye. Ruth, he called amazed. What's happening? I blew past him then felt him chasing me as I charged down the street. I took the turn off to the woods, cutting through neighbors' lawns, running hard enough to keep myself from thinking. Trees appeared in the distance, and I plunged into them. After another minute of exertion, I fell against the trunk of a pine, gasping. Soon, Everett was beside me. His face flushed. He braced a hand on the tree near my shoulder. What the hell's going on? I shook my head. My muscles burned, sweat plastered my hair to my forehead. When I gulped enough air, I managed to say, panic attack. I'd never told anyone. I didn't even know for sure. I'd read a book with the character who had them, and it had been like a light bulb going off. I diagnosed myself. What do your parents do? Everett asked, and I didn't stop to wonder how he knew. I pushed the letters against his chest. I'm not going to college. He smoothed the papers and scanned them. Funny, because it looks like you are. They said no. Everett wiped his face with the hem of his t-shirt, exposing his muscled stomach. I jerked my gaze away. Who cares what they said? You're almost 18. Go anyway. I flushed. With what money? I don't even have a checking account. I need them to sign for a loan. I shouldn't have to explain to Everett. He should know as well as anyone that money was destiny. He laughed. It startled me enough that I glanced up. What? These people, if they can't trap you one way, they just find another. He looked back at the letters. A thousand to confirm your spot, huh? I leaned against the tree, letting the bark bite into my back. It was getting easier to breathe. Might as well be a million. I have the same chance of coming up with it. There's a community college out in St. Lafitte, you know. That's only an hour away. It's not LSU, but it's something. Won't cost you a thousand to register, neither. Maybe you could work a little after graduation, save up, then apply. Everett's eyes traveled from my clenched hands up to my face. He wore that tender look again the one that had alarmed me the first time I saw it. I've sat next to you in class for years. You of all people should be going to college. Are you going? Under my dress, sweat was drying on my skin, cooling it. I rubbed my arms, trying to ignore the fact that even the hint that he'd paid attention to me made me feel strangely light. To community college? He scrubbed his neck. Maybe, I don't know. I've got some things to work out first. I studied his face. The question slipped out. Do you really get in bar fights like people say? Everett's eyes narrowed. For years, I tried not to look too closely at his face. For a thousand reasons, it had seemed too dangerous. Now that we were becoming friends, I kept discovering things that took me by surprise, like how his eyes were impossibly dark yet sparkled with flecks of brown like little stars. The dark bruise around his eye did nothing to diminish the effect. Never mind the black eye, he said quickly. I found something. 
He fished in his pocket and pulled out something that glinted. Renard's mama necklace. It was streaked with dirt and something darker. Blood. A chill washed through me. Where'd you get that? Talk of Renard's disappearance was fading, but if anyone saw this necklace in Everett's possession, distinctly Renard's and covered in blood, we'd be in grave trouble. I found it in the clearing. Everett watched for my reaction. He meant the clearing where we'd killed Renard. Why did you go back? Returning to the scene of the crime seemed the most suspicious thing he could have done. In books, it was what killers did when they wanted to soak in the glory of their crimes. He shrugged. I was hunting in the clearings close to a burrow. There's reliable game there. You were hunting when you found me, too. I'd seen the dead animal he dropped. Why do you hunt so much? He looked past me. I have to eat. Doesn't your father buy groceries? Mr. Duncan, who ran the garage on the other side of town, was someone I'd crossed the street to avoid. Even from far away, you could feel the dark miasma of anger that ringed him. Churchgoers whispered he'd sold his soul to the devil and was now his emissary, a rumor strengthened by the fact that he and Everett had never once stepped foot inside the church. Some whispered they'd burst into flames if they tried. But Mr. Duncan's garage seemed busy despite the rumors. There were always cars there, which meant there had to be at least enough money to eat. Everett's words were clipped. Like I said, he clearly wanted to change the subject, so I gestured to the necklace. We have to get rid of it, right? He nodded. I thought you might want to do the honors all things considered. He watched me calmly, like it wasn't revolutionary that someone had thought of me, not as background filler, not as the mute daughter of Pastor Cornier, but as a person with thoughts and feelings as complex as anger and a desire for revenge. All I could manage was a weak, how? Come on. He turned to face the deep woods, the one place we hadn't yet ventured. I'll show you. He glanced back. Unless you need to go home. All of my life, my mother warned that the Louisiana deep woods were no place for children, especially girls. There were wolves and bears, venomous snakes and frogs spotted like leopards and spiders as big as your fist. No well-worn paths to guide you out of the maze of trees. In the deep woods, I was prey. But right now... Nowhere was as dangerous as home. Show me the way, I said. 8. June. 17 years old. After we'd hiked for an hour, Everett stopped. This is the place. I looked around, my breathing labored from keeping pace with him. As far as I could tell, there was nothing special here. The ground was nice and flat, clear of tree roots, but is that trash? Everett bent and grabbed the plastic bag, shaking it so I could see inside. There were bright wrappers, the kind unprocessed food from the gas station. There was rarely trash in the woods or the swamp. Too few people ventured in. I don't know why, he said, but this spot is popular with drifters. It's not even close to the highway. He looked around and shrugged. Maybe it feels sheltered. Either way, I've seen people camp here. I studied him. You really are always outside, aren't you? That was another one of the rumors at school. Everett Duncan was a Satanist freak with ripped-up clothes and an antisocial personality, practically a feral animal always lurking in the swamp or woods. His laugh was harsh. Usually, Everett was stoic. Every day when I met him on my lawn, he asked benign questions in an even tone. How are you doing? How's your homework going? I knew he did it to calm me, make me feel like even after what happened with Renard, normal life was possible. I'd gotten used to him being unflappable. This pained laughter was a crack in his armor. It made him seem human, and I wanted more. What's that laugh for? I asked, trying to goad him. 
his expression turned disdainful. Where else should I be? In church with your father? At home with mine? Should I join the football team or the yearbook so I can make memories I'll treasure forever? He was breathing hard. I'd rather take the gators. I looked at him and grinned. Why are you making that face? I can't believe you would dare critique sacred surrender. All those innocent, learned scholars just trying to drink life to the lees. I felt a tug of embarrassment quoting Tennyson, who we just read in English class. You weren't supposed to care so much about your homework that you memorized it. But the chink in Everett's armor was too inviting. He was being himself, so maybe I could too. Everett's mouth curved into a smile. The sharpness of his canines was still new to me, so I couldn't help but stare. How dull it is to pause. The words rolled off his tongue. To make an end, to rust unburnished, not to shine in use, as though to breathe were life. So he does do his homework. And she talks. Surprise, surprise. We grinned at each other. When Everett finally pulled his gaze away, his smile still hung in the air, like the afterimage of sunlight that stays glowing long after you close your eyes. Let's start the fire, he said and dropped to the dirt. I joined him, brushing back pine needles until I saw what he was looking for. Burn marks scoured deep into the earth. You're not supposed to light fires out here because it's a burn hazard, he said but people do it anyway. He nudged the bag of trash. If the sheriff or anyone ever stumbles on this place and they see someone's been set in fires, ours will be unrecognizable from the campers. You're burying our fire in theirs, like a needle in a haystack. He dropped Renard's necklace into my palm. I straightened the chain gingerly, like it was a relic. Then Everett gathered the pine needles back in a pile and pulled a lighter from his pocket, thumbing up a flame and set the needle smoking. We sat back and watched as they caught frond by frond. The fire was small, but hungry. Soon the whole pile was ablaze. The heat flushed my face. I pressed a finger to my cheek and felt the spot of cool like an island in a sea of lava. Do you want to put it in now? he asked. I think it's ready. I hooked the necklace and let it dangle over the fire until it got too hot. Then I released it. It fell, shimmering, into the center of the pit. Now we'll see how much he really loved his mother, Everett said. If it's real gold, it won't burn. I had a sudden vision of Joan of Arc tied to a stake and going up in flames. It was an image that had haunted me since I was a child, like Christ on his cross with his rivers of blood. You're betting it's not. Fake gold is iron and aluminum. They have a lower burning point. At my look, Everett shrugged. I help in my dad's garage. I've learned things. I watched the necklace closely. The answer was important. How much had Renard loved his mother? Enough to redeem him and damn us? A moral judgment hung in the balance. Look, Everett said. Mama was blackening at the edges, the little A starting to curl. His voice was dry. Guess he didn't love her that much after all. Don't say that. The words came out harsh. Just because someone can't afford something doesn't tell you what kind of person they are. It wasn't just me in college I was talking about. It was my fear that I'd be trapped here, and years from now when people passed me, they'd see a woman like everyone else, not the Ruth Cornier who tried to escape. I also felt an urge to protect Renard's mother, to keep her son's love for her true. I didn't know anything about the woman except she was out there somewhere grieving the loss of her child the son we'd taken. People's money might not tell you who they are, but their actions do. Everett was looking at me with the oddest expression. You defend the man who hurt you? I looked away. My eyes were pricking, and I didn't want him to see. No one is all bad. I refuse to believe it. 
says the reverend's daughter about her would-be rapist. I flinched. Do you want to say something then? The change was abrupt enough to make my head snap. What sort of thing? Everett shrugged. I don't know. Whatever's in your head. You can be the preacher. I looked into the crackling flames where Renard's heart darkened and burned and was surprised to find I did want to say something, but I didn't have words of my own. So like I'd done my whole life, I leaned on others. I am part of all that I have met, I recited softly. Yet all experience is an arch through which gleams that untraveled world, whose margin fades. I looked up from the fire to Everett, who watched me closely, whose margin fades forever and forever when I move. A smile ghosted his lips. Forever and forever. Amen. The fire popped. I looked at him. That day in the swamp, you held my hand. His lashes fluttered. Did I? I don't remember. I hadn't wanted to be touched since. The Sunday after, my mother had come into my room with the floral pin for my hair. I'd shrunk against the wall, but she insisted. So I'd stood rigid in front of my mirror as she tugged and scraped the tines against my scalp. I'd remembered my daydream. A boy's fingers moving gently through my hair. My eyes had filled with tears. But for some reason, Everett was different. I kept thinking about the way his hand gripped mine that day at the swamp. Now he looked down at my side. I don't normally like to. It's okay, I said softly. No problem. He looked into the fire, pale skin turning the lightest shade of rose. Then he took my hand, his skin remarkably cold for a summer's day, and laced his fingers between mine. He examined our locked hands with an indecipherable expression. What are you thinking? Nothing. He swallowed. You give a good funeral, is all. Do you mind one day? I squeezed his hand. Be serious. I am. I think we should be friends. I thought we already were. We sat in silence, warmed by the fire, until the necklace was close to disappearing. That which we are, we are. Everett murmured, sounding strangely resigned. Tennyson was right about that. No escape. We watched the last piece of Renard Michaels blacken into ash, flakes as thin as feathers, and then float into the sky. Everett stood and reached a hand to help me up. We smothered the fire, gray smoke curling, and left, combing carefully back through the forest. By the time we spotted the tall grass meadow waving in front of us, my mind was pleasantly absent, drifting somewhere in the clouds. Forever and forever, I murmured. Ever, forever, amen. He turned over his shoulder with an amused smile, and then his eyes hooked down to my feet. Ruth, no, wait! But it was too late. The moment I looked down and saw the copperhead, its beautiful body red and brown like the leaves, it was already rising, its slitted eyes like twin slashes from a knife. It struck, sinking fangs into my inner thigh. I screamed, the pain like being stabbed in the snake lit away so fast it looked like it was gliding over the earth. I crumbled to the ground as ever it flew past me chasing the snake. When I cried out again, clutching my leg, he stiffened and rushed back. It's going to be okay, he promised. Can I touch you? I nodded, sobbing, feeling slippery blood roll down my leg from the puncture wounds. Two thin streams like bloody tears stained in my blue dress. Everett scooped me in his arms and took off. Even clutching me, he was surprisingly fast, blowing through the meadow grass like a meteor. When we were a hundred yards from the trees, he jerked to a stop and laid me on the ground. What are you doing? I cried, cupping my wound. Do you trust me? He bent over my thigh, one of his hands still cradling my head. He looked down at the bite, dark eyes burning, and pulled out a pocket knife. 
flipped the blade up. Did I trust him? It seemed not the right word for what I felt, both imprecise and not quite strong enough. I drew a deep breath. Yes, at the word, he spread my legs in the grass, lifting the thin cotton of my dress. Bite down, he instructed, and placed two cool fingers against my lips. I didn't know what he meant until he drew the tip of the blade across my thigh, opening the wound with a strong, sure cut. I bit down on instinct, tasting the salt of his skin as tears flooded my eyes. I could hear my father's voice. This was punishment for my sins. Suddenly, Everett pressed his mouth to the inside of my thigh and sucked. I lifted off the ground, gasping with his fingers in my mouth. The sensation was unlike any I'd ever felt. Nerves lit electric through my body. He drew away and spit a mouthful of blood into the grass. My blood was smeared over his face, crimson and deadly. If anyone saw him like this, bent over me dripping red, they would shoot him dead. But before I could think, he fastened his mouth over my thigh again, and I felt that warm, sucking pressure. He gripped my leg and pulled it closer, pressing his lips harder to my skin, the movement desperate like he had a raw thirst, and I was the only thing in the world that could quench it. The panic faded as something new built inside me, a hot pulsing in rhythm with the blood pumping through my veins. I closed my eyes, tipped my head back, and dug my fingers into the warm, dry dirt. All thoughts of punishment fled. There was only Everett's mouth on me. Like a blade of grass, I was rooted in the meadow, unburdened by shame and simply, unbearably, alive. Everett withdrew from my leg and spit once more. I opened my eyes, trying to gain control over my breathing. That should help, he panted, wiping his mouth on his t-shirt. His teeth were stained red. But we need to get you to the hospital for anti-venin. I don't have a working car. I need to take you back home. I nodded, still breathless, lost to the pulsing even as it waned. I'm going to pick you up again. Is that okay? No one asks for permission. The pain and strange pleasure had transformed my brain into a fog. Thoughts were hard to hold on to. I'm taking that as a yes, he said, and heaved me up. We made our way out of the meadow and into my parents' neighborhood, cutting across lawns. My house loomed menacingly in the distance. I changed my mind, I breathed. I don't want to go back. Our house had been freshly painted and now gleamed unblemished white, an upgrade my mother had insisted on even though vanity was an affront to God. Please, ever. He stopped, gazing down at me, looking torn. Just then, at the house next to ours, Fred Fortnaught ambled out of his front door. He was large and tan like my father and wore his blonde hair slicked back like him, too. They could be brothers. Fred stopped and bent over a flower bush. Quickly, he stomped on a small lizard running through the mulch. I can bring you to Fred, Everett said. Fred can drive you to Blanchard instead of your parents, and that way... No! My heart thundered against my ribcage. Not him. Please, Everett, don't let him see us. He studied me, dark eyes narrowing. Our faces were so close our noses brushed. Why are you so scared of Fred? Take me home after all, I whispered. Just leave me on the porch so they don't catch you. Everett rested his forehead against mine and took a deep breath. Then he ducked past Fred's and brought me to my parents, laying me outside their front door. I ran away today to avoid the hospital. I gripped my teeth. It's just like you said. One way or another, they always get you in the end. One of these days, Everett said softly, close to my ear, someone's going to get them back. And before I could respond, he jabbed the doorbell and gave me one last look before he ran. My mother opened the front door and screamed. Nine.
June, 17 years old. Night fell eerily orange as I lay in bed, staring at the ceiling, although some distant voice of reason buried under layers of fog said it was impossible my ceiling swirled with constellations, glittering stars that spun and tilted exactly the way science books said they did, meteors that shot with fiery plumes from one corner of my bedroom to the other. I was watching it all when I heard three sharp raps against my window. I swung off the bed and crept over. Everett sat on the other side of my second-story window pane, his face glowing reddish-orange. Quickly, I unlocked the window and heaved it up. Everett climbed inside, bringing balmy air and the scent of night flowering jessamine from the garden. Blood moon tonight, he said by way of greeting. He kept one hand hidden behind his back. Have you seen it? I had been grounded to my room since getting back from the hospital. I leaned out the window and gasped. The moon was full and vivid red. It looked like it was on fire. It's like the prophecy, I breathed, from the book of Joel. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord. Everett grinned. You should see the town, people buying all the dry goods out of Piggly Wiggly, convinced it's the apocalypse. I'm not sure how elbow pasta's going to save them from the rapture, but maybe be glad you're locked inside. I glanced down at the grass below. How did you get up here? My voice came out low and dreamy. Ever frowned at me. There's a trellis running up your house? Practically a ladder. Ah. I smiled at the image of Everett scaling my house like a jungle gem, then had to lean against my desk when the same thought made me dizzy. He stepped forward, frown deepening. What happened at the hospital? Gently he took my elbow. Here, why don't you sit down? I let him usher me to my bed. I know we were together in the woods. Who? My parents. There was no getting around it when the doctor mentioned someone had cut my snake bite and sucked the venom out. Everett said nothing. He looked very beautiful standing there in the red moonlight. Tall, dark hair, fall in every which way. Even the bruise that ringed his eye seemed a delicate decoration, the swelling gone down since this morning. I kept the thoughts to myself. The doctor called it an old hunter's trick, I said, trying to distract myself. He said it's not supposed to work, but he could hardly find a trace of venom in me. I laughed. You really stumped him. Ever didn't laugh. But he still gave you the anti-venom, right? And something for the pain? I nodded. Moving my head felt like dragging it through mud. Everett studied me. I was wearing an old faded nightshirt and shorts that barely peeked out underneath, but for some reason I didn't feel ashamed. Is that why you're acting so strange? Because of the pain meds? My head was too heavy to hold up. I dropped back onto my bed. After the doctor left, the psychiatrist came in. The one my parents wanted me to see. I was already in the hospital, so I was trapped. I couldn't see Everett, but felt him draw nearer. What did the psychiatrist say? He asked a lot of questions. How often I felt unhappy. If I was aware my overactive imagination and emotions were hurting my parents. If I felt ashamed when I became hysterical. If I believed people were out to get me. If I had the urge to run away, I shook my head. It was exhausting. That's not fair. Everett's sharp voice came from above me. If you feel like people are out to get you, it's because they are. You're seeing clearly. Hysteria is the only sane response to this town. I watched the stars glitter on my ceiling. He gave my dad a prescription. I don't know what. Something has to be wrong with me. They gave me one of the pills, and I felt... I searched for the right word. So foggy ever since. Ruth. Everett ran a hand over my arm, fingers skimming my skin, and the touch sharpened my focus. His worried face appeared in my line of sight. 
don't take any more of those. Even if your parents force you, I don't know, throw them up or something. This doesn't feel right. I shrugged. The pain's gone, though, and I stopped feeling guilty. I let my voice trail off, not willing to risk Colin Renard's ghost into the room. Everett's fingers trailed to my shoulder. Goosebumps followed in their wake. Pain is how you know you're alive, Ruth. It's not something you should bury. I struggled to sit up. You haven't even told me why you're here. His intense stare remained fixed on me. I wanted to check on you. And give you this. Everett pulled his hand from behind his back, presenting a dead copperhead. The tail coiled around his forearm. The snake's slitted eyes were open, glassy and unseen. If it wasn't for the medicine muffling my feelings, turning them cotton ball soft, I think I would have screamed. Instead, I leaned closer, morbidly curious. I studied the leaf-like pattern of its scales. Is this the snake that bit me? He nodded. I went back and found him while you were in the hospital. Now you don't have to worry when we go back to the woods. He held the snake higher, presenting it like a trophy. An eye for an eye, I murmured. I searched myself. It's strange, but I think it does make me feel safer. Thank you. He lowered his hand. You should always feel safe, Ruth. I'll make sure of it. I looked out the window at the blood moon. Every part of tonight was surreal, reality twisted on its side. I was half convinced I was dreaming. Let's go outside, I said. If this was a dream, I could do anything. Ever eyed me. Are you sure you can manage? I floated to the window and leaned out. Apocalypse or not, the sky was a splendor. The red-orange light and the eerie quiet made my neighborhood feel like another, more peaceful place. Yes, I want to be outside, not trapped in here. Okay then, Rapunzel, let's climb to the roof. That'll be the best view. I turned to him. It'll be just like climbing a tree. Slowly, I shook my head. You've never climbed a tree? You climbed through my window holding a dead snake and I'm the strange one? I raised my eyebrows. After a moment, his face cracked into a smile. Fair enough, he allowed. I guess that means you don't want it? I bit my lip. No, thank you. But if you throw it in the garden... It'll scare my mother. His smile turned wolfish. He crossed to the window and dropped the dead snake matter-of-factly into the flower bed. Then he glanced at me. Come on, I'll help you up. Everett turned out to be right about the trellis. It was almost as good as a ladder. We climbed it slowly, then made our way across the roof, me in front and Everett behind, his hands hovering over my waist, ready to grab me if my feet slid on the shingles. Halfway across, I looked back and found him concentrating intensely on my feet. What? he asked when he caught me, but I only smiled and kept moving. Finally, we came to the edge of the roof and sat with our legs dangling over the side, the whole bloody landscape sweeping before us. I know it's supposed to be scary, I said, but it feels more like a fairy tale. The Bible is a fairy tale. From up here, Bottom Spring seemed smaller and more manageable, less like it could hurt me. I felt a surge of affection for my hometown or my heretical friend I couldn't tell. Promise me you won't say those sorts of things to other people, and don't ever bring them snakes. I know, but it's you. I closed my eyes to soak in the feeling of being a you and swayed, hands slipping on the shingles. Careful, Everett said, gripping my arm. Lean against me if you're having trouble. For a boy who'd been reluctant to hold my hand earlier today, this seemed a leap. My heart rate climbed, a small echo of the way it pounded in the meadow when his mouth closed over my thigh. I scooted until our legs touched and leaned my head against his shoulder. Everett wrapped an arm around me. He smelled green and mineral, like the woods. Will you show me how to climb trees? 
I like the way the world looks from high up. He squeezed my arm, which I took to mean yes. We sat in contemplative silence until he said, Ruth, hmm, can I ask you something and will you tell me the truth? I tilted my head to face him. In the moonlight, his black eye looked like a shadow spreading over his face. Of course, I didn't think it was possible for me to lie right now thanks to the pill. He looked into the distance. Why wouldn't you let me bring you to Fred Fortnot? A chill stole over me despite the balmy air. I'm not supposed to tell anyone. I promise my parents. His mouth quirked. If it helps, I've been told I'm a nobody. I kicked his dangling foot, then blinked at the square of cotton taped over the fang marks on my thigh. Fear coiled inside me. I remembered vividly the night Beth, Fred's daughter, came home late from a party. Beth was a year younger than me. Growing up as neighbors, she'd been one of the first people I'd tried to befriend. But ultimately, we were too different. Though she was naturally quiet like me, Beth was obsessed with being popular. As we grew up, I watched her slowly become friends with the football players and cheerleaders. She wasn't pretty like Lila LeBlanc or naturally charismatic, but her father was the boss of Fortnite Fishing, and that made her important. The night she tried to sneak in, she was wearing a scandalously short skirt with a frayed hemline, like she'd cut it herself. I could tell the moment I spotted her through my bedroom window that she'd had too much to drink. Though her father was as strict as mine, I wasn't surprised to see it. Beth would have done anything to fit in. One night last year, I watched Beth sneak in. I cleared my throat. She must have thought her parents were asleep, but I could see her dad in the kitchen, waiting in the dark. I waved to get her attention, but she didn't see me. I took a deep breath. The moment she stepped inside, he found her and started yelling. I would never forget the image. Tall, beloved Fred Fortnot towering over his small daughter in her short skirt, his face red, veins ropey in his forehead. I couldn't hear his shouting, but I could feel it. I knew in my gut violence was coming. It was an instinct, or maybe the look on Fred's face was close to my father's right before he took out his cane. Either way, I watched it unfold through the window like a horror movie. She must have said something to him that made him really mad, because... I waited for the lump in my throat to clear. He started choking her. Beth had sunk to the floor so fast it was almost astonishing. But he was very large, after all. She was a doll in his hands. Everett went rigid. He hurt his own daughter? Now that I'd started, the secret poured from me. She was sobbing on the floor, but he hit her anyway. Over and over, his hands were all over her. Everett's body grew so tense it practically hummed. I looked at his black eye and was about to ask about it when he said, tersely, What did you do? I took a deep breath. I ran and woke my parents. My dad went over to Fred's house, but I don't know what happened after that because they closed all the blinds. I'd come to the part of the story I was truly not supposed to reveal. I swallowed thickly, the words stuck in my throat. It was amazing how embodied obedience was. Amazing how even though sometimes I thought I hated my parents, their commandments still wormed their way so deep into my subconscious that obeying them was more muscle memory than choice. That had to be the worst kind of prison. The one whose bars were buried under your skin, invisible cages around your heart and mind. Getting the words out felt like pushing through a heavy door. Two nights later, when Fred went out, Mrs. Fortnock came to our house crying. We didn't have the front door locked, and she just burst in. The sound of the door banging against the wall had cracked like thunder through the house. My parents were in the living room. She fell at my father's feet and begged him to help her and Beth escape. She said they needed our mercy. 
He tried to shush her, but she only got louder, telling him Fred had been hurting Beth for years, and it was only getting worse. She was grateful my family had finally witnessed it. Now my parents would believe her and help. But Beth and Mrs. Fortnot are still here. Everett's face was unreadable. They never left. My father told her she was breaking her covenant with God, airing her husband's business, and a front of a child, too. I'd never forget Mrs. Fortnot's face when she turned and saw me in the kitchen, frozen and watching. There'd been shame in her face. But underneath the shame was desperation, an instinct to survive. She'd looked at me, then kept on begging. My parents made me go to my room, but before I did, I heard my father say scripture commanded Mrs. Fortnot to submit to her husband the same as unto the Lord. She had to have faith in him like she had faith in Christ. Eventually, Mrs. Fortnot went home, and my parents told me I wasn't allowed to speak about what I'd seen. It would be a mercy to Mrs. Fortnot to hide that she'd betrayed her family. I tried to talk to Beth about it at school, but she practically shoved me away. The look of horror on her face when she realized I knew. Now she won't speak to me at all, and the blinds at their house stay closed. Everett took a deep breath. They can't be allowed to keep doing this. I leaned so I could look at him more clearly. They. Fred Fortnot, your father, mine. He jerked his hand out at the neighborhood, the blood-red lawn stretching in front of blood-red houses. All the men who run this town who were getting fat and rich being cruel while everyone sings their praises. I hate them, Ruth. His voice thickened. I hate them so much I can't keep it inside anymore. His words shocked me into silence. I'd never heard anyone speak like that. It was more than complaining about school or bottom spring smallness. Everett's words were a transgression. His visceral anger mixed him with the red moonlight to form black magic. Words capable of change in perspectives, opening doors. It felt in that moment that we really were glimpsing the beginning of the end. The waning of one world the dawn of the next. They hurt people and they take things. His voice grew ragged. Things you can never get back. Who took from you? But Ever was already shaking his head, so I changed direction. What do we do about it? Slowly, as silence stretched around my question, the stiffness left Everett's body, melting into the night. He leaned back, bracing himself against the roof with his hands, and looked at me. A shiver ran the length of my body. The fog cleared from my mind, and the night revealed itself with sudden sharpness. The sounds in nearby woods, not melodic, but the triumphant baying of predators. The houses on the street, not peaceful, but too still, like corpses, painted lurid, bloody red by a moon with pockmarks. Its face not a jewel, but a network of pits and bruises. There are people in this town, Ever said quietly, who get away with bad things. People who face no consequences. He held me pinned with his eyes, and as I stared back, I saw him with a sudden sharpness too, saw beyond his outer strength to his fragility. This boy who had been bruised, both in ways I could see and some I was beginning to suspect. His anger was a life raft, keeping him afloat. But I could be a life raft, too. I could help him like he'd helped me. Slowly, shingles scraping my thighs, I slid over the roof until I fit against his side again. Everett leaned his head to rest on mine. On my leg, next to my bandage, our hands met, fingers lacing together, the same as they had in front of the fire. One day, Everett whispered, 
there's going to be real justice. 10. Now. Caught you, says Nisa, and I nearly jump out of my skin. She steps up behind me and rests a hand on my shoulder, metal bracelets jangling. I told you if you kept reading that spooky stuff, you'd regret it. I shove my notebook in my lap, heart thundering, and manage to squeak. What? Nisa points at the book on the circulation desk. Telltale heart, huh? You got something you want to get off your chest? For a second, I simply blink at the Edgar Allan Poe collection, which is cracked open to the beginning of The Telltale Heart. I'd grab the text at random to shield my notebook, where I was writing every question we needed answered now that the skull and the swamp had turned out to be Fred's. I'd figured if I was stuck at work and couldn't talk to Everett, the least I could do was strategize. The fact that my cover-up turned out to be Poe seems a damning detail. I don't blame you for being on edge, Nisa continues. We all are, with the killer on the loose? She shivers, wrapping her peach cardigan tighter. Nisa Gadri's personality shines through in the bright colors she wears, a beautiful compliment to her rich dark skin and glossy curls, and in her special way of walking which I privately call Sashane. If she wasn't such an excellent librarian, she could have been a performer. Nisa has natural stage presence. She's been my sole colleague for a year, ever since she and her doctor husband Elijah moved here from Baton Rouge after Elijah got an offer at Blanchard Hospital, which employs the other half of town not employed by the Fort Knott Fishing Company. According to Nisa, it had been worth quitting her beloved job as a research librarian at LSU so her husband could fulfill his dream of working in rural medicine. I once asked how she could possibly stand living and working here after experiencing city life in a real library. To my surprise, she'd said Bottom Springs was paradise on earth, postcard perfect with its little main street, a town untouched by modernity and the encroachment of big businesses like Walmart, small enough to know your neighbors, beauty everywhere you looked. Hearing the admiration in Nisa's voice had pierced my heart, as if her inability to see this town the way I did was a betrayal. But even so, before her, I'd worked with crotchety old Mrs. Dupree, who died of a stroke two days after she retired, so I'm grateful to have Nisa. It's 9 a.m. and we're alone. Not that we tell anyone, but sometimes whole days go by without a single patron. On those days, Nisa and I entertain ourselves, or rather, she entertains me and I play willing audience member. Our topics range from books to town gossip, which Nisa somehow gets faster and fresher than anyone despite being a newcomer. That man of yours tell you anything new about the case? she asks now. I almost keeled over when I heard the skull was Fred Fortnott's. Of all people, Fred was almost as big in this town as your daddy. Apparently, Fortnott Fishing is at a standstill over the news. Barry hasn't told me anything. I twist my fingers under the desk. Barry drove me home last night, a thing I couldn't avoid even if all I wanted was to be alone with Everett so we could discuss Fred and the second killer what our next move should be. The fact that Ever doesn't own a phone and I have to work today seems akin to cosmic torture. I notice Nisa is hovering instead of sitting. You going somewhere? She roots around in her cardigan pocket. I heard Barry found a symbol carved in the swamp. Of course she did. She's a magnet for information. A circle with two crescent moons, I confirm. Heard it too. To my surprise, she produces a folded-up napkin from her pocket and smooths it. Like this? It's a drawing of the symbol in blue ink. Yeah, I say quietly. That's it. There are so many things I need to talk to Everett about. Perfect. She spins on her heel and beelines to one of our biggest sections, state and local history. I swivel in my chair. What are you doing? She stops at a bookshelf and bends over, pulling out two massive tomes. 
heften them, she heads back to the desk. A couple weeks ago, I was due in my sweep for any unchristian material, weeding out anything that might have slipped in through the donation box, like your daddy asked. I flush. I am the secret cause of this particular precaution. And I found these. Nisa slides the books onto the desk. Coastal Louisiana, an arcane history of your backyard, and modern Wicca in the South. You kept them? It's Nisa's turn to flush. A little history's not going to hurt nobody. I suppress a smile. Like me, Nisa is a book eater, except her passion is nonfiction, histories of things that really happened, while I need fiction to escape. The point is, I remembered these books when I heard about the symbol. I reach for an arcane history of your backyard. Really, there's information about the symbol in here? If she's right, and I've had it sitting at my fingertips all these years, what a fool I've been. There might be. Nisa grips my shoulders, her eyes wide with excitement. Do you know what this means, Ruth? I shake my head. Her thousand-watt grin lights up her face. It's time for a good old-fashioned research project. Her enthusiasm is contagious. The best part of any investigation is the part with the books, she finishes, and drops into the chair beside me. Nisa taps the cover of an arcane history. I've been fascinated by the history of southern Louisiana all my life. Her words come faster, charged with passion. At LSU, we were starting to see more research come out on pre-colonial history from indigenous scholars. What I wouldn't give to still have access to those archives... She stops herself, biting her lip. Anyway, one of the things that interested me most was evidence that southern Louisiana used to be a sanctuary for people escaping religious persecution, like the pilgrims flee in England. Oh no, honey. I'm talking about people who held beliefs Protestants and Catholics considered so profane that even being associated with them was enough to get you killed. Something about this area made it a haven for the outlandish and eerie, the truly heretical. Bottom Springs, a place that looked like it had been created with the otherworldly in mind. The kind of beliefs that might be linked to the symbol in the woods, I guess. Mm-hmm. Nisa opens modern Wicca. Hopefully, we'll find something. We sit reading side by side as the minutes tick by. The only sound Nisa's hum of contentment. I scan an arcane history. Its pages on Bottom Springs are scant, but it does outline Trufayet Parish's bloody history. How years before France sold Louisiana to the fledgling United States, European colonizers arrived on the coast of southern Louisiana and began a campaign of terror against the Chittimacha people until they'd killed or driven most of them away. After that, control over the area had passed back and forth between the French and Spanish, even between Catholics and Protestants of the same country. But the fighting was no less deadly, massacres over who controlled Bottom Springs' precious access to the Gulf. Though I know this history, it still pains me to remember how deeply our soil is soaked in blood. What's new is a chapter titled French Intra-Religious Wars. Like Nisa said, it seems Europeans fleeing religious persecution were drawn to southeast Louisiana, particularly those from France. But according to the book, the promise of freedom in the New World was a ruse. A group of mystics called Les Voyants, who escaped the guillotine in France, built a strong reputation in New Orleans, only to be hunted down and beheaded by traveling Catholic priests. Another group of French exiles called Le Culte de la Lune, who practiced an offshoot of Catholicism that worshipped the Virgin Mary, settled in what's now Forsyth. I have to read this part twice. Above all, I whisper aloud, Le Culte de la Lune worshipped a goddess known as the Queen Mother, believed to be a reimagining of Mary the Virgin, a deity responsible for all creation, symbolized by the moon. Catholic in origin but pagan in practice, Le Culte de la Lune performed rituals to ensure the Earth's continued balance. 
light and dark, summer and winter, genesis and destruction. They believed all must be held in harmony. I keep going, scanning the page. To achieve balance, le culte de la lune's ceremonies could involve bloodletting and animal sacrifice. Adherents often dressed in animal pelts, emphasizing their place in the natural world, and their matriarchs wore antler crowns meant to invoke the image of the Queen Mother. Catholic settlers in the 18th century who reported visions of Satan haunting the woods are now believed to have cited Le Culte de la Lune. I wince as I read the last line. While Le Culte de la Lune managed to persist longer in the New World than many other persecuted groups, eventually they too were hunted to extinction. I close the book and swallow hard. I've got something, Nisa says and splays out modern Wicca on the desk, pointing to a black-and-white photo of a group of men and women standing in a clearing ringed by trees. They're wearing dated clothes and giving the camera apprehensive smiles, as if unsure they want their picture taken. The caption reads, Truffayette Parish Wiccan Circle, photographed 1985. Wiccans here. Look at the trees, Nisa urges. I squint until I realize the trees surrounding the clearing are covered in carvings. So many symbols my eyes swim, like the trees have been transformed into living books. And there, among them, is the circle with twin moons. I look at Nisa with wide eyes. I knew I'd seen it, she says triumphantly. Scanning the paragraphs accompanying the photo, a sentence leaps out at me. In the late 19th century, southeastern Louisiana is home to many practicing circles, including Le Culte de la Lune, pictured one, a richness that reflects the area's history as a religious sanctuary. Excitedly, I shove my book at Nisa. I just read about them, but they say they were hunted to extinction. I wait with bated breath while Nisa reads. Finally, she looks up and raises an eyebrow. I think those tricky heathens survived, and now they call themselves Wiccans. Wiccans here in Potom Springs, I murmur, as recently as 1985. Pieces of a puzzle I've been working on for years appear in my mind. I need to talk to Everett. Your daddy probably wiped them out as his first order of business, Nisa says blithely. Exodus 2218. We shall not suffer a witch to live. I tense. Nisa is as close to a friend as I have in this town, so sometimes I forget she's a devout Christian, the first in church every Sunday. Many terrible things done in the name of God, she adds, still scanning the book, and I relax. Anything in here about what the symbol means? I clutch modern Wicca. People are guessing it calls forth the low man. Do you think they're right? Legend says the low man was trapped in the swamp by men who practiced spiritual magics now long forgotten. Could that refer to La Culte de la Lune? Is the low man myth rooted in actual history? Nisa scoffs. This town... For such God-fearing folk, it shocks me what nonsense captures them. I don't know what the symbols mean, other than it clearly comes from Le Culte de la Lune, according to that picture. I'm going to put in a request to my friends at LSU. Relief floods me. If the carvings and Fred's murder are related, there's no evidence they are, but still, the more information I have, the better. Don't forget our other question, I reminded her. She blinks at me. I clear my throat, pushing away thoughts of ever. If Le Culte de la Lune still exists, who are they, and why are they carving these symbols all of a sudden? Nisa is practically buzzing. I'll do an internet deep dive, but if the answers aren't there, I bet they're in LSU's Louisiana Heritage Archive. They have materials on old languages and symbology. I'll comb through old newspapers, I offer. Bottom Springs used to have its own, the Bugle, and we have copies on microfilm. Maybe something about La Culte de la Lune has cropped up before. Nisa rubs her hands together so fast she's liable to start a fire. Look at us, the librarian dream team, 
The sheriff asked for all hands on deck, and boy, are we giving it to him. Though I'm halfway to standing, I freeze. You're planning to show the sheriff what we find? She stacks our history books. Someone's got to help. You know, some people are going around whispering Fred was murdered by the low man. If we can show this town how useful libraries can be, maybe people will actually start coming in. Plus, don't you want to help solve a crime? We'll be like CSI, Bottom Springs. Nisa chuckles to herself. I don't think the sheriff... I start to say, but the sound of the front door scraping open and Nisa's look of surprise stop me. Well, I'll be, she calls. If it isn't the man himself, I think we must have conjured you. Stomach dropping, I turn to see Sheriff Tyrio tugging his belt higher on his hips as he makes his way to us. Well, ain't that a coincidence, Mrs. Goodry? The sheriff gives her a smile, but his eyes flick to me. With every step he takes toward the circulation desk, I can feel the old demon trying to take over, making my heart pound, air hard to come by. The library is supposed to be my sanctuary, hollowed ground. It feels wrong for the sheriff to step foot in here. The skull isn't Renard's, I remind myself. You aren't guilty. Sheriff Tyrio tips his hat. Morning, Ruth. Barry says the Duncan boy's in town. I tell you what, must be nice to have a visitor. Yes, I can barely hear the word over the blood pounding in my ears. The sheriff turns to Nisa with an apologetic smile. Do you mind if I talk to Ruth alone? Shouldn't take more than a few minutes. Of course, Nisa says, almost tripping over herself to pick up our books and scoot away. Before she leaves, she gives me a warning look I easily interpret. Don't you spill the beans about Le Coult de la Lune and steal my glory. Once Nisa is tucked safely in the back office, I'm alone with the sheriff. He leans casually against the circulation desk. You can go ahead and retake your seat. Only then do I realize I'm half standing. I drop obediently into the chair. How can I help you, Sheriff? I'm sure you've heard the remains pulled out of Starry Swamp belong to Fred Fortnot. Yes, sir. It's difficult to keep eye contact, but I force myself. The Sheriff has a thick mustache the same mud brown as his shirt, and I allow my eyes to rest there. Terrible. Tragic. He agrees. You were close to the Fortnots, weren't you? Being neighbors and all. I shift uncomfortably. His unblinking eyes feel like a spotlight. I wouldn't say close, but we were neighbors. Have you told Mrs. Fortnot and Beth the news? He clears his throat. We're still working on tracking them down, actually. Any idea where they are? I shake my head. Even if I knew, I wouldn't say. I owe those women that much. He sighs. Well, that makes your insight even more critical. Let me ask you, Ruth. In all your years living next door to the Fort Knotts, did you ever see anything unusual? Unusual? Like Fred Fortnot choking out his daughter on the kitchen floor? Anyone coming by and making threatening remarks? A stranger lurking, maybe? Someone you didn't recognize from church? He squints at me. Do you recall anything suspicious? Even if it happened a while ago, I'd like to know. Have you talked to my parents? His gaze slips away. I'm asking you. There's something about the way he won't meet my eyes. Why, out of all the leads, he could be chasing all the people he could be talking to, men who were actually close to Fred. Is Sheriff Tyrio talking to me? I'm sorry, Sheriff. I speak as calmly as I can. I can't recall anything out of the ordinary. Ruth, I need you to think real hard. He folds his arms over his chest and frowns. Are you sure you can't think of anyone who might have wanted to hurt Fred? Anyone who bore him ill will? Not a single person. Let me remind you, now is not the time to protect anyone. No, sir, I say smoothly. And this time it isn't a lie. I don't know a single person. I know so many. 11. June. 18 years old. It was the brightest, clearest day of summer, so naturally Everett and I were spending it reading. Pass the lemonade, 
he asked without taking his eyes off his book. He lay splayed next to me on the dock in red swimsuit trunks and a faded T-shirt, one arm behind his head. He was reading a book of poems by Frank O'Hara, who ever said was cool, ironic, and playful, attributes that were hard to come by around here. There was nothing ever liked better than poetry. I brought him volume after volume from the library, but couldn't keep up with his appetite. The sun was high in the sky, baking us both. Sweat had gathered in small lakes under my knees, and I could see small drops glistening on Ever's forehead. The air was thick with brine from the gulf water. This was our favorite spot to sunbathe, an old abandoned dock in an inlet that rarely saw visitors, far from Main Street and the bustling docks of the Fort Knott Fishing Company. I was lush and spoiled off a full year of Everett's friendship. We were together through all seasons, but our best in summer, our most alive when spring growth turned overripe, dizzy, and fecund, when the air burst with so much hot, sticky life that you knew it was unsustainable, and fall would have to come and temper it soon. But for now, the days were long, sunlight bleeding into late hours, and when it finally vanished, we had our new world in the dark. I rolled my eyes at Everett's request, even as I set down my book and leaned to pick up the jug of lemonade from my house. The ice-cold condensation spilled down the sides and dripped onto my dress, the coolness a relief against my toasted skin. Suddenly, you're not capable of walking three feet? Ever shrugged. You're closer. He took the jug with both hands and tipped his head back, pouring lemonade straight into his mouth. For a moment, I was arrested by the sight of his Adam's apple moving in his throat, his pale skin somehow unaffected by the sun, the way the curve of his neck swooped into his shoulders, which were broader this year, and his biceps more pronounced. Then I shook myself and smacked him on the arm. Animal? You're not supposed to drink straight from the jug. He set it down and wiped his mouth at the back of his hand. How else am I supposed to drink it? I twisted to the plastic cups I'd stolen from my parents' kitchen and thrust one at him. With these? Oh, oops. Ever's grin, if anything, grew brighter. What's this about, anyway? He grabbed for the book I was reading, but I was faster, snatching it away. He cocked his head. Leviathan by Thomas Hobbes. It's famous. They're reading it in Intro to Political Philosophy at LSU. I looked it up on the computer at the library. He scratched his head. You do remember we graduated last year, right? There's no need to assign yourself homework? I stretched out on my side, facing him. Actually, I had an idea. Since I can't go to college, I'm bringing college to me. Classes are mostly reading, right? Well, I have a whole library full of books. All I have to do is look up the syllabi and read along. I'm calling it my independent study. I beamed at him. He gave me a doubtful look. It'll work. Watch. I opened Leviathan. Hobbes says humans are selfish brutes by nature. Back in the day, when we didn't want people to keep going around killing each other, we had to agree to certain rules. That's why we have kings. We agree to obey the king's rules, and in return, he protects us. It's called a social contract. Any thoughts? Ever didn't say anything. He just kept looking at me in that disapproving way. I shielded my eyes against the sun. What? I need a political science credit for my English degree. You should have left when we graduated and never looked back. I flinched. When he'd said this to me a year ago, it had been a balm. Now it stung. You know that wasn't an option. I nudged him with my toe. Besides, look at us. I'm working at the library and can read whatever I want, and you're going to have enough money from the garage to get your own place soon. No more torture at sacred surrender. My parents had even stopped trying to punish me for being friends with Everett. Satisfied, I guessed, with the bigger win of keeping me home. I threw my arms out at the clear sky and the blue-green gulf. I know this isn't what we always hoped for, but it's not bad, right? Couldn't you be happy? One day, as soon as he saved enough money, 
ever wouldn't need his father or the garage and despite our vows to never abandon each other i was afraid the pull of freedom would be too strong to resist ever looked at me a beat too long my stomach dropped then he said softly i could good i swallowed my relief his eyes shifted over my shoulder and he lunged around me before i had time to react you might be an adult now he whooped snatching the copy of twilight i'd brought but some things never change hey i shouted but ever leapt to his feet i scrambled to mine snatching at the book he held just out of reach if you drop that in the water i will never forgive you philosophy and a vampire romance everett laughed you're a weird one ruth cornier i leapt unsuccessfully for the book again cursing myself for growing comfortable enough with everett to tell him about twilight ruth and her one true love edward cullen the only man who will ever possess her heart the look on everett's face was so wicked i could think of nothing to do except pull my dress over my head and toss it on the dock ever froze at the sight of me in my bathing suit the first two-piece i'd ever owned purchased secretly with my library money yellow with tiny white daisies i held out my hand wordlessly everett gave me the book thank you i said primly now take off your shirt he blinked in the year we'd been friends even when we went swimming he'd never taken off his shirt i didn't know why or what had gotten into me to ask him after a moment of charged silence ever grabbed his collar and pulled his shirt over his head there was nothing to do but look his chest was moonlight pale which i'd expected and carved with muscle which i hadn't my gaze snagged on the scars a handful of jagged lines across his stomach and a quarter-sized circle over his heart the ugly red of old burnt skin what are those from i asked but everett made a scoffing sound you know you didn't have to get naked just to shut me up that wicked grin revealing his sharp canines a smile he only showed me split his face it was a provocation a distraction and it worked i pressed both palms to everett's chest and relishing his shock pushed him into the water then i set twilight safely on my towel and took a running leap shrieking as i jumped in after him the gulf water sucked me down warm and salty until the air in my lungs tugged me back up i broke the surface laughing and whipped around looking for ever ever wasn't there twelve june eighteen years old i scanned the dock no ever there or on the shore he should have surfaced by now a fist squeezed my heart i tried to see through the waves before they lifted me but it was there under the surface in a patch of darker cooler water a flash of pale skin i dove without hesitation swimming until my hand struck his shoulder lungs straining i dragged him to the surface gasping for air everett's head lolled and i choked back a sob i'd done this to him taken him by surprise normally everett was a strong swimmer but he hadn't been ready i'd been too happy and now god was striking at me using all my strength i kicked us to the shore and hauled him onto the coarse sand dark as brown sugar the waves lapped our feet as i bent over him breathing hard and pressed two fingers to his throat no pulse i listened for his breath nothing he looked fragile and beautiful still as death there was no time to panic i pressed my palms to everett's chest and pumped tilted his face back pressed my lips to his and gave him my air again pump 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 hands holding his jaw lips to his blowing beneath me everett's eyes opened his mouth stretched into a grin hello ruth he set against my lips and brushed a wet strand of hair from my cheek i froze over him uncomprehending he started to laugh everett duncan how dare you i'd given him all my breath so i couldn't even yell as loudly as he deserved 
He was winded too, wheezing with laughter. That is the cruelest joke anyone has ever played on me. I shoved his shoulders and rolled off him, collapsing on my back in the sand, nearly crying at the storm of anger and relief. Oh, don't be mad. Lithe as ever, Everett rolled on top of me, bracing his hands on either side of my head. I'm sorry. I said nothing. He dipped his head lower, trying to catch my gaze, his black hair dripping salt water. I jerked my face to the side. You weren't breathing, I said to the waves. You didn't have a pulse. His voice gentled. I'm sorry, Ruth, okay? It was a joke. He leaned in so his lips were near my ear. Don't be mad. I twisted my head even farther away, the sand biting into my cheek. He'd nearly given me a heart attack. Don't be mad, he repeated, squeezing my shoulders. I felt the slightest pressure of teeth against my skin and whipped my head to look. Everett was biting my bicep. My mouth dropped open. Wordlessly, his hands grazed down my arms to my elbows. He gripped them, then gently bit my wrist. I didn't say anything, and his hands slid to my hips. His mouth hovered over my stomach, right below my belly button. I took a deep breath. Don't be mad, he whispered. I could feel the words in the air he exhaled. His thumbs rubbed my hip bones, caught and tangled in the bow ties of my bathing suit. I watched him, transfixed, ever looked up at me through his lashes. Slowly, he lowered his mouth and bit me very, very gently, canines pressing into skin. I lay still. If I moved, even blinked, I felt sure I'd disrupt whatever was happening, this glimpse of the surreal. Ever's mouth was warm on my cold stomach. I could feel the points of his teeth push deeper into my skin, once, then twice, then the swipe of his tongue. He lifted his head and rolled off me, falling to his back in the sand. He was breathing fast. We lay there side by side, my eyes wide and unblinking. Finally, he turned to face me. His wet hair fell sideways over his forehead, his eyes darker than the water I'd rescued him from. Like your vampire, he said softly. You, I whispered, are the strangest person I've ever met. He leaned closer. That's why you should leave Bottom Springs. Go meet some stranger people to put me in perspective. Above us, a flock of gulls swooped low, wings dipping to ride the wind. I think the only way I'll make it out of here is if I wake up one day as a bird. A drop of water slid across his forehead and fell into his lashes. He blinked it away. A scarlet Ruth bird. If I was a bird, what would you be? Whatever hawk eats birds? A laugh burst from me. What? He grinned. After the water and the sun, his lips were watermelon red. To keep the other birds away, I shook my head. He bit his lip, which I knew meant he was going to say something silly. Having a lemonade with you is even more fun than going to San Sebastian. You've lost me. Where's San Sebastian? I don't know, actually. It's a line from a Frank O'Hara poem. He wrote about lemonade? I'd pictured Frank O'Hara as a New Yorker in a black beret. I guess he really is playful. A small, secret smile curved Everett's mouth. His hand came to rest on top of mine in the sand. Gone were the days he shied from contact. Now I could always count on him to find some way to touch me. In the warm Louisiana four o'clock light, he recited, we are drifting back and forth between each other. I rolled my eyes. Now I know you're making this stuff up. There's no way Frank O'Hara wrote about Louisiana. But still, drifting between each other, that was exactly how it felt with him on the best of days. Like today, the look in Ever's eyes turned weighted. I look at you, and I would rather... Shuffling footsteps, the sound of someone traveling fast across the sand, made Ever and me startle apart. I scrambled to my feet. He followed suit, only slower. My heart pounded. 
Who could it be? No one ever came out here. The man came into sight, squinting. Ruth, is that you? Fred Fortnot stopped in his tracks. A red flush climbed his neck. He was dressed for Bowden in long sleeves and deck boots, a black duffel bag slung over a shoulder. His eyes flicked to Everett and his whole demeanor changed, like a curtain fallen. His open mouth snapped shut, eyes narrowing. Mr. Fortnot, I tried to push down my nervousness. Whenever I was around Fred, I felt like he'd caught me at something. And now, horror of horrors, he had. For a fleeting moment, I wished for one of those hospital pills that made me numb. The ones I lied to my mother about, pretending to swallow every day, and lied to Everett about, pretending I always spit them out. What are you doing here? What am I doing here? Fred's eyes flicked between me and Ever, and suddenly I realized the picture we made. Our disheveled hair, the sand pressed into our skin, my two-piece suit. Fred's face flamed red. Ruth Cornier, of all the girls. He thrust a finger at me. Was it you who taught Beth how to be a whore? The shock and shame were knee-jerk, immediate and lancing. Tears sprang to my eyes. Hey, Everett snarled and lurched forward. I grabbed his shoulders to hold him back. Apologize to Ruth and walk away. His voice was nearly shaking. He radiated an intensity beyond any I'd witnessed, even that day in the swamp. Hatred, sure as the day was long. Don't act like you have authority over me. Fred's hard eyes glinted. Look at you, your father's spitting image, seducing poor girls who don't know any better, a rotten apple from a rotten tree. Anger burned bright in Ever's eyes. Where are you going, Fred? He jerked his thumb. The Fort Knot fishing docks are that way. The way he said it was like a veiled threat. Fred's expression slackened. He and Ever stared at each other for a long, charged moment. Then Fred turned to me. You should be at home where your daddy can watch you. I'm 18, I whispered, scared even of this small rebellion. His eyes roamed my body. The shame was so hot I wanted to carve off my skin wherever he looked, so much exposed in my first bikini. You may be grown, girl, but you'll always belong to your daddy. Motorcycles roared from the highway, followed by the gunshot sound of an engine backfiring. Fred tensed, head cutting in the direction of the sound. When he turned back to us, he hitched his duffel higher and thrust a finger at me. Stay away from him. Mark my words. He's unnatural. Fred turned his back on us and stalked all the way to the bend in the shore, where he disappeared. His words hung in the air. Do you think he's going to a dock on the other side of the inlet? I forced my voice to come out light. It's strange, right? I thought his personal dock was next to the company's. Everett didn't respond. His eyes were fixed on where Fred had disappeared. I hate him, I said. Sometimes I think he's right. Ever's voice was hollow. I am unnatural. I frowned. Normally, Ever was impenetrable, shielded by a suit of armor no one, not the kids at school or our teachers or his dad, could crack. His imperviousness to Bottom Springs was a force I depended on. That's ridiculous. You know you can't take anything Fred says seriously. He's awful. Ever's eyes cut to me. Is it still happening? With Beth? Worse. I'd been keeping the secret out of respect to Beth but I felt compelled to share with Ever now, shake him out of this strange mood. She's pregnant. What? For once, I'd managed to shock him. How old is she now? Seventeen. She won't tell anyone who the father is, no matter what Fred or my dad threaten. I heard my parents talking. They think she's protecting some boy she's in love with from school. What's going to happen to her? I was almost afraid to say it. They're making her get an abortion. Everett's eyes grew hard. I thought that was an unforgivable sin. Fred told my parents if she has the baby, the whole town will shun them. It would hurt the company and the church. He should be shunned. 
My father said Fred's too important. It would be better if no one knew. It had been a shock to hear. To my surprise, Everett tipped back his head and laughed. It was almost a cackle, thin and edged with something sharp. You're freaking me out. The hypocrisy. He shook his head, smile lingering. I guess when you're in charge, you don't have to play by the rules. They're God's rules. Sure, Ruth. His expression grew pensive. Do you think one of Fred's friends got Beth pregnant? Or Fred himself? And that's why she won't tell? My mouth dropped open. That's disgusting. Seriously, where is your mind right now? Ever looked at me for long enough that I began to feel uncomfortable. Just as I was about to do something, shake his shoulders, walk away, and leave him in the sand, he spoke. His voice was strangely gentle. You'd be surprised how sadistic people are when they know they can get away with it. Whoever the father is, he continued, he might be furious Fred's forcing Beth to get rid of the baby. Maybe it's one of the Fort Knott fishermen. That was so scandalous it made me wince to say it, but Ever had all but called me naive. He nodded, taking the idea seriously. The way Fred's been underpaying them and cutting their hours... Gerald Terrio and his guys are already raising hell. Wouldn't surprise me if one of them seduced Beth just to spite him. Where do you hear this stuff? Ever shrugged. The garage or the bar when I pick up my dad. Trust me, you'll learn everything you never wanted to know once those guys put down a few whiskeys. My mind raced. I didn't realize so many people hated Fred. Why don't they just run away? Ever asked abruptly. What? Who? Mrs. Fortnot and Beth. Why don't they run away or kill him in his sleep and be done with it? I stood rooted in the sand. Please tell me that's gallows humor. Because they'd go to hell ever. Because it's evil. He gave me a pointed look. Not always. Yes, always. That was the law of God, written in stone and carried down from the mountain. And the law of man, the Almighty, and the courts weaven together to form an iron-clad prohibition, a cage to stay our brutish hands. Ever and I had broken it, and one day, whether by man or God, we would be punished. I don't understand where all of this is coming from. Why is Fred making you spin out? There was a moment of fraught silence. Then Ever put his hands over his face and sank into the sand. Ruth, I need to tell you something. There's this feeling I get, these thoughts eating at me. I can't tell if they're right or wrong, crazy or natural, but I can't get rid of them. It was surreal to see Everett like this, vulnerable, armor fallen off. I did the only thing I could think of, which was help him put it back on. Hey, I crouched. There's a voice in my head, too. He didn't move his hands. There is? Do you know what communion is? Sort of. You kneel in front of the pastor and drink grape juice and eat a wafer. It's supposed to represent the blood and body of Christ. How vampiric. Yeah, well, when I was young, it was my least favorite part of church. You had to kneel in front of my father while the whole church watched and repeat his words back so everyone could hear. When it was my turn, I was always so nervous, all I could do was whisper. No matter how frustrated my dad got, I couldn't raise my voice. His demands escalating in volume until they were thunder. This is my body. Take it. This is my blood. Drink it. Sometimes... When I have a hard decision to make, I hear myself whispering the rights. You will be saved. You must be good. Be good and spared the lake of fire. I don't know what it means that I'm still whispering it even in my own head. But it calms me. I squinted against the sunlight. Ever's long, elegant fingers still hadn't dropped from his face. You think I'm crazy? No. He cleared his throat. It's just... The voice in my head, Ruth? He took a deep breath. It doesn't whisper to be good. I let his words wash over me. Like the small waves here at the shore, 
I sensed they were only a glimpse of what lay out past where I could see, in the dark, unfathomable abyss. So I made a decision. I peeled Everett's hands off his face. He watched me warily. Everett Duncan, you will never say a thing like that again. Not to me or anyone. Do you hear me? I pressed my fingers to his bare chest, over his scar, his heart, and pretended to turn a key. Never. Thirteen. Now. When I leave the library for lunch and spot Sheriff Terrio through the window at the Rosethorn Cafe, laughing with his nephew Gerald and Gerald's fishing crew, I finally realize what I have to do. Standing there rooted to the sidewalk, my brown bag lunch clenched in my hand, watching the sheriff slap Gerald on the shoulder over some joke, the understanding crystallizes. I need to know who killed Fred, for my protection and for Everett's, and I cannot trust the sheriff to find out. Not good old boy Tom Terrio, chumming it up over there with his nephew, the same man who got his promotion to captain only after Fred's death, or Gerald's crew who Everett once said had been planning a mutiny while Fred was still alive. All that motive sitting there at the table, and the sheriff's questioning me. I'd suspected it before, but now I know. I can't trust the sheriff, or Gerald, or frankly anyone in this town. I understand them too well. Absent the true culprit, I know where their eyes will turn, looking for a scapegoat. Same place they've always turned and that's a problem. Once again, I must cultivate a small rebellion, provide a corrective measure, but this time it's not illicit books or an independent study or a dark mission at the stroke of midnight. This time, I must find a murderer, and I know exactly where to start, a place the sheriff and his deputies would never think to look. Of all the people in this town, perhaps none are more invisible than the Fort Knot fishing wives. Women know not even by their names, but by their husbands. They live in a neighborhood far from the grand lanes of my parents. Their modest houses are pressed close together. Easier, I suppose, when you need to bring your children over to a neighbor's to be watched, or borrow a cup of sugar or commiserate over the absence of your husbands, away to the sea once more. Since I've been as guilty as anyone of overlooking them, I'm surprised when I drive through their neighborhood after work and find it bustling, tree houses and rope swings full of children, shaded porches lined with women in rocking chairs calling to each other as they watch their lawns. And now, sitting at Julie Broussard's kitchen table with a steaming cup of coffee and a thick slice of hummingbird cake, I'm even more surprised by the many sets of curious eyes looking back at me. Between the time I pulled up outside Julie's house and when she settled me here in her kitchen, fussing over whether I took sugar and cream, three other women materialized, presumably pulled off nearby porches by the novelty of my visit. It may be the most attention my presence has ever warranted. I wonder for a brief moment if Everett, who always knew things I didn't, could have told me secrets about the Fortnight Fish and Wives that would have helped me unlock them. I chose not to be lying to his house after work like originally planned because I was certain he wouldn't approve of me sticking my nose in this investigation. I can almost hear him. Ruth, what are you thinking? He doesn't seem to understand that our necks aren't off the chopping block yet. So, absent his intel, my fellow women from the margins and I are forced to sit crammed around this table, blinking at one another not knowing where to start. Julie finishes pouring the last cup of coffee and settles at the head of the table. She and her husband, Noah Broussard, have attended Holy Fire for long enough that my father recently rewarded Noah with an usher position, which is how I know of them. Miss Ruth, she says uncertainly, pardon my asking, because of course it's an honor to have a visit from the Reverend's daughter, but what can I do for you? Julie's my age, maybe a year older, so I bristle at the deference in her voice, the way her cheeks flush pink as she talks. There are toys belonging to a young child strewn all over the house, and her gaze keeps flicking to them. 
The other fish and wives stare at me raptly, waiting. Thank you for having me, Mrs. Broussard. I finger the warm edge of my mug. The intensity of their looking throws me until I decide that for this visit, I'll pretend I'm Jane Austen's young heiress, Emma Woodhouse, a woman at ease wherever she goes. I take a deep breath. I'm sure you all have heard about Fred Fortnot. Four sets of eyes around the table grow wider. Course we have, says one of the wives, who looks to be roughly six months pregnant. Her hair is braided neatly, but she has dark circles under her eyes. It's all anyone's talking about. She blushes. Sorry, I'm Laney. Seen you at church, of course. I, we always sit in the back on account of the kids. Right, I say, folding my hands together. I came to ask about Fred. Some unresolved questions I was hoping you all could help with. My words cause an immediate charge of interest, legible in the way the women's backs straighten. No one ever asks us nothing, another woman says. She's so fair, she's almost pale as Everett. The other women nod eagerly, and I stifle a sigh of relief. I prepared myself for resistance. A closing of the ranks, since I'm a Fortnot Fishing Company outsider. But it seems the rareness of being consulted is enough to lure these women in. Well, that's a shame, I say. I'm sure you have plenty to offer. Their faces open like books. I can read their curiosity, their hunger to talk. It's kind of a delicate subject. I drop my eyes to the hummingbird cake all those creamy layers studded with nuts, and think back to Everett's speculation from years ago that whoever got Beth Fortnot pregnant might have been in love with her and furious at Fred for making her give up their baby. Or, in a less romantic theory, maybe Fred finally discovered the father's identity and held the knowledge over his head like a cudgel. Either way, those are two compelling possible motives. Tenuous, yes. But like this cake before me, the possible reasons for Fred's killing are many layered, and I don't trust the sheriff to attend to all of them. I know the men who work at the company spend a lot of time together off the boats, and y'all have a close community. You probably know a lot about what the company men get up to in their off time. So far, they haven't contradicted me, so I swallow. Do any of you remember if Fred's daughter Beth was involved with the company man? Laney, the pregnant one, gasps. Beth and one of the fishing boys? I scour their faces. Each woman looks scandalized. I take it you never saw her around? Julie shakes her head. If she had shown up, even at one of the barbecues Kobe and her husband like to throw, which are usually pretty open, she pauses to nod at the brown-skinned woman sitting nearest me around the table, whose face is sharp-boned and delicate. She would have been shooed away. You don't mess with the boss's kid. I never even talked to Beth, Kobe says in a surprisingly husky voice. I only knew her from church. So you never... I take a breath. This is probably immoral, what I'm doing, but I badly need to know the truth heard about Beth getting pregnant. The women reel back. Pregnant Laney's mouth actually drops open. Never, Julie says, forceful like she's swearing on a Bible. I wouldn't even believe you, except you're the reverend's daughter. Kobe shifts in her seat, making the wooden back of her chair squeak. Is that why Beth and Mrs. Fortnot took off right after Fred went missing? We always wondered why they didn't come to his memorial. It was like he went missing, then they did. We thought it seemed so disrespectful. But maybe they were ashamed. No, it happened years before Fred went missing. I'd been 18 when I heard Beth was pregnant, and 20 when Fred disappeared. Two years for the mysterious father to stew in hatred, maybe. But something Kobe said stood out. It was like he went missing, then they did. It was also two years for Beth to stew. I used to think I knew why she and her mother had fled as soon as they were free of Fred, but maybe there was more to it. It wouldn't have been one of the company boys who got her pregnant, says the pale woman. Her tone is absolute. Messing with the boss's daughter would have meant an automatic firing, 
No one would risk their job like that. Hard to find good work these days. I tapped the end of my fork uneasily. Did any of you know anything about the Fortnot family? Like, behind closed doors, how they were? The women shake their heads. Fred was the big boss, Julie explains, and he acted like it, kept his family life private, didn't invite us over to his house or treat us like peers or nothing. Beth and his wife didn't even acknowledge us at church. Like we were beneath them, the pale woman says. Betty Lee's son Gentry is around Beth's age, Laney glances at the other women. He said Beth didn't even talk to any of the company kids at school. That matched what I remember. Beth always had her sight set higher. So these women never saw Beth hanging around any of the fishermen, and they didn't even know anything was amiss with the Fort Knott family. I held in a sigh. This has been a dead end. Julie must sense my disappointment because she says, Sorry, we aren't much help. It's okay. I rise from the table. I should get going, though. I'm expected at my parents for Bible study. Julie leaps out of her chair. Let me cut some cake to take with you. Oh, please, don't go to any trouble. My mother will have... I insist. Julie is already cutting. It would be an honor to feed the reverend. I look down at Laney, Kobe, and the pale woman, who were still watching me with interest. On a bold whim, I ask, Have things gotten better at Fort Knott Fishing since Fred's death? The question takes them aback. Better? Laney frowns. I remember a few years back hearing complaints about extra shifts and not enough pay to make up for it. Laney still looks confused, but Kobe nods. I know what you're talking about. That was mostly Gerald Terrio and his crew complaining. She cuts a look at the other women. Remember how they were going on and on about having to do all this side work and not getting paid for it? Oh, right, Laney says. How could I forget? Gerald made a big stink. I think it resolved itself when Fred disappeared, the pale woman adds. Julie slides a Tupperware full of cake onto the kitchen table, wiping her hands on her skirt. Gerald basically runs things now, so I guess that means no more side work. Side work, Julie shrugs. None of our husbands are in Gerald's crew. Whatever overtime Fred was making them do, our husbands weren't involved. Laney snorts. You know what I heard from Betty Lee? She looks at me. Betty Lee's husband, Jimmy, is in Gerald's crew. She said sometimes Jimmy didn't even fish. He'd go out on the boat for hours and wouldn't bring anything back. What? Yeah, that's right. Laney twists the end of her long braid. One time, Jimmy mentioned going all the way to Mississippi to drop something off. Oh, not this again, Kobe sighs. I thought you were done with that foolishness. Done with what? I ask. There's a thick, gossipy charge to the air, sweet and dense like molasses. I know it's unchristian to speak ill of the dead. Laney starts, and the pale woman rolls her eyes. Oh, Lord, here we go. Laney's undeterred. But we were convinced Fred was running a side business selling illegal fish on the black market. We... Julie scoffs. Try I? There's lots of critters in the Gulf you're not allowed to touch because they're endangered and the like, but people will pay a high price for them. Kobe snorts. What? Laney protests. Why else would Jimmy be told not to look at the boxes? Boxes? I glance between them. Is that a normal thing for fishing boats to carry? Kobe shrugs. Not when they're fishing, no. But don't listen to Laney. She's got too much time on her hands and watches too many of those law and order shows. She snickers. An illegal fishing ring. Y'all are simple-minded, Laney sniffs. There's a secret dock in everything. There is? Where? I know immediately I've crossed a line, sounded too sharp, too interested. The women's good-humored smiles disappear. I don't know. Laney says, cutting a glance at Julie. It was just a rumor, probably nonsense, like everyone's saying. I think of the day Fred stumbled on Everett and me at our secret spot in the inlet, dressed for boating. How cruel and biting he'd been, like a man with something to hide. 
excitement sizzles in my gut. Well, I really do have to get going. I tuck in my chair and head off in the direction of the door. Miss Ruth, Julie calls and I freeze, feeling caught. But she only holds up the Tupperware. Don't forget this. Of course, I say, and double back for it. My parents will be touched. Tell your daddy we loved his sermon on Sunday, the pale woman adds shyly. Especially that passage from Psalms, the meek shall inherit the earth. Felt that in my heart. I give her a tight smile. The meek shall inherit something. If I have my way, it will be all of Fred Fortnot's secrets. I haven't been back to our dock in over a year, not since the summer ever it didn't show. The place is unchanged, like a slice of time preserved in amber. It's twilight when I make it over from Julie Broussard's house, the hummingbird cake tossed on my passenger's seat. Twilight's the most beautiful time to be anywhere in Bottom Springs, but especially near the sea. Out past the tall grass and sand and old docks slowly crumbling into the water, the orange sun sinks into the horizon, lighten the waves like God revealing the path to heaven. I give our old dock a wistful glance as I walk past it, tracing Fred's path from that long-ago day. It's not until long after I followed the bend in the shoreline that I see it, nearly hidden by a shroud of tall pompous grass, a boat tied to a dock, and two men I don't recognize carrying cardboard boxes. Heart skipping, I drop gracelessly to the sand, praying the long stems will be enough to obscure me. The men's work is monotonous. They emerge out of the grass, coming from the distant parking lot, I assume, holding a stack of two boxes each, which means they must be fairly light. They trek down the wide, sandy shore and onto the dock, which is in better shape than ever it's in mine, more recently repaired. Finally, they disappear onto the boat. As I watch, twilight turns to night, and suddenly I can barely see my hands in front of me, let alone the men. Luckily, they quickly flick on flashlights like they're used to this. I don't know what I was expecting, but I'm deflated by how innocuous this looks, how little I can glean from their methodical motions. Maybe the trick is to get closer. I wait until both men retreat into the grass and take off, kicking up sand as I streak across the shore. The wooden planks of the dock give under my feet with creaking sounds that make me wince. I have a minute tops before the men will return with new stacks of boxes. As I edge along the boat, the clouds shift. Moonlight illuminates the white paint, making it glow against the pitch-black waves slapping the hole. And there, faintly, are traces of an old logo someone has taken pains to sand off. If I didn't know the image so well, my mind might not have made sense of the faint Fs wrapped around three sharp spears of a trident. But I do know it the sign of the Fort Knott Fishing Company, which means Laney was right. The company is doing something outside official channels, literally in the dark. What was Fred up to? And did it get him killed? I need to know what's inside those boxes. Silently cursing myself for the spectacularly bad idea, I place two hands on the railing of the boat and use all my strength to heft myself up and over the side, tumbling onto the dark floor with the grunt I immediately regret. I need to make my search lightning fast. I stagger to my feet and feel my way around with one hand flat against the wall. I can't see anything and halfway hope I'll walk into a wall of boxes, but there's nothing. They must be hiding them inside the boat. Of course, if they don't want people to see... That would be smartest. The boat lifts and falls, buoyed by waves, and I try to keep my balance as I search for an entrance to the inside. A door, hallway, hatch. My hand collides with the metal handle and I clutch my fingers, silently screaming at the pain. The door has announced itself. As I reach for it, two glimmers of light catch my attention. I turn, on the shore, Twin orbs bob in the dark. Flashlights. The dock groans under the men's feet. I was too focused and didn't notice them emerge out of the grass. 
Now they're practically at the boat, at my back. How will I escape? You hear something? Asks a rough voice with a thick northern accent. I almost jump at how close it is, then inch back slowly, shoulders sliding against the boat, heart thundering so violently I worry they'll hear it. Just the waves, says a second voice, colder. Sea's getting a little rough. He sniggers. Can't take a country boy out on the water, I see. It was a footstep, the first insists, and I hear the horrifying sound of his feet landing on the floor of the boat. Thump. My back hits a cold metal railing. I press one hand to my mouth and the other to my chest, as if to hold my heart still. Paranoid, says the cold man. Another thump sounds as he lands in the boat. Fuck you, I'm looking. The clouds have passed back over the moon, snuffing out the light. Behind me, it's so dark, I can't see where the sky meets the water. Can only hear the waves. A half second of pregnant silence as they lift, then the clap as they crash against boat. Shoes scuff around the corner as the man who consents me begins inspecting. There's no more time for paralyzing panic. I can't let them find me. There's only one way out. I take a big gulp of air, hitch a leg over the railing, and let go. I fall for longer than expected through the pitch black air, and in my disorientation, I think somehow I'm soaring up instead of hurtling down. It makes the gut punch of the waves an even greater shock, and I'm so surprised by the sudden salty cold that I nearly gasp, releasing the air in my lungs. The inky sky is replaced by the inky water, and now I truly cannot tell which way is up or down, if I'm sinking to the ocean floor or floating to the moon, on my way to heaven or hell, if there is even any difference between them after all. 14. Now. In the past few days, I've been a woman who has lied to authorities, who has hardened her resolve into a diamond in her chest, who has thrown herself into the sea, who has crawled, gasping, across the wet sand of the inlet's farthest shore, and now, one day later, I'm a woman getting served breadsticks and barefoot wine in Bottom Springs' best attempt at an Italian restaurant, which is also the only restaurant in town. She'll have a glass of the bubbles, Barry tells the waitress, an older woman named Joe who used to babysit me. It's okay, I murmur, catching Joe's eye. I don't really drink. Actually, why don't you leave the whole bottle? Barry beams at Joe, exuding the easy confidence that's always fascinated me. It's going to be a night to celebrate. Unsurprisingly, Joe sides with Barry. She leaves the bottle on my side of the table. It sweats like a person facing the barrel of a gun. So far, Barry has spent tonight trying valiantly to win my attention, picking me up outside my house in his immaculate Ford F-150, opening doors and sliding out chairs, even taking the single red rose out of the vase on the table and sticking it behind my ear, like a regular Casanova. He looked so pleased with himself, I didn't even make a face when the thorn caught my skin. Unfortunately for Barry, mentally I'm in two places, and neither are here. The first is the pitch-black water of the gulf, which haunts me, and the second is Ever's house, where I desperately need to be, but Everett has disappeared. Last night I drove to his house soaking wet all the way from the inlet, in a frenzy to tell him about the boxes and the fishing boat, willing to take whatever rebuke he gave me for investigating. But Ever wasn't there. Not him or his car. Imagining he'd left me yet again, I'd slid down the side of his house, feeling the beginnings of panic. Then I saw the note taped to his front door, barely visible in the dark. It said simply, R, I'll be back. I'd leaned my head against his house and laughed until there were tears in my eyes. A note on the door. Not a carrier pigeon, but close. I still don't know wherever it's gone or when he'll be back. What I do know is that if Barry hadn't nearly melted down when I suggested we reschedule dinner, 
I'd be at Ever's house now, waitin'. Don't you love Rosethorn's breadsticks? Barry talks as he chews. Best in Louisiana, guaranteed. Don't even need to leave town. They're good. I agree, mentally making a list of things that could be in those cardboard boxes. Barry brushes his thick brown hair over his forehead. He's worn his hair long and swooped to the side since high school. I can still picture him on the football field taking off his helmet, his hair damp with sweat, but otherwise perfectly intact, as he grinned at all the cheering people in the stands. Let's toast, he says, holding his champagne flute. The expectation in his eyes finally captures my attention. I realize Barry's tapping his foot at high speed under the table. Okay, I lift my glass. What to? To us, he says quickly. To you being my girl. I resist the urge to raise my eyebrows at his uncharacteristic sentimentality and simply sip my drink. It's syrupy sweet. The bubbles burn my throat. Though I haven't thought of twilight in some time, the scene returns to me. Bella and Edward in that restaurant in Port Angeles. Bella circling closer to the truth about him. Edward's plate strangely empty. The secret burning under the surface of their conversation. That she is what he really wants to eat. What's the latest on the murder investigation? I ask, realizing too late I've interrupted Barry mid-sentence. He blinks for a second, taken aback. We've been crawling the swamp for more evidence. More pieces of the body? Barry cocks his head and studies me. You know what? I don't really want to talk about what we found. It's dark stuff. That's not what tonight is about. They found something new. My heartbeat picks up. Has the sheriff mentioned who he's looking? Shoot. Barry grips the table, shaking his head. I was going to wait for dessert to do it, but I'm too nervous. He laughs to himself. Me, nervous. I slowly put down my glass. Do what? It happens so quickly, too quickly to stop. Barry slides out of his seat, pulls a small box from his pants pocket, and drops to a knee. He opens the box, and there it is. A small diamond glinting on a gold band. Around us, the entire restaurant goes quiet. I feel the weight of a dozen sets of eyes. I can barely breathe. Ruth, Barry says, and although he swore he was nervous, he sounds confident and calm. I love how big-hearted you are, how devout, how good you've always been, ever since we was kids. You never made any trouble like the rest of us growing up. Weren't a loose girl like some others, trying to trap. Anyway, point is, I should have asked you out sooner. I love you, and I love your mama and daddy, and we make so much sense together. So... He's blown these words at me full speed, but now he pauses. Will you marry me? I can feel what I must look like. How wide my eyes, how red my cheeks, how arched my brows. Under all this scrutiny, my hands start to shake. It's not the proposal I dreamed of, not the way I would have chosen to hear these words. And there's this feeling inside me, like I'm in a car speeding off a cliff. We've been dating less than a year. My voice comes out a squeak. He laughs. Your daddy married your mama after court in three months. I, if you're worried about your daddy's opinion, don't be, because I got his blessing. He and your mama are real happy about this, Ruth. They're waiting for us back at your house. Soon as we're done with dinner, we're going to have a little engagement party. The Rose Thorn Cafe has turned into a fishbowl. No one is moving. They're all waiting. I want to melt into the floor. I don't know what to say. I clear my throat. I didn't see this coming. Barry shifts on his knee. For the first time, it seems to occur to him that I haven't burst into tears and seized the ring. He glances around the restaurant. What do you mean? Of course it was coming. You're my girl. All you have to do is say yes. Can I? Is it all right? If I have some time to think about it. His expectant smile drops. Think about it. It's just, I'm not good with surprises. 
a red flush creeps over his face. Are you saying no? No, this has nothing to do with you, I promise. I'm just saying, let me think. This time Barry takes a longer look at our fellow diners. I can see the embarrassment in his eyes. He picks himself up off the floor and sinks back into his chair. I'm immediately ashamed of myself. The restaurant explodes with whispers and Barry's face goes from flushed to tomato. Is this about Everett? He hisses. What? His voice has gone from persuasive to angry so fast it takes me a second to catch up. Is this because Everett's back? Is there something between you? Of course not. Ever's my best friend. This has nothing to do with him. You've been a different person since he got here. Like you're off in La La Land. I swung by your house last night and you weren't even there. Off with him, right? No, I... But what do I say? That I went to see the Fort Knott Fishing Wives for reasons I can't reveal, then spied at the inlet? My inability to provide an alibi makes a look of grim satisfaction creep over Barry's face. I knew it. Ruth, there's a conversation we need to have that's long overdue. I didn't think it would be a problem, because Everett seemed like he'd hightailed it for good, but he's back now. So I'm going to shoot straight. Your so-called friends, a freak show. You know that, right? My cheeks flame. That's not true. And it's cruel of you to say. Cruel of me? Do you even know whatever its daddy got into? How sheltered were you? I want to tell Barry he liked that I was sheltered when it made me a good girl, fit to be his wife. But instead, I say, I know he was an alcoholic. But that was Ever's problem more than anyone's. Don't pin that on him. His daddy was a Satanist, Ruth. Who told you that? Your daddy. My father has called more people Satanists than I can count. Do you want to know who's a Satanist according to him? The President of the United States? The man in charge of the ACLU? Librarians who read spooky books to children? Your daddy swore on the Bible that Killian Duncan was an honest-to-God devil worshiper. Seen it with his own eyes, and ever it's just like him. All those things people used to say about him? That he was feral and violent and hurt animals? It's all true. He hunted animals. Plenty of people around here hunt. He needed to eat, I wanted to add. But don't. You just don't want to see it. Barry reaches across the table and places his hand over mine. On account of your soft heart. But the truth is, he's always been a bad seed and you walk around with these shutters over your eyes when it comes to him. You know, he used to get in fights every weekend. Nearly killed someone before he even graduated. He had his reasons. I know everything about ever. Barry's eyes narrow. His hand slides off mine. Because he's my friend, I clarify. Everyone thinks you're crazy being friends with him. I don't care. For a woman who needs time to say yes to me, you're plenty quick to defend him. It throws me, because it's true. Once again, the desire to see Everett, to tell him everything that's happened and hear what he thinks, hits me hard. Barry picks up his glass and chugs the bubbles in one go. When he's done, he wipes his mouth and leans over the table. Your daddy's grooming me, Ruth. Now that Holy Fire's grown so big and there are so many people coming to Bottom Springs because of it, he's practically running this town, and he wants me to be next. I'm already part of the family, according to him. So say yes, and let's make it official. I glance around. Joe, our waitress, hovers by the kitchen too shy to come over. The rest of the diners still eye us, but their expressions are no longer anticipatory. Now they're hungry, watching what passes between Barry and me so they can report it all over town. We haven't even ordered yet. This dinner has gone off the rails on the breadstick course. I rise from my chair. I'm really sorry, Barry. I promise I'm excited about the ring. I don't mean to fight. I just need some time and some air. We're going to your parents, Ruth. They're expecting us. I'm not feeling well. 
You know your daddy suspects Everett used to steal money from the church? I freeze. Barry wears the satisfied expression of a man who knows he's got me on the hook. He waits until I've dropped back into my seat before he spreads his hands over the table. The money was in a safe and everything, but somehow Everett got in. The only way a person could have done that is through black magic. Why does my father think it was him? Barry gives me an incredulous look. Who else? Your daddy says Everett was only friends with you for information. He knew the church collected tithes and wanted it for booze or worse, like father, like son. I'm silent against the crush of surprise. I've never heard my father accuse ever of this, and it's a weapon he would have used against me, surely. The reverend was thinking of pressing charges a few years back. Barry leans over the table, his face hovering over the empty vase. I remember I'm wearing the rose that belongs there, like some sort of woman in a love poem. I pluck the flower from my hair and drop it on my plate. Barry's eyes linger on the thorn. That's who you're so devoted to, Ruth? He slams his hand on the table and I jump. A Satanist! No! Bam! His hand smacks the wood. A criminal! I open my mouth to protest, then stop. Because that accusation is true, in more ways than one. 15. July. 18 years old. Everett folded his arms over his chest and shot me a dubious look. I think you're really setting yourselves up for disappointment here. From behind the folding table, I wrapped an arm around Samuel Landry's shoulders and squeezed. Ye of little faith, the football team makes so much money from these things. I glanced at the empty pavement behind us. We were camped right next to Dale's Country Corner, the only gas station on Main Street. This little concrete lot was where countless school teams had held their car wash fundraisers, car washes being a town tradition. On past car wash Saturdays, you could barely drive down Main Street. It was so packed with cars waiting in line. I heard the football team made $2,000 last time. Even half that would be a godsend, Sam said modestly. He was small for 17, with a mop of blonde hair and curious eyes that telegraphed intelligence. I really can't thank you two enough for helping me. Are you kidding? I said, at the same time ever shrugged and muttered, It was Ruth's idea. You're going to Durham if I have to wash a million cars to get you there, I said, and Sam beamed. He leaned over the folding table to get a good look at Main Street. I was proud of the table. I'd hung a poster that read, Send Sam Landry to college. Car wash, $10. Cause, priceless. And had even roped Everett into helping me decorate it. You think they'll start coming soon? Sam asked. I followed his gaze. It was a bright, beautiful Saturday, mild for July, and there was ample traffic, people traipsing in and out of the Piggly Wiggly and the bait shop and hairdresser. We'd gotten a few curious glances, but no takers. Any minute now. Adult Bible study just ended, so we're about to see a rush of people. Samuel Landry had done what no one else in Bottom Springs had ever managed. Gotten accepted to Duke University, a school so good it called itself the Harvard of the South. Despite how cruelly kids had always teased him for the tics he couldn't help, calling him stupid and worse, Sam was the best student in the grade below us. He and I had always been friendly, if not friends, likely on account of our mutual wariness around other people. So when I heard the news that he'd been accepted to Duke, and I immediately burst into tears, I didn't know what was wrong with me. It took a full week of misery and several pointed comments from Ever to realize I was heart-sickenly jealous. Not only did Sam hold my dream of college in his hands, but he dared to think bigger than even I'd allowed myself. Bottom Springs had hemmed in my possibilities, but not his. Of course, I'd felt terribly guilty about my reaction. 
So when I found out Sam wouldn't be going to Duke after all because his financial aid left him a few thousand short of tuition, Sam's mama was a cashier at the Piggly Wiggly, and she'd raised him on a single income, I'd decided the only way to repent was to make sure Sam got to go. Everett kicked a pebble and it skittered away. When this all goes to hell, don't say I didn't warn you. I narrowed my eyes at him. You didn't even wear your bathing suit like I said. Your jeans are going to get soaked. Sam laughed. At the idea of a soaked Everett or Everett in a bathing suit, I didn't know. It was obvious Sam was still intimidated by Everett because he kept shooting nervous glances Everett's way. Sure enough, his laughter cut off abruptly when Ever turned his cool gaze on him. Maybe that was the point? Ever drawled. Get him wet so I don't have to wash him later? Gross. Ever raised an eyebrow. We can't all be supermodels in our vacation Bible school t-shirts. I looked down at my oversized VBS shirt, with its crucifix wreathed in flowers, and flushed. I thought this shirt was the prettiest I owned. It's a cover-up for my bathing suit. At least I remembered mine. I was wearing my old one-piece under my shirt. After the encounter with Fred, I'd hidden my yellow bikini in the farthest reaches of my dresser. I'm dressed sensibly. Oh! Ever clutched his heart. Is this the face that launched a thousand ships? She walks in beauty like the night. He pretended to stagger back. Your two great eyes will slay me suddenly. Their beauty shakes me, who was once serene. Great, I rolled my eyes. Just what we need, Everett's feeling goofy. And that's Marlowe, Byron, and Chaucer for your information. Sam looked at me in amazement. Is he reciting poetry? Don't encourage him, I warned, opening the empty cash box. It's a game we play when we're bored. Evers never met a poem he didn't like, or, unfortunately, memorized to use as a weapon of annoyance later. For some reason, he won't stop repeating the Chaucer, even though I guess it every time. The last was directed at Everett. Sam's astonishment only seemed to grow. Brightness. Ever found my eyes. A small smile curved his lips, the kind he wore when he was pushing it, pouring itself out of you as if you were burning inside. I cleared my throat. Nerutha. Ever knew I liked Nerutha. His eyes didn't leave my face, like twin black holes recording space and time to pull me in. I've got one, Sam said. How do I love thee? Let me count the ways. Ever's eyes cut away, and I took a deep breath, as if resurfacing. Ladies and gentlemen, he whooped. We have a contender. Sam laughed. Wait, I've got another. Down the street, the door to the Rose Thorn Cafe swung open, and people began filing out. The post-Bible study crowd. Hey, I elbowed Sam. Big smiles, okay? Sam sat straighter in his folding chair and smiled obediently. I turned to Ever and he rolled his eyes but bared his teeth. On second thought, I said, maybe just stand a ways behind us. As the crowd approached, I mustered my courage and waved. Hi, Mrs. Anderson, Mr. Blanchard. I waved harder at Herman Blanchard, who'd been my vacation Bible school teacher growing up. If I talked quickly enough, maybe I could outpace the heat running up my neck. Ruth, said Mr. Blanchard warily. He was normally known for his easy nature. It was why children loved him. Right now, he looked like he wanted to turn and flee. With tight smiles, the group stopped in front of our table. There were different tiers of people in Bottom Springs. You could tell where someone stood by how they were treated in church. The people at the bottom, the Fort Knott fishing wives and their families, and other newer folks who'd move here for jobs at the company or Blanchard Hospital, sat near the back. They were hard scrabble people who were to be assimilated at holy fire, but not treated as bosom friends. The people in the middle, whose families had lived in Bottom Springs for generations, like Old Man Jonas and Mrs. Otten the tailor, 
were treated with modest respect and affection, sometimes made ushers. While their ties to the town were admirable, their families had never amounted to much. And then there were the people in front of us, who lived in my parents' neighborhood, with jobs that passed for lucrative and respectable families. They were the kind of people my parents kept close, the top echelon. Mrs. Anderson read the sign on our table. Send Sam Landry to college, huh? I sat up straighter. Mrs. Anderson was a friend of my mother who was so under her sway she'd even taken to wear in her hair the same style, dyed platinum blonde and cut bluntly at the shoulders. Looking at her, I felt an echo of the same anxiety that surfaced whenever I was home. She gave her best approximation of a smile. You three, what a interesting group. I knew the subtext. A troop of misfits. You're Tia's boy, right? Mr. Blanchard smiled tightly at Sam. Only got you for two summers in VBS? Yes, sir. Sam ducked his head. My mom had to work and couldn't always take me. A shame, Mr. Blanchard tittered, letting worldly matters interfere with the instruction of a young soul. I could feel, more than hear, Everett's scoff. I knew what he was thinking. Herman Blanchard was the grown son of Augustus Blanchard, owner of Blanchard Hospital. Their family was the richest in town. Herman Blanchard hadn't needed to worry about worldly matters a single day in his life. He could write us a big check, though. I smiled as widely as I could, prepared to make a pitch, but just then Mrs. Anderson frowned at Sam. Can you even wash cars, dear, on account of your... She wiggled her fingers at his head. Disability? There was a stretched top moment of silence. Then Sam said curtly, Of course I can. An uncomfortable paw fell over the group. A few of the women shot glances at each other, followed by small private smiles, a promise of gossip to come. Well, unfortunately, we don't have the time, said Mr. Anderson, pulling on his belt. We'd better bid you all good luck. Wait. I said, shocking everyone, most of all myself. If you don't have time to get your cars washed, could you at least consider a donation? I nodded at Sam. He would be a local legend, the first person from Bottom Springs to attend Duke. He's worked hard for it. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw Sam's shoulders tense. He was embarrassed I was trying to sell him to these people. Mr. Anderson cleared his throat. Uh... The Reverend, your daddy, he said y'all would be down here today, but that we shouldn't, uh, encourage you. These colleges, he says they're brainwashing factories, trying to teach kids the sky is red, even though Christ says it's blue. Your daddy says one day Jesus is going to come in all his wrath to demolish them, so we have to steer y'all away, especially, uh, he glanced at Sam. The weakest among you, Psalms 82.3, Mr. Blanchard explained like he was being helpful. We must defend the weak and the fatherless. Of course, my father had put his sword through my gut even from far away. But it was one thing to do it to me. It was another to do it to Sam. The Bible study group ambled away. We sat in heavy silence. I'm sorry, I said finally. The next people will be different. I'm not, Sam said quietly. Weak, I mean. I turned to him. His cheeks were pink, eyes glued to the table. Under it, his foot tapped. Of course you're not. You were valedictorian of sacred surrender. You've made it through 17 years in this place, and now you're going to be the one who gets away. You're going to go out there and succeed. And one day, Bottom Springs will be nothing but a distant memory. I was feeding him my own dream, measured out in spoonfuls. Sam gave me an appraising look. You know, I didn't expect you to be like this. I always thought you were nice, with a better-than-average vocabulary, but still one of them. Because of your parents? Heads up, Ever murmured. And I jumped at his voice in my ear. I hadn't even heard him approach. He pointed to a truck rolling down Main, headed our way. My stomach dropped. 
The windows of the truck rolled down. It was packed with kids from school. Former football players like Barry Holt and the quarterback Jace Reynolds and cheerleaders like Lila LeBlanc. So many there were squished into the cab and hanging out of the truck bed, clearly on their way to Starry Swamp for a party. Look, y'all, Jace called from the driver's seat. The truck slowed to a crawl. We got ourselves a freak show. They're all gathered in one place, snickered a young cheerleader from the truck bed. Creepy how they stick together. Even freaks need friends, Jace cackled, and the entire truck started laughing. I could see Barry's eyes squeeze shut next to Jace in the cab, Lila's white-toothed grin in the back. Good luck with your car wash, the young cheerleader yelled. Looks like y'all are super busy. Lila blew Sam a kiss. Have fun at Duke. They were still laughing when Jace gunned the engine and took off, making the cheerleaders squeal. The truck raced to the stop sign at the end of Main, then peeled around the corner. The moment they were gone, Sam stood up. This was a mistake. No, I pleaded. Stay. It's still early. Plenty of time for things to turn around. I looked back at the lot, where I'd stacked our supplies. I bought these new sponges and this soap that's supposed to be real good for cars, Mr. Dale said, and a fancy windshield cleaner that leaves no spots. My voice faltered. I could feel Sam studying me. Okay, he said quietly, resuming his seat. A little more time, then. I'm out of here, Ever said, kicking one of the empty water buckets. What? I spun in my chair. You can't go. He squinted at me, which was code for, you sure about that? If you say I told you so ever, I swear. I sat back in my chair and crossed my arms, feeling his betrayal reverberate. Where are you even going? Nowhere. Of course, I scoffed. Figures. Hold down the fort, he said and strode away. After a few minutes of people watching, Sam looked at me out of the corner of his eye. I heard Everett has to drink blood twice a day to keep his protection against the sun. What? I'm kidding. Obviously, I don't believe that. The way Sam said it made it sound like any more was missing from the end of his sentence. It's okay. He nudged me with his elbow. I was surprised he even helped. I never expected him to last. And here I thought he would. Two long, miserable hours later, as Sam and I were folding up our table, ever materialized behind us. I sucked in a breath. You need a bell. He glanced at the unused sponges and dry buckets. You calling it quits? He had the nerve to sound surprised. I dropped my half of the folding table and turned to him, nearly vibrating. Are you really asking that? The person who left? No one was coming. Sam said, taking pains to sound cheerful. Figured we might as well close up shop. Not a single person? I ignored the question. What are you even doing back? Did nowhere get boring? It was the maddest I'd ever been at Everett since we'd become friends, and you could hear it in my voice. He raised an eyebrow, looking amused, which was further infuriating. And what are you doing with that bag? I jerked a hand at the brown grocery bag he was holding. He never went inside the Piggly Wiggly, even for a Coke. Can I talk to you? He nodded toward Dale's country corner. In private? No, thank you. Ruth? Ever gripped my forearm. I looked up and found his expression serious. Please. The moment we made it to the parking lot behind Dale's, weeds growing through cracks in the pavement... I turned to Ever with my arms crossed. His answering grin derailed me. Why are you smiling? He nodded at my crossed arms. I'm glad you trust me. I felt like I did whenever I read a line in a book that peered into my soul, putting into words a feeling that had, until that moment, lived only vaguely inside my brain. How remarkable for another person to capture your feelings exactly. Though I suspected I knew, I asked, What do you mean? With his free hand, he rubbed my arm. You're the queen of walking on eggshells. That's why you've always been so quiet. 
but you're not walking on them with me. You feel safe enough to get mad. Only ever could take my anger and bend it into something like affection. I swallowed. Where'd you go, anyhow? He opened the grocery bag. To get this? Inside was stuffed with bills. Tens, twenties, fives. Not crisp, like from the bank, but bent and wrinkled. For Sam, ever explained. Since none of these people will let him wash their stupid cars. Think of it as a cruelty tax with 17 years interest. My jaw dropped. Ever watched with a neutral expression, waiting for me to speak. How? Where? Holy fire. He said it so lightly. From my dad's office? It was where he'd kept the tithe collection since I was young. His office, not the elders, who were technically in charge of the budget. Very few people knew that. Ever nodded. How'd you know it was there? His gaze cut away. Good guess. You got all of this from his safe. My father had installed one in the wall behind his desk, hidden by a large painting of the two unnamed men crucified next to Christ, history's most famous thieves. It was meant as an inside joke and a warning. He trusted that safe so much it was where he kept everything important, car titles, birth certificates, even the deed to our house. Ever nodded again. His expression said he was being patient with me while I processed. How'd you get into it? He shrugged. You could say my father taught me. I stared down at the stuffed bag. There was so much money, more than I'd ever seen. I inhaled the peculiar scent of cash. What made money smell so good? The paper, the ink, the hands it traveled through? Or was this what power smelled like? We're going to talk about how you learned to do that later, I promised. But for now, how much money is this? It looks like hundreds, thousands, ever corrected. I blinked up at him. He said tithing was up at the church, but I never imagined this much. That's not even half of what was in the safe. Holy fire had grown over the years, from the modest white clapboard my father had inherited to the sprawling complex it was now after two additions, both paid for by congregants. He and the elders were planning yet another expansion to accommodate all the new people who had started showing up, filling every pew. My father was building an empire. They really do love him, I said softly, which was nowhere near the important thing to focus on. But faced with this concrete proof of what his congregants were willing to give, I was gutted. Some part of me had been waiting for Bottom Springs to come to my side all these years. Ever remained silent. Time seemed to crawl as we stood looking in the bag of money. As the shock of where it came from dissipated, a vision began to form. Me slipping the bag under my t-shirt and walking it home, hiding it in the dark space beneath my dresser, where my parents never looked. Sitting at the library desktop, back on LSU's website, but this time, except in my admission, packing my things into a suitcase, leaving Bottom Springs forever. It was right there in Ever's hands, in all those soft, crinkled bills, the life I wanted. Ever cocked his head. What you thinking, Ruth? Desire was thick in my throat. I couldn't pull my eyes away. His voice was silky. You can have it. You can take it and do whatever you want. I reached inside the bag, fingering the bills. Then I looked at the empty car wash lot. Sam was stacking the buckets. Behind him, people walking past, inspecting him, and then looking away. No, I almost choked on it. I can't. Everett and I locked eyes. But you, I said softly, testing the words, you could use it to finally get out of here. Everett looked at me at that moment in a way I'd never been looked at before, like I was a thousand different people he was sorting through, trying to make sense of. His dark eyes searched my face, his voice husky. Would you come with me? I finally fixed the old convertible. We could race the whole way up Highway 1 and never look back. 
I could find work in a garage and you could go to school. Yes, I said hoarsely. I'd go. Questions swirled in his eyes. My heart pounded. We stood on the edge of a cliff, ever looked down at the money, and then at Sam packing up his book bag, his expression despondent now that he thought we weren't looking. I could feel his decision. Even before he took a deep breath and turned from me, I could feel it in the air and my heart cracked at the loss. Ever walked over to Sam and presented the money. I would learn later what he said. It was an anonymous donation, a kind soul who wanted no recognition, only to see Sam succeed. I watched the first tendrils of acceptance push past the doubt on Sam's face. Then that acceptance turned to a joy as he took the bag, looked into it. I wondered if he thought, it's a miracle, like Pastor Cornier always swore could happen. Ever slapped him on the shoulder and walked away, cutting off the gush in Sam was trying to do. Before Everett left, he glanced to where I stood, still frozen behind the country corner. He nodded, one sharp incline of his chin, and I knew in that moment that what he'd done had been right, that what was lawful and what was just had been two different things today, and we'd chosen correctly. So yes, Everett and I had done some things I needed to repress. Yes, we were criminals. There was no getting around it. But I swear to God, to Christ and the Holy Spirit, in the ways that mattered, I always believed we were good. 16. Now It's barely light outside when I slip out my front door, screen banging behind me wheeled in a pair of gardening shears with blades as big as my forearms. The morning's cool, the sun taking mercy on the flowers in my garden, more mercy than I will show Everett's back door, the one his father broke in a drunken rage and ever never got repaired. For years it stood bound with the flimsy padlock, a tempting invitation for home invaders if Bottom Springs had any, though even if we did, they, like everyone else in town, would probably be too afraid of the Duncan house to rob it. Actually, I suppose I'm the home invader. The thought makes me smile as I take swift steps across my lawn. I'm shirking my duties at the library to head straight to Everett's house and see if he's back. And if not, I plan to break into his back door using these shears and wait for him, however long it takes. There's a killer out there, and the Fort Knott Fishing Company is hiding something and Barry has proposed, and altogether it makes me feel like a powder keg waiting to explode. I'm still smiling in a way that can't look wholly sane when I hear the crunch of tires and twist to find the sheriff's familiar brown and white Ford crown ambling down my drive. I still, like a rabbit, gripping my gardening shears, too surprised to do anything but watch the car jerk to a halt, a cloud of dust swirling. The sheriff steps out. Morning. He tips his hat and adjusts his sunglasses against the glare of the sun. A grin spreads over his face. Who's in trouble? I blink at him. Sorry? He points to the shears. Those wicked scissors? Who's in trouble? My mouth goes dry. My star jasmine. They're due for a trim. The sheriff moves toward me in a showy way, taking big steps that make the holstered gun at his side bounce so it's impossible to ignore. Awful early for gardening. I swallow the lump in my throat. My long grass in need of a mowing pricks my ankles above my kids. I thought I'd get it done before work while it's cooler. I frown. It's awful early for you to be here, sheriff. He smiles. Tom Terrio used to have a single gold tooth the result of an old football injury, but he got it fixed a few years back at some fancy dentist over in Forsyth. Now his smile is pure white. Thought I'd catch you before work this time. He gestures at my garden. Go ahead. I can talk while you trim. With no other choice, I walk stiffly to my jasmine bushes, the sheriff trailing close behind. I begin to cut. Each slash of the blades is satisfying. If you're here to ask more about Fred, 
I'm afraid I haven't remembered anything new. Actually, the sheriff takes his time with the word, drawing it out. I'm here on another matter. I pause mid-cut. I see. Not sure if Barry's mentioned, but we've been dragging Starry Swamp, searching for more remains. It's hard, nasty work, but we found another piece. Except this one don't belong to Fred. Know how we know? I shake my head. It's another skull. It takes all of my willpower not to drop the shears. Our best guess is that it belongs to a man named Renard Michaels, construction worker who passed through here about six years ago, for Fred went missing. I can hear Ever's voice in my head, clear and ringing. Never send to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. Done, I whisper back, as in, we are done and buried. I wait for the flames. Renard's name spoken like a spell, his soul unleashed, the devil's coming. But there's nothing, only the sun beaten down, the air thick with sweet, cloying jasmine, the buzz of bees, no cosmic reaction, no opening of hell. The debilitating guilt I expected is nowhere to be found. In its place, curiously, is a ribbon of rebellion. The sheriff stands beside me so imperiously, I want to leave him frustrated, evaded. I want to best him. We're working with a fancy forensic center up in New Orleans now that there's two victims. He continues. I can feel the intensity of his stare, but don't meet it. They say the skull's been in the swamp for about six years, which is around the time Renard's truck was found abandoned in the swamp. That's how we figured it was him. We'll confirm the identity and cause of death soon. Red blotches appear on my freckled skin, spreading over my arms like a tail. Now Ruth, says the sheriff, startling me into snapping off a long, elegant arm of star jasmine. Its beautiful scent sharpens in death. I made a mistake going public with Fred and the vandalism in the swamp. I'll own up to that. The town's up in arms about witchcraft and the low man, and it's starting to put the screws to our investigation. So we're keeping Renard quiet for now, and I'ma need you to do the same. No stoking this into a furor, you hear? I thrust my arms deep into the jasmine bushes to hide the scarlet blotches, focus on the rhythm of cutting, 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 until I realize I need to answer him. Of course, Sheriff. I'm very sorry to hear there's another skull. It's too little, too late, but it's something. It's awful, whoever it turns out to be. I cannot say the name Bernard. I will choke. Well, Ruth, it's good to hear you say that, because back when Bernard disappeared, you was still in school. We chalked it up to him meeting a bad end on a trapping trip, on account of that's how he used to spend his time. You know, trucking out into the swamp ain't for casual fools. We figured he was an outsider and Starry got him. But now that we got two skulls, two signs of blunt force trauma, our calculation's different. We're looking into some things we didn't look into before. I chop and chop. The sun has risen high overhead and there's sweat at my hairline. I want the vines to swallow me like the trees swallowed nymphs in Greek myths. I want to be green and inhuman and at peace. Turns out Renard was real close to his mama, says the sheriff. He re-angles so he's standing in front of me, and I have no choice but to look at his face. Told her a lot, and one of the things he said was that he'd met a nice girl here in Bottom Springs, a preacher's daughter with flaming red hair. He actually said that, flaming red. Ain't that some poetry? It made the detail stick in his mama's head, and she told me all about it when I called her up. I stopped cutting, arms still in the bushes. She's not lying. I did meet Renard at church, like I meet everybody. And what was the nature of your relationship? It's going to be okay, I promised myself. All I need to do is say the things I was prepared to say six years ago. We didn't have one. We were friendly at church, that's all. I meet his eyes. You know me, not much for talking. 
the sheriff smiles. Yes, a modest girl. Miss Ruth, can you think back to where you were six years ago on the night of Friday, June 1st? That's an awful long time ago, Sheriff. Do your best. Well, I was never one for going out with friends. Friday night back then, you could find me at home reading. I smile tightly. You can ask my parents. It hasn't changed much since. I see. Sheriff Tyrio nods, as if he was expecting that answer. And speaking of friends, you're friends with Killian's boy, Everett Duncan, that right? He knows I am. He just asked about Everett two days ago. I nod warily. He ever mentioned Renard, either back then or since? It's almost otherworldly how, despite the heat, goosebumps spike on my skin. I clear my throat. Never. When you was being friendly with Renard at church, did he ever say anything about spending time at Killian's garage? The question is so strange I forget to keep my composure and frown. No. The sheriff lifts his sunglasses so I can see his eyes. They're brown and bloodshot, but cunning. Six years ago. Ain't that about the time you and Everett startin' hangin' out? I step back, shaking the jasmine. I, well, something hot and sharp pierces my skin. I gasp, jerking my hands out of the flower bush. A wasp lights up into the sky, buzzing loudly. I've been stung. Tears prick my eyes at the radiating pain. A red welt is already rising on my forearm, a white gouge mark in the middle. Ooh, the sheriff winces. Nasty. Better get some antihistamine and a nice pack. I nod, clutching my arm, trying to will my tears away. Well, I'll leave you to tend to that, he says, turning to walk away. But after a few steps, he swings back and locks eyes with me. Move careful round dangerous creatures, Miss Ruth. They get cornered and desperate. Their first instinct is always going to be to sting you. 17. Now. Everett Duncan's house is haunted, though, like his father, supposedly it had potential once. It's not small, bigger than my parents before all the additions. In the center of the front door is a beautiful stained glass inset, one of many expensive details that signal once upon a time someone had big plans for this place. It's as far away from my rental as I could get, but edges up to its own lonely forest just like my house does, forests being easy to come by around here. Behind it, you can see an ocean of pines stretching in an undulating wave. These days, the stained glass is so filthy you can barely discern the colors. There are permanent oil stains on the driveway, and the wild has crept in and run roughshod, sweeping tall grass up the walls and vines over the roof, choking the house so much the gutters are fallen off. If I was being romantic, I'd say Everett's house looks like the castle in Sleeping Beauty, after the thorned plants have held it in their clutches for a thousand years. But I do not feel romantic. This house is an unhappy place for unhappy people. I've asked Everett a million times why he doesn't just sell it, and a million times he's replied that he can't in good conscience burden someone else with his family's ghosts. His convertible is in the driveway when I drive up, flooding me with relief. I pull up next to it, leaving the garden shears and pound on his front door. The pain from the sting on my arm is still white hot. Ever, I call. It's me. After a moment, the door cracks open. Ever's black hair sticks straight up like he's been electrocuted, though I know it only means he's run his hands through it a million times. He has dark circles under his eyes and leans against the door frame like he needs it to stay upright. I thought you had work. That's what you have to say? I shoulder in past him, brushing my long hair out of my eyes. The house looks exactly like it did four years ago when his father died. There's the sad, dilapidated couch and worn armchair Killian lived in when he wasn't at the garage, facing the same rabbit-eared TV. 
other than the omnipresent half-empty liter of vodka and crumbled coke can on the side table ever hasn't changed a thing ever hasn't changed a thing the sight of the room works like a time machine taking me back to when we were teenagers i shiver where have you been i can't believe you took off on me left you a note wherever i don't have time for evasiveness he runs a hand over his face i drove to durham i crossed my arms then wince you think now's the time to go on vacation he peers at my arm having clocked my pain i didn't go on vacation i went to see sam i've decided to sell this shithole this is enough to sidetrack me everett duncan cut in his last tie to bottom springs though i've bugged him about selling for years now that he's actually doing it i realize i expected him to resist forever this house is the one piece of insurance i'd clung to when i wondered if he'd ever come back the news is such a gut punch it takes me a second to process the other part sam as in sam landry i needed his help sam had as i predicted moved out of bottom springs and never looked back he'd graduated top of his class at duke and was now at duke law i kept track of his accomplishments through his mama the only other person who felt a similar bittersweet mix of pride and pain at sam succeeding out there in the world ever takes my arm twisting it gently wasp yes what did you need sam for ice ever says and tugs me into the kitchen where he cracks open the old freezer and pulls out a handful of brown tinged ice ew you're not drinking it he presses the ice to my wound and i inhale sharply at the cold what did you need sam's help for i repeat through gritted teeth ever looks at my wound sam's a lawyer law student well he knows things more importantly people he was able to get me what i needed think i spooked him though appearing out of thin air like a ghost doesn't he study estate law sam was going to manage rich people's money his mama told me help wealthy people like the kind generous benefactor who'd paid his way to college yeah well i need to make sure everything's taken care of ever's persistent vagueness finally annoys me so much i wrench my arm away ice cubes shatter on the kitchen floor but ever doesn't say anything he just walks to the sink and dumps the rest of the ice then grips the counter with both hands staring at his broad back i think stop being scared and tell him about barry i open my mouth but can't bring myself to do it i can't remember the code to that damn safe ever murmurs staring at the window i know it starts with an eight i push thoughts of barry's proposal aside i'll tell ever later when things are less urgent why are you talking about a safe focus he spins on his heel and blows past me back into the living room tugging at his hair i think a seven is next i follow him everett come on he paces in front of the couch but the third number i can't get a nine or a six i just can't ever i say sharply and seize his t-shirt by the hem he halts eyes flick into my mouth snap out of it we need to talk about the investigation his jaw tightens that is what i'm talking about i tug his shirt harder you don't understand while you were traipsing around durham they found renard's skull the sheriff came to see me asking questions about my relationship with renard and you he knows we knew each other shit exactly he asked if renard ever visited your dad's garage why would he ask that everett's silent now is really not the time to be evasive if you have something to say speak he looks up at the ceiling then blows out a breath okay you're not going to like this but renard used to work for this gang out of forsyth i release his shirt what kind of gang bike gang that calls itself the sons of liberty real notorious in certain circles they move drugs through south louisiana 
how do you know that? Ever silent again. Finally, he says, because they used my dad's garage for drops. Surprise locks my limbs. Your dad worked for them? His laugh is throaty. <laughs> Ruth, my dad was an alcoholic who could barely finish a repair job unless I stepped in. Where do you think his money actually came from? I can barely keep up with all the memories I now have to reconsider. Mr. Duncan was more than just a sadistic drunk. He was a criminal. Does that change anything? The voice in my head whispers. I can't... I don't know what to say. You're repulsed, Ever says quietly, certain of it. No, I mean, yes, but how do you know Renard was involved with the Sons of Liberty too? Their name feels strange in my mouth. I know what Everett looks like when he doesn't want to do something, so I know he's forcing himself to look me in the eyes. Because Renard used to come by the garage all the time. Someone from the Sons of Liberty would drop off a package, Renard would come pick it up, and then the same thing would happen in reverse with the money, except that round my dad got a cut. The garage was a way station. Everyone needs repairs, especially motorcycle riders. They had the perfect excuse to be in and out all hours. What kind of drugs? Oxy mostly, fentanyl, meth, painkillers, Ruth. That's where the money is. Challenge shimmers in his eyes. This is opioid country. Surely you're aware. I sidestep his pointed remark. None of this makes sense. I know for a fact Renard worked construction. From what I could tell, he was in deep with the sons. His construction job probably made him the perfect runner, traveling from place to place all over the state. How do you think he paid for that big, ugly truck with the rims? Renard and his beloved truck. My voice is dazed. So you're saying Renard and your father were involved in a drug ring? but you never said a word. And we were supposed to be best friends. Ever studies me a moment, then nods. Ruth, that's when it hits me. You knew Renard before you found us in the swamp. Why did you let me think you two were strangers? I didn't want to freak you out. You were already dealing with the guilt and getting college taken away, then the hospital. I didn't want to add to your stress when it didn't matter anyway. He shakes his head, and truthfully, I didn't want you to know about my dad and the sons because you already thought so low of me. You were scared of me before the swamp. I was afraid if I told you the truth, you'd stop being my friend. I never thought badly of you ever, only him. A wild thought occurs to me. Is that why you were there that day? Because of Renard? Had ever followed us into the swamp? No, he says emphatically, I was hunting like I told you. And okay, I spotted Renard's truck. That's why I got within earshot. Normally, you see another person when you're hunting, you hightail it in the opposite direction. But I saw his stupid truck out there where no one ever goes, and I had to know what he was doing. He was a son of a bitch at the garage, and I didn't trust him. So I moved closer, and that's when I heard you. Not even a scream, a whimper. I turn my back on him, hands sliding over my mouth. Six years, and I'm only now learning the truth about the day that changed my life. Talk to me, he urges. I try to shake off, not even a scream, clear my throat, but my voice still comes out hoarse. This gives the sheriff another connection to trace. Now it's not only just my date with Renard, it's your dad's garage. They're going to put it together. It's my turn to start pacing. They won't. Everett's voice is the surest I've heard it. Trust me. The Sons of Liberty have been running drugs for years and doing worse things, too. If the people in charge wanted to stop them, they would have done it by now. This is a stone they don't want to overturn. We're going to have to force them to look. I freeze mid-stride. I told you I'd come up with a plan, he says. What do you think I spent the car ride doing? I know how to throw the sheriff off our scent. 
You didn't even know they found Renard's skull until I just told you. It was inevitable. Now listen, the runners have to leave collateral with my dad. Something valuable they'd lose if they tried to screw the sons and take off with the drugs or the money. Renard's leverage was the deed to his mom's house. I know because my dad used to give him hell for it, told him he was the world's biggest tool for putting his mama's house on the line instead of his own truck or something. I think of Renard's mama necklace, that measure of his love blackening in the fire. My dad used to keep the leverage in a safe in the garage, and the man I sold the garage to after he died works for the sons, too. They're still using the place as a drop site. This man, Earl A. Bear, is sharp as a rabbit. More than that, he's lazy. I bet you a million dollars he hasn't changed a thing in there. You want to go find out? Ever strides to me, pressing his hands together like he's begging. Hear me out. We can sneak in when Earl's away and look for the safe. I used to watch my dad. If I can remember the code, it'll be easy. But even if I can't, I'll get in. Like you got into the safe at the church. Ever nods, his eyes grave. You remember how it was back then with my dad? Constant warfare. I learned how to steal things from that safe just to piss him off. I sink onto the couch cushion. It smells musty and sour, but I'm too lost in the magnitude of Everett's bad idea to care. Absolutely not. If we can find that deed, that's something unique and valuable of Renard's. It's at least something with his fingerprints on it, and I know where to find the sons in Forsyth. We can plant it on them and send an anonymous tip to the sheriff. Then we'll spread rumors Renard was mixed up with the sons. You know, Bottom Springs, it'll spread like wildfire. The sheriff will have no choice but to search them if there's pressure. When he finds the deed on the sons, boom, there's your suspects and your motive. Drug deal gone wrong. I shake my head. We're not doubling down on danger by trying to frame a drug gang for our murder. Do you hear yourself? He throws up his hands. What other options do we have? Remember when we burned Renard's necklace where the drifters made their fires? It's the same thing. The sons are committing crimes. All we have to do is bury ours in theirs. When I don't say anything, he continues. I'm trying to save us, Ruth. There's a clear fall guy. Better than clear. Deserving. This is the best chance we've got. My throat goes dry. Before I make any decisions, I need answers. Ever. Did you carve that symbol into the trees? The one they found in the swamp? The abrupt change in direction throws him, but only for a second. He shakes his head. No, I've never seen it before. But at the bar, it sounded like you knew... I don't. His voice is firm. Final. Okay, then. I swallow. There's something else I need to ask you. His look turns wary. While you were gone, I went digging into Fred. I tell Everett everything about the secret dock at the inlet and the men loading the boat with the scraped-off logo. His pale cheeks flush with color when I describe jumping overboard. Before he can give me a hard time, I ask him the question that's burning a hole in my head. The only option that makes sense. Do you think it's possible Fred was a drug runner too? Ever tenses. Eyes drop into the large rust-red stain on the carpet. A leftover from one of the bad nights. His long, elegant fingers clench into fists. Do you think Fred could have done something that pissed off the sons and made them kill him? I know we're inventing that story about Renard, but could it actually be true for Fred? Ever's hands relax. Because if they did, if they are murderers, and it happens to be Fred they killed and not Renard, all the pieces light up in my head, guiding me to a single conclusion. Then they would deserve to be framed. If there's one thing I'm certain of, he says softly, it's that the sons of liberty deserve to go down.
It wouldn't be such a sin, then, your plan. It would be justice, in a way. Ever's face remains neutral. You get to decide, Ruth. You tell me what to do. My own voice in my head whisper quiet. Be good and be spared the lake of fire. But what is good here? I picture a scale. On one side, the heart of Renard Michaels, drug runner and would-be rapist, Fred Fortnot, abuser, possible drug runner, the sons, drug kingpins, maybe murderers, and on the other side, Ever and me trying to survive. The scale rocks back and forth with indecision. And then Ever looks at me, and among the brown flecks that look like stars, I see it. Fear. It's a look I've seen before, and my response, like then, is automatic. Okay, I say. One last crime to end it. The scale tips. 18. January. 19 years old. A whole year exploring the deep forest and salty coast and starry swamp by foot, being bitten and scraped and burned by the sun, cold and plant poisons, and still there was one place so foreboding I'd never been willing to go, Everett's house, where he lived alone with his father, his mother killed giving birth to him, a family history he'd spoken of for the first time only weeks ago, and only in passing, the subject too painful to dwell on. Although my heart had ached to know his loss, a small, selfish part of me had been happy when he told me, honored to be trusted with such an intimate part of him. Now I stood in front of his house with dread settling like lead in my stomach. He was supposed to meet me at the library after work so we could take a canoe into the swamp, but he hadn't shown. Normally, he was predictable as a clock, all the more extraordinary since he didn't own one, not a watch or a cell phone or anything, just seemed to know the time by the angle of the sun and stars. I'd searched for him everywhere the blue moon, the gas station, even my house in case he'd gotten the meat and spot mixed up. But he was nowhere, which meant there was only one place left to look. I wouldn't have gone, would have simply let Everett stand me up if it wasn't for my sense that something was wrong. It was a dark, oily suspicion that crept through my veins. The Duncan house was as bad as you'd expect from the rumors. The garage door was half open, jugs of antifreeze and rusty tools strewn everywhere, a stained white t-shirt lying limply in an overgrown front lawn. The last person I wanted to face was Mr. Duncan, but his car wasn't in the driveway, and either way, this was ever, so I needed to be brave. I knocked on the front door, and no one answered. I knocked again, harder and the door opened of its own volition. I towed inside on high alert, then bit back a gasp. The house was in ruins, the coffee table overturned, a lamp lying shattered on the floor, the carpet streaked with sick yellowish-brown stains I could tell from the smell were liquor. It was ice cold, just as wintry inside as out, and I saw why the next second. The back door hung nearly off the hinges, bent outward at the wrong angle like a broken bone. I could see clear to the hundred naked pines in the back yard. I drifted into the middle of the living room, unable to wrench my eyes away. A tale of violence was written in every wounded object. And then I saw Ever. No! I cried and flew to the couch. Ever it lay crumpled there almost hidden among the dark cushions, one of his eyes swollen shut, his beautiful face marred by blood around his mouth and nose. Ever, I urged, shaking his shoulders. He startled, his good eye flying open, the look on his face so profoundly afraid that seeing it felt like a stab to the heart. Ruth, he whispered, voice garbled, he shifted and groaned, clutching his left arm. 
I could feel the tears in my eyes, warm against the cold leaking in from the door. What happened? Never mind. Get up. We have to go to the hospital. No, he said weakly, the words thick out of his swollen lips. I'm okay. You're not. It looks like someone took a hammer to you. I felt nearly hysterical, like I could do anything, pick him up and carry him all the way to Blanchard if I had to. His good eye fluttered shut. Wasn't a hammer. Please let me take you. I pressed closer to him, trying to share his space, breathe for him. I didn't know. Something. To the hospital and then the sheriff. No. He snarled, his one eye flashing open full of fire. We'd found a squirrel in the swamp once, badly ravaged by a wolf or bobcat, hanging on by a thread shivering with fear and pain. Ever had bent to pick it up and to take it to old Mr. Wilkes, who ran a small clinic, but the squirrel had hissed with all its strength, glaring up at him with the same look Ever was given me now, a wounded thing fighting for its life. Not the cops. Never the cops. Do you hear me? I looked at him and felt the tears fall down my face. His glare softened. I'm sorry, Ruth. I just can't. Then let me take care of you. I wiped under my eyes, determined to be useful, then touched the arm he was cradling. Is it broken? Ever shivered. No, just pulled out of the joint. I already popped it back in. I didn't ask how he knew to do that. I just nodded. I'll be back. I marveled at how clean and orderly his kitchen was, how unlike the living room, as I collected ice from an empty freezer and a hand towel from a drawer with a single match and oven mitt. My mind raced, picturing ever here as a kid, cooking and cleaning for himself, keeping the kitchen tidy despite his father. In search of Everett's bedroom, I stumbled into two rooms, the first clearly his father's, Empty bottles of vodka and soda cans litter in every surface, his bed sheets twisted off the bed. The second room was pristine, like it hadn't been touched in years. A desk with a sewing machine in one corner, books stacked tidily on a bookshelf in another, framed pressed flowers on the wall surrounding a yellowed illustration of the Virgin Mary. I wondered about the room, whether it had been his mother's then forced myself to turn and keep going. Everett's room was the smallest and barest, with only a rickety wooden bed covered by threadbare white sheets, the hospital corners a trick Everett had learned to do from me. There was a small stack of books by his bed, all of them volumes I'd brought him from the library, and a small square window high up in the wall that looked out at the sea of naked trees. The whole room smelled like him, like I was standing in the middle of the forest. Ignoring the pain in my heart, I swooped low and tugged Ever's blanket off his bed, then returned to the living room. He groaned with relief when I tucked the blanket around him, shielding him from the cold. But when I bent low with the ice-filled towel, the look in his eyes froze me. What? Lay with me? He whispered. Please. It was the invitation... I'd been waiting for. He sat up gingerly as I climbed on the couch, then laid him over my lap, his back and head resting on my legs. When we were settled, he took a deep breath and turned to face me, closing his eyes. With a mother dead in childbirth and a father like Killian, had he ever been held? I set about cleaning the blood from his face, touching him as gently as I could, stopping whenever he winced. As I was finishing, fresh blood caught my eye, lower, on the arm he'd cradled and shielded. Before he could stop me, I lifted it and looked. Two puncture wounds on his bicep, a bite mark sharp and deep as the one I'd gotten from the copperhead, slowly oozing blood, Ruth, ever said, soft but still a warning. Who did this to you? His eyes slid away. After a moment of silence, he said, You already know. I did, didn't I? I'd suspected Ever's bruises and cuts, his weekly badges of dishonor, 
could be chalked up to more than the drunks at the blue moon. No matter how evasive he was, how dismissive, I should have pushed the issue, forced him to say it out loud. Your father, I said hollowly. Mr. Duncan wasn't just a church shirker or a drunk. For once, the people of Holy Fire had gotten it right. He was a living, breathing monster. We got into another argument, Ever said. About what? He tried to shrug and winced. He wants me to do something I won't. I looked at the bruises on his face. What's so bad it's worth this? He laughed, a dark sound. He doesn't need an excuse anymore. He must have seen the impatience in my face because he added quickly, Someone's been missing down at the garage and he wants me to fill in. That's all. I frowned. I thought it was just the two of you at the garage. Ever didn't say anything. I tried a different tack. You need to go to the sheriff. He closed his eyes. Never. I couldn't stop looking at the fang marks. If you don't do something, one of these days your dad is going to kill you. He didn't even blink. This is the way it's always been. I ruined his life when I was born, and now he haunts mine. I killed her, so I'm responsible. I can't leave him, can't turn him in, and I can't make him better. He's my devil to bear. We watched each other. I didn't know how to refute his logic or argue his mother's death wasn't his fault, or even tell him I understood that my own father, though practically an angel to this town, was mine to bear, too. But Ever's body chose a path for us. Suddenly he winced. What's wrong? Just the pain again? He gritted his teeth, eyes squeezed shut. Do you have your pills with you? I felt caught. I didn't speak, unsure what to say. He bared his teeth. It hurts. Yes, I admitted, but only because my parents told me to keep them on me. It was a bad lie, and I was prepared to keep digging the hole, but he shook his head. I don't care right now, Ruth. Please just give me one. I need this pain to stop. There was no choice after that. I gave Ever one of the pills whose name I still didn't know, pulled out the small hidden compartment in my bag, and he settled back in my lap and closed his eyes. Over time, I watched his breathing even out, his face relaxing into something close to dreamy. We'll talk about the pills later, he murmured, eyes closed. Don't think I don't have words for you. Is this what I looked like when I took them? The slow untethering? As ever it floated away from me, I vowed to never take another pill again. Now that I knew he needed taken care of, escaping wasn't a luxury I could afford. He shifted in my lap, revealing the fang marks again. I stared at them and pictured his father as a giant snake rearing back against the coffee table and striking lightning fast the poison from his bite eaten its way through Ever's veins. I bent and put my lips against the wound, only a gentle pressure, nearly a kiss. He tasted like salt and iron, like the minerals in seawater, sand that would harden into rocks and last for eons. That's what I wanted for him. Permanence, solidity, the ability to outlast. I kissed the wish into his wound. His fingers lifted weakly to brush the hair from my face. I looked up to meet his eyes. I could feel his blood drying around my lips, smeared and sticky. I must have looked like some sort of beast. But Ever was arrested, his eyes slowly tracking over my face. A small smile curved his lips. It lingered there until he closed his eyes and fell asleep. I sat holding him for hours in the cold, not even afraid of Mr. Duncan coming home. In fact, I could think of nothing but Mr. Duncan. I imagined pushing him in front of a car, beating him while he screamed, chopping him into pieces and feeding him to the swamp. In that miserable house, with Ever's blood ringing my mouth, 
I felt an urge for violence the likes of which I'd felt only that day with Renard. Hatred grew in my heart until I burned to do forever what he'd done for me. My desire to protect him so intense that in those hours, garden his broken body, the only words I had for it were, holy passion. If ever had opened his eyes and asked me to do anything then, I would have done it. Anything, he asked, I would have been capable of. Like some sort of beast, surely. 19. Now. There he is, ever at points, and my eyes skim the twin scars on his arm, perfect circles like a snake bite, before they find what he's pointing at. I press my face closer to the window of the blue moon bar. The one sitting by himself at the end? The man in question has long, oily hair in need of a wash, and a dark beard so long it brushes his chest. He's bent over a tumbler at the farthest end of Remy's bar, looking like he wished he could fall inside the glass. Yep, Ever's expression hardens. Good old Earl Bear. He had a lot in common with my father. He turns from the window. Come on, it's safe to go. But I can't look away from Earl. Are you sure we'll have enough time? Ever tugs me. Trust me, he'll be there all night. In the dreamy dusk light, the old Duncan garage looks like an abandoned relic of some long-lost time, a building you'd see in a documentary about small towns and economic ruin. Or maybe that's just me and my aspiring anthropologist's eye. No matter how run down and disarming it appears, I know this place is secretly insidious, a way station for dangerous men. We cruise past it in Everett's car and park blocks away so no one will be able to recall an old black convertible parked outside. It's unlikely there will be anyone, though, since we're on the outskirts of Bottom Springs, the middle of backcountry roads shielded by trees that have grown bent over the road like an archway. This remote location, so poorly chosen for a garage hoping to do swift business, is the perfect place for an illicit drop site. There were clues. I study Ever's face as we trek to the garage. All my life I've prided myself on seeing things clearer than most, yet I'm starting to realize the depths of my myopia. Ever gives the lock binding the garage door an experimental tug, but it doesn't give. Change this lock. That's okay. I crouch and squint. Does that mean we can't get in? There's another way. He rounds the corner and points at a square window just out of his reach. It's so streaked with dust, it's almost fogged. See that? The lock on it was always broken. I guarantee Earl hasn't fixed it. Ever glances down. I'm going to lift you, and then I need you to pound on it until it pops open. Me? He grins his devil's grin. It's an adventure, Ruthie, like the Count of Monte Cristo. You've got to get your hands dirty. Monte Cristo's a revenge story, I mutter, but let Ever circle his hands around my waist, his grip steady and cool through the fabric of my shirt. Ready? Thrill sparks in my chest. I nod, and he lifts me until I'm face to face with the window. You're going to have to hit it hard, he warns, his words tickling my thigh. I prod at the window, trying to jimmy it open, but it doesn't budge. Hard he insists, and I fist my hands and start to pound. Harder. My heart takes off. I batter the window like it's a locked door imprisoning me inside a burning house. My fists ache, but I don't stop. And the truth is, it feels good to hit something. Suddenly, the window wrenches inward and my fists sail through empty air. Ever drops me unceremoniously and inspects my hand. Good work, no bruising. Now this time, I need you to climb inside and unlock the back door. I'm still trying to steady my breathing when his hands circle my waist again, the feeling familiar from climbing trees together. And when he lifts me, I grip the window seal like it's a branch, hold myself up, and tumble inside straight to the concrete floor. I land with a crack I can feel in every bone. You okay? Ever's voice is muted from outside. 
Sounds like you knocked over something heavy. Gee, thanks, I mutter, peeling myself off the floor and limping to unlock the back door. My bottom lip throbs. I dart my tongue and taste blood. Ever standing outside the door when I open it, he zeroes in on my lip. You're bleeding. I know. I wipe my mouth with the back of my hand. I manage to trip through the window. Ever musses my hair so it falls over my eyes and I can't see. You're mad at me. I bat his hand away. Let's just find the safe and get out of here. He salutes me, unnervingly playful given we're in the middle of a break-in, and turns to scan the garage. It's small, lit dimly by dusk light filtering in through the windows, and in a state of disarray I remember from the few times I passed it when it still belonged to Mr. Duncan. It smells almost dizzyingly of gasoline. The sound of an engine revving cuts through the silence. Ever clasps a hand over my mouth the second I open it, and we wait, bodies tensed, as the sound from the car grows louder and then starts to fade. After a few seconds, the only thing I can hear is my heart drumming in my ears. Ever withdraws his hand. Just a random person, he says, but his voice is shaky. Come on, the safe used to be over here. He strides to a low gunmetal gray cabinet hiding in the corner of the garage. See, I knew Earl'd keep it. God bless stingy southern bastards. I peer over his shoulder. The cabinet door opens to reveal a silver and black safe, rectangular and roughly two feet tall, with an electronic keypad and a large silver handle. Ever hauls it out of the cabinet, and I take a few steps back, giving him room. You remember your dad's combination? No, he says it nonchalantly, moving to a nearby table to search through the tools. Then how do you think you're getting in there? With these. Ever turns, holding a hammer and tire iron. He's got them raised triumphantly, much the way he once held a dead copperhead. There are subtler ways, but they take too much time. With these, I don't need two minutes. I shake my head. There's no way watch. Something, possibly my sanity, breaks as ever circles the safe with his tools held aloft. I can't help myself. The image is too funny. I start to laugh. He raises his eyebrows. Am I witnessing your mental breakdown? You look ridiculous, like some sort of movie villain. Disrespectful, Ruth, he sighs. Stand back. I stifle my laughter and step away, and as soon as I do, he jabs the tire iron into the gap behind the door of the safe and strikes it with his hammer, wedging the iron in. With every blow, he wrenches the door forward a little more. Then he drops the hammer with the clang and works the tire iron, putting his whole body into it, the corded muscles of his arms and back straining. Something strange happens as I watch Everett bend the metal. I remember that he is a man. Strong and solid and formidable. His methodical exertion calls back the image of him taking apart Renard's body, the bloody axe swinging down, violent and steady. It's like I've grown so close to him, I've forgotten what he looks like from a distance. But now I remember. He peels the door of the safe forward like it's the lid on a tuna can, and it swings open. I stand gaping at the accomplishment and the contents. Told ya. He drops the tire iron and wipes his sweaty brow on his shirt sleeve, breathing heavily. Don't worry, I use the subtler method in your dad's office. Ever the money. The safe is filled with stacks of bills bound haphazardly by grubby rubber bands. He crouches in front of it and I follow suit. Yeah, most runners give the sons money as collateral. They make them buy in with more than the value of a shipment, so it doesn't make sense to run off. Here, help me clear it out. Together, we pull stacks of money out of the safe and place them neatly on the concrete floor. The last time I saw this much money, Everett was holding it out to me in a grocery bag behind Dale's country corner. When it's cleared, all that's left in the safe are a few slips of paper. I pick up one that calls to me, Pepto-Bismol Pink, a car title a truck registered to one Mr. Jebediah Ray. 
ever waves a creamy page. This one's a boat title. Jeez. The next piece of paper looks like it's been ripped out of a notebook. An address in Shreveport scribbled in pen. I show ever. What do you think this is? He studies the address for a moment. Nothing good. I stare at the paper until I realize. And then I wonder whether whoever lives there knows their lives are collateral, kept hostage in this safe. Goosebumps prickle my arms. Bingo. Ever unfolds the last pages, thick and bound by a heavy-duty staple. I was right. It's still here. I take the pages and smooth them. Sure enough, it's the deed to a house in Bro Bridge, where Renard's mother lived. The form details the transfer of ownership from Renard Laurent and Sue Ellen Michaels to Jebediah Ray. Wait. I frown, grabbing the car title, then the boat one. All of these are in Jebediah Ray's name. Exactly. Strangely, Evers Beeman. That's the part that's going to make this whole plan work. If a runner can't get his hands on enough cash to buy in, the sons make him transfer ownership of something valuable. That way, if he runs off, the property's already theirs. So if you want to escape the sons, all you lose is whatever you turned over? No. The price were taken off as they hunt you down and kill you. Whatever you turned over is just a tax for the effort. They hunt you down and kill you, like I suspect they did to Fred. That's who we're messing with. Stone-cold killers. Professionals. Ever taps the deed. This is our proof Renard was mixed up with them. If we send deputies to their place in Forsyth and they catch them cooking and find this, game over. But who's this Jebediah Ray? He hesitates for a moment, then says, They call him the Serpent King. He's the leader of the Sons. They wear rattlesnakes on their jackets. He adds, off my dubious look, It's their club symbol, something to do with colonial America. Like, don't tread on me? He snorts. Exactly. Real patriotic heroes, these guys. Ever scoops the papers and stacks of cash into his shirt, lifting the hem to create a makeshift basket. Help me get all this. I seize his wrist. What are you doing? We came here for the deed. And they'll know that if we don't take everything. It's gotta be a full robbery. Every instinct screams, this is wrong. Not how the plan's supposed to go. I squeeze his wrist tighter. You're stealing money from men you just said have no qualms about killing people. Don't worry. We're about to make it so they can't go after anyone. Too much attention coming their way. When I don't move my hand, ever sighs. I need you to relax, Ruth. Desperate times, remember? It's them or us. I imagine Sheriff Tyrio's car rolling to a stop outside my house again, except this time... He's there to cuff and drag me away through a gauntlet of people that includes my red-faced father, screaming about murder and mortal sins and the horror-stricken faces of every person in Bottom Springs. My grip on Ever's wrist relaxes. All right, then, you take those stacks. Once we've gathered everything, Ever wrestles the safe back into the gray cabinet and shuts the door. Earl might not even notice anything's missing for a few days. He grins. You want to go back out the way you came? I glare at him. While we've been in here, dusk has deepened, and now only shreds of sunlight remain. I can barely make out his face, but his teeth are clear, gleaming white. Stop having fun with this. What we're doing is seriously messed up. The teeth come closer and closer until Ever's mouth is near my ear. My heart pounds at its proximity, at his cheek brush in mine, at the fact that it's getting harder to predict him. Come on, Ruth, he whispers. Admit it, you're having a tiny bit of fun. There's no heat from his body. What makes me lean into him is more like a magnetic pool. It hits me again, the instinct to tell him about Barry's proposal. But the words stick in my throat. Instead, I whisper, not even a drop. He turns, catching my eyes, and grins wider. Race you to the car. I roll my eyes, assuming he means to rile me up, but the second we've got the door locked, Ever takes off, 
Hey! I call, panicked, and suddenly adrenaline hits in one big surge, fireworks exploding in my chest, nerves firing, urging me to action. I take off behind him, one hand clutching my pile of cash, running like I've robbed a bank, like I'm an outlaw, the bane of the West. Bonnie and her Clyde. Ever's already far ahead, ungodly fast, his laughter trailing behind him, high and ringing. I pump my legs faster, willing my body to match his, and that's when the giddiness hits. The sheer absurdity of fleeing the scene of a crime. The elation of the thick wads in my shirt. The relief of not getting caught. The beauty of all the trees bending over the path like they're leaning in to watch us foolish creatures streak past. Laughter bursts from me, and with it, despite the circumstances, comes pure, unbridled joy. We got the deed. The plan is working. There's hope. We flat out sprint the last hundred feet to the car. Ever pops the trunk and we dump the money and papers. He leaps into the driver's seat and holds up a hand for me like I'm some kind of genteel lady, keeping me steady as I hop in. Ever revs the engine and turns his grin on me. A thousand stars in his eyes, moonlit skin glowing as the dusk deepens into night. He must read something in my face because he shoves the car into drive and takes off so fast I keel backward. Faster! I yell and he laughs. The car's speedometer soars as we race down the backcountry road kicking up plumes of dust. There's nobody but us back here, no witnesses but the faint emergent stars and I'm seized by the urge to do something, something else I'd never do. I climb to my knees in the passenger seat and throw my arms wide, head back, letting the wind whip my hair like a red banner. The trees rush past us, the air thick with the smell of pine needles. Up ahead, fireflies flicker. I'm beyond giddy. The earth is wild and beautiful, and I'm alive inside it. Ever whoops, pressing his foot to the gas, pushing the car even faster. The wind buffets me, lifting me until I'm almost flying. We're teenagers again, radiant and ungovernable. It's night, and that's our time. I close my eyes at the crescent moon and howl, a loud, triumphant sound, a sound to announce myself. Ever's laughter beside me is music. But even now, in my rare freedom, I can't escape the smallest seed of guilt. I'm Ruth Cornier, after all, and I know better. Really, I do. I know how dangerous it is to climb this high. I stretch my hands up to the stars regardless. I know what it means to set yourself up for a fall. Even still... I breathe deep from the air whipping past. I have been here before. I have leapt. I have shattered. I howl again. What do you call it when you know better? But... 20. June. 11 years old. I'd never won a single thing in my life until today. I was sure it was coming, sure my name was on the tip of Mr. Blanchard's tongue, the way he kept darting secret glances at me. I sat up straighter, practically buzzing with anticipation as he walked a zigzag route among the desks, bending over students' shoulders to take a look at their poems. Mr. Blanchard spent a long time bent over mine. So long, I thought I'd combust from anxiety— the strangeness of having an adult so close I could feel the heat from his skin, the brush of his trouser leg, see the dark, wiry hairs on his hands. I had to sit on my own hands to keep stock still and rigid like a good student, a good pastor's daughter, a good girl. Luckily, I was well-practiced in self-containment, much better than the other students who squirmed and yawned and whispered when they weren't supposed to. I could tell Mr. Blanchard appreciated my rigor. When he was finished reading my poem, he made a low hum of approval in the back of his throat. It was enough to get my hopes up. In regular school, I was mostly ignored, 
quiet and well-behaved enough to turn invisible. But here at Vacation Bible School, where the godly children of Bottom Spring spent their summers, I had a leg up from a lifetime of studying the Bible under my father's watchful eye. I've come to a decision, announced Mr. Blanchard, moving to the head of the class. He folded his hands over his stomach, eyes gleaming as he waited for the whispers to cease. Mr. Herman Blanchard was young as far as teachers went, only twenty-seven, and a study in contradictions. He was short and wore his hair combed over like an old man, despite the fact that he had no bald spots to hide. He dressed in the same outfit every day, ill-fit in khaki trousers and a white short sleeve button-down, and wore thick glasses that magnified his eyes, making him look perpetually startled. As for his mannerisms, he leaned toward a kind of carefree impishness that estranged him from other adults. I once heard my father say Herman had the demeanor of a man who'd never faced the word no, but endeared him to children. Herman was the only child of Augustus Blanchard, the rich man on the mountain, or so we called him, since he lived in the biggest house in Bottom Springs at the top of what passed for a hill around here. Augustus was considered a godly man, despite the fact that people rarely saw him. He came down from the mountain once every few months to attend church, where he walked around with a stiff back and refused to speak to anyone but my father. But the fact that Herman was his son, and that he would one day inherit the entirety of the Blanchard Hospital fortune, made him someone other adults were forced to treat with respect. His eyes swept the classroom, pausing on students who squirmed in their seats, and finally landed on me. I wanted to throw up from an overwhelming mix of terror and delight. The winner of our poem contest, Mr. Blanchard trilled, is Miss Ruth Cornier, who wrote a lovely little ditty about her namesake. As I'd feared and desired, the eyes of my fellow students turned to me, telegraphing resentment and begrudging admiration. Our assignment for Mr. Blanchard had been to choose a heroic figure from the Bible and write a poem about them. The winner would get a prize worth its weight in gold, a trip with Mr. Blanchard to the newly opened Dairy Queen in Forsyth, rumored to have ice cream treats called blizzards that were so thick you could turn them upside down and nothing would fall out. With stakes that high, I'd chosen Ruth. I knew her best, having studied her closest out of vain self-interest. I couldn't believe I'd actually done something someone thought was good. Ruth, tell us what makes Ruth so special. The corners of Mr. Blanchard's eyes crinkled at his joke. She, my voice cracked, unused to being used in public, and some of the students glanced at each other with known smirks. I struggled to regain myself. Was known for her kindness. Right, he nodded. But I liked the other part of your poem best. Why do we really consider Ruth one of the most important women in the Bible? Because of her loyalty. She followed her mother-in-law, Naomi, into Judah, even though she risked her life. Ruth was... I thought of something I'd heard my father say. Relentlessly obedient to her elders. Excellent, Mr. Blanchard beamed. And she was rewarded in the end, as we all will be, so long as we too obey our elders, even when it might seem wrong. Ruth, you'll have the pleasure of joining me at Dairy Queen. I'd just begun to soak in my triumph when he added, But? All eyes jerked back to him. There was one other poem that deserved a prize. My stomach dropped. Mr. Blanchard turned his beaming face to Lila. Miss Lila LeBlanc. The shock sent whispers around the room. Lila, who'd been slumped in her chair with a vacant expression, twisting a finger in her long blonde hair, suddenly straightened. She looked as surprised as anyone. Who did you write about, Lila? She hesitated a moment, then said, in a defiant voice, Mary Magdalene. The classroom broke into loud titters. Even at eleven, 
we knew Mary Magdalene was a whore, not a hero. Quiet, Mr. Blanchard shushed. Now, why did you choose Mary? Lila bit her lip. Most of the time she acted confident, but once in a while her veneer cracked and I got a glimpse of her self-doubt. It made it hard to dislike her, no matter how skewed life seemed in her favor. Because even though Mary did bad things in the past, Lila said, she believed in Jesus more than anyone. She was the first person to see his empty tomb. Very clever. Behind his thick lenses, Mr. Blanchard's eyes blinked tremulously. Mary Magdalene teaches us that it's possible for even great sinners to be redeemed. As long as we repent, there's room for all of us in the kingdom of heaven. I frowned at my clenched fists hidden underneath my desk. Not only did it sting to share my victory with Lila, but the way Mr. Blanchard talked about sinning was different from my father. Mr. Blanchard made it seem light and easy. Make a mistake, repent, and it's erased. According to my father, sinners were owed heavy punishment and got no guarantees. Congratulations, Lila. You'll join us at Dairy Queen this afternoon. Mr. Blanchard clapped. All right, children. Next, we're going to talk about Samson and Delilah. Take out your workbooks. As students sighed and shifted, Lila's eyes met mine from across the room. We rarely spoke to each other being so different, but we were going to sit together in Mr. Blanchard's green jaguar all the way to Forsyth, then share the prize of blizzards. Was she annoyed to be stuck with me? I had no idea how to react. Suddenly, tentative as the first light at dawn, the corners of Lila's mouth lifted in a smile. What clever girls you are, said Mr. Blanchard, holding our hands. Be sure to keep a tight grip on me. We don't want you getting lost. Yes, Mr. Blanchard, said Lila and I in match and sing song. We were on our way to ice cream and on our best behavior. Lila stole a glance at me as we walked across the church parking lot. I smiled, emboldened by her earlier kindness, and she grinned back. I'm going to get a gummy bear and Oreo blizzard, she blurted as if the information was finally too much to keep inside. I raised my brows, impressed. I didn't know you could get more than one topping. You can get as many as you want, she chirped. That's what I heard. Hurry up, girls, said Mr. Blanchard, tugging us forward. We don't want to get caught in traffic. Lila and I practically scurried to match Mr. Blanchard's purposeful strides. He moved faster than I would have thought possible with his short legs. All right, he said, sounding frazzled as he popped open the passenger door of his car. He wiped his brow on his shirt sleeve. I think both you ladies can fit in the front seat. It'll be our little secret, okay? Lila and I giggled. Herman Blanchard! Boomed a voice, and the three of us startled, spinning in the direction of the sound. Before I could collect my wits, my father was upon us. A bull charging the last few feet across the parking lot. Instinctively, I cowered back, bony shoulders hitting Mr. Blanchard's car. I'd seen my father rage many times, but this time... He was incandescent with fury. His very hair seemed to writhe, the veins in his neck bulging. Rubberin, Mr. Blanchard's voice trembled. I'd never heard him scared. I had no idea what was happening. I told you, my father snarled. Not her. Do you hear me? Never her. He lunged and seized my arm, pulling me violently off the car. I cried out in pain and Lila gasped, but my father's grip didn't loosen. He stepped toward Mr. Blanchard, and Mr. Blanchard staggered back, almost tripping into the open passenger door. My father raised his hand in Mr. Blanchard's face. You so much as look at Ruth again, and I'm going straight to your father. Do you hear me? Mr. Blanchard's eyes darted around the parking lot, 
whether searching for help or witnesses, I didn't know. One more time, and Augustus knows. My father didn't wait for Mr. Blanchard to respond. He stalked away, pulling me with him with such force I thought my arm might pop. Please, Daddy. Hot tears ran down my cheeks. I won the poem contest. Mr. Blanchard was taking us to Dairy Queen. It's not that far away, and I've never won anything before. And Lila... Quiet, Ruth. I felt the command in my bones. No one asked you to speak. As he yanked me back to church, I twisted over my shoulder to find Mr. Blanchard already sitting in the driver's seat. His door closed. But Lila stood by the passenger door, still watching me with the storm of emotions passing over her face, among them pity and regret. I cried hardest to know Lila had witnessed what my father really thought of me, how little I meant, how I didn't deserve one simple pleasure. My heart crumbled as I watched her turn and slide into the passenger seat. The door closed behind her with a smack that echoed across the parking lot, and off they went, Mr. Blanchard and Lila, the lucky one. 21. Now. The bar emerges out of the trees like a mirage. One minute, there's a thick sea of cypresses on both sides of the road, the air clotted with the smell of bayou vegetation. The next, an army of parked motorcycles garden a squat brown building with no sign and people everywhere. White men, mostly, sauntering up and down the ramp to the door, holding long necks in smoker circles around the bikes or bent over the deck railing, spit and chew. With Everett's convertible top down, I can smell the acrid tang of the smoke and hear the pounding music from behind the door, muffled like it's underwater. Told you, Ever says quietly, his eyes dark. Rattlesnakes. We turn into the dirt lot, earning narrow-eyed stares from those we pass. Ever's right. Despite the summer heat, most of the men wear thick leather jackets with coiled rattlesnakes sewn onto the back, raised to strike. So much skin covered in black ink, tattoos running up necks, even carved across cheeks. We've stepped onto the other side of the law, entered an outlaw world for people who deal in thievery and death. This isn't a game anymore. We're not stealing from some backcountry garage. We're in Forsyth, on the edge of a dark, deep bayou at the place ever said we'd find the Sons of Liberty. I can feel these men's hardness, the violence in the air, their scrutiny sharp as a knife's edge. These people would hurt us and not think twice. Ever parks. It's not too late to change your mind. No. Are you sure? I glance behind us. Over the roof of the bar, the sudden sun glints through the trees, casting an orange light, eerie and strange, like a portent of trouble. No, I repeat, and kick open the door. All eyes are on us as we walk to the entrance. From somewhere ever procured a leather jacket, a thing he said he simply got around, and now he moves with the reckless swagger I struggle to imitate. He looks different with the jacket on, like that alien, distant creature he was before I got to know him. I'm forced to remember he's been outside Bottom Springs for years now, living a life I know nothing about. A man spits at my feet when we reach the door. A nasty grin splits his face and I look away quickly, heart pounding. The noise behind the door grows louder, ever grips the handle. Don't talk to anybody, he says under his breath. Don't take anything anyone offers. Try not to make eye contact. Follow my lead. I nod, so slight it's almost imperceptible, and he yanks open the door. Dark synth rock rushes at us, a hard, sinister wall of sound. As we move inside, part in the dark, the music snakes inside me, trying to take over my heartbeat. The bars crowded with tattooed men, I glimpse in flashes from the flickering bulbs swinging from the ceiling. There's so much cigarette smoke, it acts like a veil. 
plumes that shield the men we pass until they move and break the illusion a man to our left lunges cackling as another man staggers back against the walls the smoke curls around women lined up dressed in impossibly short skirts like the one i saw on beth the night she snuck in their hair is teased big and their makeup heavy some of them stare vacantly others won't look up from their feet all look like they're waiting to be plucked i do my best not to make eye contact as i follow ever to the bar but it's hard not to stare at the people snorting white powder off their hands and tabletops faces in here are sheened with sweat more than the humidity calls for men emerge out of the smoke with dilated pupils as if seeing ghosts let's get drinks everett says voice raised over the music i can barely see him in the flickering lights can't be empty-handed beer then i say and ever slides a bill across the counter to the bartender when our drinks arrive i take mine in turn tell me again his arm brushes mine as he takes a swig of beer eyes cast out over the tables about ten years older than us shaved head with a snake tattoo thick muscular long blonde beard jebediah ray part one of the plan i crane my neck squinting to see come on ever says slapping my shoulder let's move in we weave through the smoke i and the men we pass as subtly as possible i hate that my hands are shaken so i keep tipping the beer to my mouth even though i don't like the taste after a minute of this the razor's edge of fear dulls it's when i take my last sip my bottle light and empty that i see him there in the back of the room at a crowded table surrounded by men like a king thronged by subjects head bare so the first thing i notice is the enormous snake its mouth open wide across his skull fangs dripping sinuous body coiling in a spiral down his neck his long beard is braided the end touching his chest and though he's listening to someone talk his eyes roam restlessly the scan of a predator taking stock of his surroundings i squeeze ever's hand and nod good ever murmurs eyes on him but not obvious let's stand over there to stay hidden we're walking to join the women on the wall when a man stops in front of ever solid as a house and shoves him he's large with long wild hair trailing down his arms and a leather vest with nothing underneath a friend stands behind him a foot taller with the raised scar that bisects his face from lip to eyebrow it looks like a knife wound healed wrong hey the first man says raising his chin stranger we don't know you i take a small step back we're caught but ever doesn't flinch just passing through heard this was the place to be oh yeah the man raises his eyebrows we don't like people hearing so much about us ever shrugs casual then tell your friends to stop running their mouths heard about you all all the way out in truval there's a moment of charged silence as the two sons glance at each other then the taller man says in a swampland accent so thick it's nearly indecipherable truval huh i reckon we got people out there what you want then ever looks around here you see any five-o to my surprise everett slips his hand inside his leather jacket peeling out a handful of crinkled bills money from the safe he slides the bills between his fingers making them dance the men's eyes follow what you got i bite back a protest ever's going off script i in the money the man with the long hair pulls out a plastic bag of white powder from inside his vest this shit'll knock you sideways i bite the inside of my mouth as ever nods if you say so the man yanks back the baggie and wags it just out of ever's reach don't you want to sample first i shift trying to communicate no without speaking but it's the long-haired man not ever who notices as the overhead lights flicker i watch his hungry gaze travel the length of my body his tongue darts out to lick his lower lip sure i'll try it 
glances ever smoothly stand in squarely in front of me and block in the man's sight. I breathe again the moment his eyes are gone. Why not? The man shakes powder onto his hand and holds it up to Ever with a look of challenge. Before I can figure out how to get him out of this, Ever snorts the powder in one long rip like he's done it before. It's abrupt, almost violent, and at the same time, intimate. The man's hand so close to Ever's face, almost like he's cupping it. I freeze in horror. How about her? The tall man nods at me, and the long-haired man shakes out another bump. Not her choice of poison, says Ever coolly, and before the men can insist, he snorts the second line, then reels back, almost stepping into me. I press my hands against his shoulders, steadying him, though I want to shake him. Our plan is spiraling. All right now, boy. The long-haired man wipes his hand against his jeans. You rockin' up a tab. He tosses the baggie of powder at Everett's chest. Least we know you're not a cop. Ever leans closer and opens his jacket. Maybe I've got a bigger appetite? What would you say to that? The long-haired man's eyes widen, and the tall man whistles long and low. I can't see what's inside Ever's jacket, but I have a feeling it's the rest of the money from the safe. Enough money to demand their attention. Woo! The long-haired man slaps his hands together. I'd say you came to the right place, Truval. You and me about to be good friends. He grins at me over Everett's shoulder. You too, quiet lady. What I got to do to make you talk? Ever snakes his arm around my waist, tucking me into his side. Like I said, she has particular tastes. His smile's wide, showing off his canines. The long-haired man laughs. Fuck, no need to fight over pussy. We got plenty. Shoot. The tall man with the scar nudges his friend. He almost pretty as her when he smiles. The two crack up. Their great in laughter makes me stand ramrod straight. It's one thing to hear them call me names, but hearing Everett speak their language bristles. Across the room, Jebediah Ray suddenly stands. That triggers mass movement. The crowd of men ringing him stumble or stagger to their feet, taking last sips of beers, eyeing the women against the wall. Together, they move through the bar, Jebediah the point of the crown. It's your lucky day, Truval. The man with the long hair beckons us. You didn't have to wait long. Follow us. We lose ourselves in the crowd making their way out of the bar, Ever's arms still circling my waist. As soon as the two men's backs are turned, I lean in and hiss under my breath. Who are you with those drugs? And why are you trying to buy more? That's not what we planned. Ever glances at the men's backs and leans over like he's going to kiss under my ear. We never would have gotten into Jebediah's place if we tried to follow them. He whispers, we had to be invited. The only way to be invited is to buy big. I start to reel back, but he cups my jaw, holding me still. I didn't tell you because I knew what you'd say. But look, it worked. We burst out of the bar and follow our sons down the ramp to the motorcycles. The night is pitch black and frantic with the sounds of croaking frogs, chittering grasshoppers, the bayou on edge. I squash the impulse to run for Ever's car. He straightens up. We can follow y'all in my... Stop right there, the long-haired man says, leaning against a large bike. It's matte black, like it's meant to disappear into the night. No outside cars. He pats the bike seat. You want to buy, you ride with us. Ever glances down at me. A look that lasts only a second, but I read a world of meaning. Please, we have no choice. Everything will be okay. Fine he says to the man. Before he releases me, he whispers, Count of Monte Cristo, remember? Whatever dark lengths. We mount up on the bikes, Everett behind the long-haired man, me behind the scarred one. My heart beats rapid fire, straining against my rib cage. Around us, nearly a hundred bikes rev, the noise of the engines like beasts roaring. 
How have I gotten here? Hold tight. The scarred man yells, but I refuse to touch him until the bike thunders to life, the vibrations chattering my teeth, and suddenly we lunge forward. Only then do I fasten my arms around his waist, pressing my cheek to the coiled rattlesnake on his back. From the back of his bike, Everett finds my eyes. Whatever he snorted has hit him. His eyes are glassy and unfocused, his cheekbones tinged with pink. For a single charged moment, we stare at each other in dread, and then his motorcycle takes off. Mine roars behind it. Like a swarm of locusts, the sons of liberty explode out of the parking lot onto the dirt road. Wind rips our hair as we charge forward. One large army, a hundred men's war cries fill in the night. 22. Now. Jebediah's compound appears in the distance, lit by floodlights and ringed by bonfires, so thundering toward it feels like racing toward the heart of hell. When we pull up, there are people camped out everywhere on the wide expanse of yard. We must be on the outermost edge of Forsyth now, where the cops don't patrol, because I can't imagine anyone seeing this massive building crawling with people and not knowing immediately it's a place where bad things happen. I think of an arcane history of your backyard. All those men sail into this corner of the world to stake their claims and build their castles, ravaging whoever stood in their way. What is it about Louisiana that gives so many men delusions of grandeur? Is it the swampland, the primordial landscape sparking primal urges? I nearly fall off the bike when the scarred man kicks the stand, my legs weak from squeezing so tight. Immediately, Everett is by my side grip in my arms. Follow me, Truval, rasps the long-haired man. We're going inside. As he leads us across the lawn, I finally see the wisdom of Ever's plan. In my version, where we tracked Jebediah to his home, we had to sneak in undetected. But as buyers, we walk in the front door. One more crime to end it, I whisper to myself. Something's wrong. Ever murmurs as we step over holes in the grass. I set my attention on the lawn around me and feel it, a thick unease. From opposite sides of the bonfires blazing around the yard, men eye each other distrustfully. Fuck you, then, shouts a bearded man in a rattlesnake jacket, lunging for a man with the cross tattooed on his neck. Two other sons of liberty grab the first and hold him back. The long-haired man leading us snickers, you picked a dicey time to be here. We got a faction of them country boys from up north here trying to work out a truce. Truce? Ever ventures. What, you got a mutual enemy or something? He grins wide, showing off a silver tooth. Nah, a common need. We've been fighting over territory for years, but these days our supply chain ain't been the most stable. You feel me? We need options. He shakes his head. But them pig fuckers about overstayed, they welcome. Ever and I glance at each other as we sneak around one of the bonfires, sparks drifting near our faces. His fingers brush mine, and I take his hand. Into the belly of the beast. Inside the compound is a whole new world, as methodical and organized as the outside was chaotic. The large kitchen we enter runs like a well-oiled machine. Leather-jacketed men moving stacks of money and rubber-band-bound bags of weed, pills, and powder across tables, riffing numbers and instructions to one another. Wait here, our long-haired son says and takes off. As soon as his back's turned, ever nods. Be fast. He whispers, sliding the papers out of his jacket. Find somewhere to hide it, but don't make it too obvious, and don't get caught. I nod, heart in my throat. This was always part of the plan, where I step up and ever acts as a distraction. I keep my head down and slip out of the kitchen into a hallway where more people mill. I'd like to hide Renard's deed in as incriminating a spot as possible, a place the deputies will surely look whenever and I call in our tip. I just have no idea where that is. Count of Monte Cristo. 
I can do that, play a part like the Count, suffer indignities for the sake of triumph in the end. I loosen my gait, stumbling a little down the hall, and start opening doors. Most are empty bedrooms, but in one I find a man stretched out on a futon. The moment I swing open the door, he jerks up and grabs the handgun at his side, pointing it at me. Oh, I slur, speaking slow despite my pounding heart. This isn't the bathroom. The man's eyes are dilated, black pupils eaten the white. He stares at me, the barrel of the gun shaken. Nah, he says finally. It's not. And collapses back onto the couch, gun slumping to the floor. I shut the door quietly and press my back to the wall, heart thumping so hard I actually do feel high. Keep going. Everything is riding on this. A door at the end of the hall opens and a man in a wife beater walks out, dripping with sweat, sucking in a deep breath before turning the corner. I straighten. Behind him, I'd glimpsed a staircase descending into the dark. If I was Jebediah Ray, that's where I'd keep my most incriminating things, hidden in the bowels of my house. I check to make sure no one's watching and slip inside. The smell of ammonia is so overpowering, I gag and almost turn back. I press a hand over my mouth, forcing myself down the stairs. A large basement stretches before me. Lining the walls are black plastic shelves, the kind you assemble yourself, filled with liters of fluorescent colored chemicals, stacks of plastic bags, zip ties, and gram scales. In the center of the room are four islands with stovetops, the burners covered in black-bottomed pots. Thankfully, there's no one else here. I creep closer to read the labels on the leaders, despite the fact that I know I need to plant the deed and get out. It's just, this is where the suns cook. There are no windows, the only light from bulbs hanging from the ceiling, so the place is dim and suffocating. How hot it must get in the daytime, in the thick bayou heat with all the burners going, like hell on earth. Footsteps shake the ceiling, rustling loose dust that rains down, and I snap out of my morbid fascination. There's a desk scattered with papers in the farthest corner. I beeline to it. If I hide Renard's deed in this cook room, among those papers, the deputies will surely find it, right? Out of all the rooms in this place, this is where crime is most evident, most concentrated. It will be a magnet for the cops. I feel a strange urge to kiss the deed before filing it away, the potential key to our freedom. Heavy footsteps pound the floor above me, the sound of people running. The hairs on my arms rise. I shove the deed into a pile of papers, making sure it's covered, and whirl away. I need to get back to Ever as fast as I can. But my feet catch on something and I fall hard to my knees on the concrete. Muffling a sob, I kick at whatever tripped me, shaking it off my feet, then look to see what it is. An upturned cardboard box, felled by cardboard. I don't know where it comes from, but for one second to the next, the rage is there. I'm in this basement risking my life to avoid prison just because I happened to kill the man who tried to rape me. Rape me. The injustice of it makes me choke, and suddenly I'm kicking the boxes over and over, hot tears spilling down my cheeks. The boxes slide over the floor, pinwheeling as I kick them, and a small white paper pokes out. I seize it, eager to have something to tear. Then I freeze. It's the kind of paper you'd find on a notepad, blank except for an address printed at the bottom. 300 Old Highway 1, Bottom Springs, Louisiana 70357. I know that address. Everyone in Bottom Springs knows that address. Blanchard Hospital. I stare at the boxes. They're stealing drugs from Blanchard. That's how they're getting their hands on the oxycodone and other painkillers. They're stealing from doctors and patients, from people who need it, only to turn around and feed other people's sicknesses. No wonder the long-haired son said their supply chain had grown unstable. 
it couldn't be easy to keep up such large-scale theft under authorities' noses. A gunshot cracks like thunder, the sound unmistakable, paralyzing me. All hell breaks loose. Footsteps stampede across the ceiling, followed by shouts and screams that travel through the floorboards. Everett's up there. I scramble to my feet and bound up the stairs two at a time. The basement door opens to chaos. People running down the hall and screaming, men charging in the other direction holding shotguns. I barrel toward the kitchen but am shoved by a giant leather jacketed man with a gun running past. The impact throws me into the wall, making me bite my tongue, but I push off and keep going, streaking into the kitchen. I spin in frantic circles. The kitchen's been barricaded, tables shoved against the windows. Men are sweeping cash and weed into grocery bags, rushing past with guns held high, crouching by the windows. I can't find Everett in this maelstrom of people. Something shatters a window and I scream as glass goes flying. The men start firing, each boom so loud my ears ring. The front door flings open and men with crosses on their necks start to pour through. The country boys from up north. I'm standing in the middle of a war, unable to move, panic locking my limbs. Ruth! Everett. I turn, relief flooding me until I realize he's pointing over my shoulder. I whip around just as a bald man with the crucifix under his ear levels a gun at me 